Hey, so what's all this then? Well, quick PSA, the next What Happened should be up next weekend. But in the meantime, I thought I'd give y'all something to put on if you're ever doing chores, something to study to, or just say lengthy distraction from living on the perpetual trash fire known as Earth. And what better than over five hours of Capcom messing things up? A compilation like this will not be a regular thing at all because honestly, there's no other publisher that even comes close to this amount of coverage. So just consider this a one-off bonus type thing. Enjoy the ruining of some of your favorite franchises and I'll see y'all next week. Welcome back to another sad, sobering episode of What Happened, the show where we dig up the embarrassing, dusty skeletons of video game disasters, both small and large, bad and worse, and stinky and stinkier. We've covered games so far on this show that were all somewhat destined to fail for one reason or another, either from overly lofty ambitions, marketing sleaze dicks, or just plain stupidity. Today's subject, however, is far more tragic, as not only were we punished with a less than ideal piece of electronic entertainment, not only did it result in the closure of an entire company, but we were also denied an interesting title in its own right that was brimming with potential. Today, dear viewer, our subject is... Final Fight Streetwise. In the mid-aughts, Capcom was putting out hit after hit across the current generation of consoles. You have your Onimushas, your RE4s, your Devil May Cries, your Phoenix Wrights. But while all these games were distinctly Japanese, distinctly Capcom, there were a few titles produced by the company that were not handcrafted by superstars like Shinji Mikami, Hideki Kamiya, or Shu Takumi. To properly tell the tale of Final Fight Streetwise, you have to start with a little known and even less existing team within the Capcom umbrella, and that is, of course, Production Studio 8. Founded in the late 90s in Sunnyvale, California, the small team started life as Capcom Digital Studios, with the head of the company being one David Siller, notable creator of Crash Bandicoot and Arrow the Acrobat. Within just a few years of growth, where they mostly worked on ports and canceled pitches, it was 1999 where they released their first major title, which, um, was, uh... Final, Final Fight, Fight Revenge. Revenge! They lent their programming, art, and animation talents to this arcade fighter, but the project was mostly overseen by key members of Capcom Japan. David Siller himself was credited as co-director along with Yoshiki Okamoto, who produced or was involved with almost every notable Capcom franchise you could shake a steel pipe at. Now, to keep a bad story short, Final Fight Revenge didn't do great. Um, it saw very little distribution in arcades at the time You're already dead. and received only one lonely port on the Japanese Sega Saturn and Capcom hasn't spoken about it since. I've talked about it though. Cause I have a copy. Things however did get brighter for the company with their first solo game in 2002, a PlayStation 2 title based on the fantasy world of Ghosts and Goblins, Maximo Ghost to Glory. This was their first fully 3D game, reviewed fairly well, and it was met with enough success to quickly greenlight a sequel, Maximo vs. The Army of Zin. David Siller would leave the company shortly after the completion of Ghosts and Glory and moved on to perennial flophouse favorite Midway in 2003. So despite Production Studio 8's earlier encounter with Metro City being nothing short of an unmitigated oil drum fire, the success of two Maximo-sized notches in their belts convinced all parties involved that it was a good idea to bring Hagar, Cody, and Guy into the 21st century. It wasn't. Production Studio 8's new entry in the Final Fight franchise, released in February 2006 for the PS2 and the Xbox, got absolutely scathing reviews, 
and the company closed the very next month. Um, so what happened? Uh, I, I'm not 100% sure exactly what happened here because unfortunately there's very little concrete evidence we can mine from interviews, press releases, and the like. In fact, the company did zero interviews during this time period or even years after the fact, but I think we can safely assume a few things. With the freedom they were given to craft their previous titles in the Ghosts and Goblins universe, it seems the same carte blanche was handed to them once again to make something completely new for Final Fight. This resulted in the first iteration of the project, which was dubbed internally as Final Fight Seven Sons. We've spoken about this lost title multiple times, but it was Unseen 64 that first got details and footage of the game, which is what you're watching here, because for years no one even knew this early build even existed until 2011? It start a fresh new character, although not named, and featured a subtle cel-shaded art style, something Capcom and Clover were already doing with Beautiful Joe and later Okami. The camera was also unique as it was utilizing a rail system that went from left to right to emulate old 2D side-scrolling rather than an awkward third-person camera seen in something like uh, Fighting Force. You also had a huge bevy of moves at your disposal, as the main character employed a lot of punches, kicks, combos, throws, and could even enter a powerful Hulk-like state where they could really do some damage. It really seemed like Seven Sons was focused on an all-new cast of characters, or be based in a different city altogether. But, fortunately, we'll never know. What we can do is construct a timeline here. Now, Army of Zin was released at the start of 2004 for North America, but first to hit Japanese shores months earlier, in September of 2003. Work must have began on Seven Sons in or around that time, and from then on out, to get a playable build up and running for a good old bun basher, let's peg it around mid to late-ish 2004, more or less a year, where Production Studio 8 began showing the footage internally around Capcom for feedback. This is where things get really shitty really fast, as someone in a position of power clearly didn't like what they were seeing. We only have the blurb from Unseen 64 to work off of, but the story goes some higher-ups within the company felt this was the wrong direction to go in, and they should try to chase after the wafting urban scent of Grand Theft Auto. This might have been mandated by Capcom Japan, as they were the ones who actually published GTA in Japan, where both 3 and Vice City saw phenomenal week 1 sales, especially for western made games back in 2003. Thus, somewhere in late 2004, the decision was made to cut up and redistribute all the maps and assets they had, make them somewhat interconnected to mimic a sandbox, and give the entire game a complete presentation and story overhaul. The rebranded Final Fight Streetwise was announced in May of 2005 and threatened to come out later that winter. Capcom was sure they were onto a winner here, and were so confident with this strategy that they had already put into production another 3D beat-em-up, this time being made in Japan, that was doing the exact same thing. It was called Beatdown Fists of Vengeance. This was almost indistinguishable from Streetwise in terms of story, aesthetic, and, uh, swear count. God damn it! What the fuck happened here? Oh, fuck. Shit! What the fuck? You piece of crap! That arrogant shit sack over there. I never did like you, asshole. You think I like sitting on the sidelines like a bitch? Fuck stopping, motherfucker. You can suppose that Capcom felt with a new IP developed in Japan, an American game based on a well-known franchise, and both of them being 3D action brawlers, surely one of them would find success. No! 
Beatdown released first in November of 2005 and sold terribly and reviewed even worse. Streetwise never even made that initial release date and was delayed to next February. Around this time, it always seemed that Capcom USA and Capcom Japan didn't communicate all that well, so maybe one of them realized that releasing two really similar games in the same quarter was, uh, you know, stupid. Now, when you have the bones of a game and you're told you need to give it a complete makeover in terms of aesthetics, tone, character, and story, um, it's gonna be a mess. You have to shift things around, repurpose assets that might never have been designed for what you now needed. Not the best way to put together a consistent and solid piece of entertainment. The Streetwise camera is big clunks as it smashes into everything and is a pain to control because the camera was meant to be on that rail system. There's lots of time wasting in the four major environments where it has you running from point A to point B over and over again as you complete really dull side quests and a bevy of hastily made mini games. We spoke to one Trent Kaniuga a few years back who worked on Streetwise as a writer, concept artist, and was the voice actor for Kyle. And when he joined Capcom Production Studio 8, it was like a dream come true as he loved the company in his youth. However, when he came onto the project, it was, shall we say, in flux. The mandate had already been given to reskin everything in that sweaty, sleazy GTA sheen, but of course, you know, without the polish or budget, so people were feverishly trying to slap this gritty, urban Mr. Potato Head together. Trent had to come up with a lot of concepts for characters in this new style, but he found when he tried to push the designs to be more unique or bring in more classic Final Fight characters like Poison or Sodom, he was often told by marketing to tone it down, make it more relatable and less colorful and over the top, which is why Streetwise has that dull, generic, gritty look we all hate and ignore today. If you want to see Trent speak more about this, check out his video on Streetwise concept art in the description below. Fascinating stuff. So that basically sums up everything about- No! No, 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 you can't stop this train! What's next on this tour? Ports. Now, if Production Studio 8 was this busy trying to repurpose everything into this weird jigsaw of crime time fodder, how the hell do they have time to make this game for two different SKUs, the PS2 and the Xbox? Well, trick question, because they didn't. Secret Level, who you might know from being terrible, is the company who delivered such classics as Iron Man, Iron Man 2, and Golden Axe Beast Rider. They were hired by Capcom and got the honor of porting Streetwise to the Xbox, and just like all their previous work, it was not great. Yeah, the Xbox version is the inferior of the two and is plagued with save game issues where sometimes it'll just ignore your progress when you quit and save the game. Saving Streetwise, even on the PS2, is kind of a gamble because instead of being able to save anywhere or like going up to a phone book or sleeping in a dumpster or to save your game, it'll only just save when it wants, mostly after when major story sequences are completed and you'll sometimes get a journal updated message, but not all the time. On the PS2 it seems to behave fairly consistently, but on the Xbox you can lose hours of progress for no reason. Awesome. It's issues like everything I just said that contributed to Final Fight Streetwise's catastrophic reception to gaming and review outlets and have placed an extensive list of the top 10 worst games under various categories such as worst transition from 2D to 3D, worst GTA clone, worst Capcom game, etc. It's these reviews that incited complete public apathy towards the game and it wasn't exactly trending on a wave of smiles and sunshine in the first place. Most people hated the transparent and sloppy attempt at being GTA when it was first shown months before, and wasn't going to change any minds when it finally released. 
this is a shame because you can clearly see a love for the franchise dotted throughout the finished game. Various posters, easter eggs, sound bites, cameos, and in-jokes from designers and artists who were forced into a less than ideal situation. They had a solid foundation to work off of, but with limited budget and time frame and the major aesthetic reboot, the team's passion just couldn't save it. While most assume Capcom closed Production Studio A due to Streetwise's failure, it might have been something that was always in the cards, as the publisher made other closures that year, most notably Clover, just a few months later. Unfortunately, this was the last major Final Fight release to ever grace us, unless you count the much more warmly received Final Fight Double Impact Collection, which you should. You can unlock the Final Fight episode of the USA Street Fighter cartoon, and uh... That being said, even though Streetwise is a permanent stain on Final Fight's record, the characters and world of Metro City at least live on in Street Fighter, which, as we know, is as booming and as dominant of a force as it ever was. Okay, I'll, I'll stop. I'll stop. Sorry. Put up your Duke Street Fighters, let's dump on an obscure fighting game that doesn't really deserve it, shall we? Yes! To be the realist of reals though, I've wanted to talk about Street Fighter, the movie, the game, ever since the inception of what happened, cause it's a story that absolutely fascinates every corner of my mind palace. <laughs> is is just so stupid, so ill-advised, so transparent parent of a cash grab that even in the naive 90s, the most ardent of Capcom fans were like, are you serious? This this is a thing. You're 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 selling this. Oh, uh, oh, oh, okay then. But to properly unravel the tapestry of Jean-Claude Van Damme, incredible technologies and oodles and oodles of blue screen, we have to go back to the beginning. And that starts with a soft pillowy year that was 1994. Capcom was a dominating force in the arcade scene at the time, with an avalanche of fighting games, beat-em-ups, and more fighting games, and were positively beaming with large phallic energy. They were especially bolstered by the phenomenon that was Street Fighter, and decided to shop the IP around Hollywood to see if there were any takers. This group of Capcom bigwigs, headed up by Kenzo Sujimoto, came out of every movie studio meeting they had, pretty disappointed as none of the pitches sounded right. Film studios either had no idea what the hell Street Fighter was, or were at least aware of the franchise's importance, but had no solid ideas. Universal Studios was set to be the last of Capcom's meetings, and American movie producer Ed Pressman knew he had to impress the Capcom crew before they headed back to far off, exotic Nippon, where they could apparently never be contacted again. He turned to Steven E. D'Souza, a writer on various films like Die Hard and Commando, and asked if he could throw together a rough script for the film that same night and have it ready for the morning. D'Souza agreed, but only on the caveat that he could direct as well, which would net him a bigger payday. Man, look at this fucking guy. You get that cheddar, son. Is this a joke? This money isn't worth the paper it's printed on. He set to work on the script, hastily writing throughout the night, which in turn urged the wheel of fate to start turning. Capcom, as everyone knows, hated the pitch and immediately took the next flight back to Japan. No! Against all odds, they actually loved D'Souza's idea of turning the Street Fighter universe into a flagrant G.I. Joe knockoff, as it would easily lend itself to action figures and merchandise, which it did. The movie, however, had to be out by the end of that year, so production was a frantic, rushed affair. There were cheesy one-liners, bison dollars, completely rewritten character backstories. It just made you wanna change the channel! Now, and this was important, Capcom was funding half the production themselves and thought that they might as well kill two birdies with one stony and squeeze a game out at the same time, why not? 
We have actors dressed up, right? They're already working for us, right? Mortal Kombat is getting uncomfortably more popular every day, right? So let's just digitize these assholes and show these punk kids, Eddie Boon Boon and Johnny Tubbs, what we're made of. Oh, wait, we have no idea how to digitize actors, transfer all that data, and make a game out of it. Huh? Oh, well, who does? Incredible technologies! Now, let's, let's back up just a bit. Incredible Technologies had been around the arcade scene for a few years, as some of you may remember the unmemorable Time Killers, which was their first fighting game. They released a few coin ops under the label of Strata Games, and at an arcade trade show in early 1994, they're exhibiting said Killers of Time to a crowded audience. Capcom, who had a booth nearby, noticed this and came to see what all the hubbub was about. Time Killers was not known for its in-depth gameplay or much else, but it did have a striking and colorful visual style and it impressed from a technical standpoint. See, Capcom had been testing the waters on how to digitize game graphics, as they felt it was a flashy look that was taking North American arcades by storm. However, rather than waste their own time and resources trying to suss out the details themselves, once they saw what Incredible Technologies was doing with their arcade hardware, they figured, why not have these guys take a crack at it? So, a deal was signed and Incredible Technologies would start working on Street Fighter 3. I didn't stutter. Yes, the original plan was for Capcom to allow an unproven American company to develop what was, at that time, the most anticipated video game sequel ever. So, what happened? I'll mention this now. Almost all of the information here was gleaned from the legendary SRK thread posted by one Alan Noon, one of the lead designers at Incredible Technologies who had a big hand in developing Street Fighter, the movie, the game. If you want a bit more in-depth insight into the project, well, just check the description below. Pressing forward, Alan maintained that yes, in those early talks with Capcom, it was being thrown around that the game would be called Street Fighter 3, featuring lots of new characters, combos, and of course Shen Long shut up. No, I'm I'm being serious, and yes, more on that later. These early talks were just that early, and a lot of the team at Incredible Technologies seemed to be confused about what form the game would ultimately take. This, however, was made clear when Capcom asked them to fly down to Australia where the Street Fighter movie was being filmed. They would capture all the actors performing the various moves and stunts, and then fly back to Chicago with all the data and get to work. That's, you know, quite a long haul just to dress people up and film them. Why not just hire local lookalikes in studio and get the work done that way? Well, Capcom had such faith that the movie was going to bust all the blocks. They're joking. That they needed to have all these Hollywood stars shine. Thespians like Damien Chapa, Grand L. Bush, and Kenya Sawada. However, remember when I said that the shooting schedule for the movie was a rushed, hectic affair since they needed to fart it out before December of that year? Well, that carried over to the game as well. The team at IT were promised to get around six to eight hours of filming time with each actor so they could be sure to get all the data they needed to avoid future reshoots. However, Jean-Claude Van Damme only showed up for about four hours and then just left. I guess because he's Jean-Claude Van Damme and there were unsnorted lines of coke somewhere on set. And who wants to go with me? Mr. Noon described working with certain actors as Ming Na Wen, who played Chun Li, and Peter Tuiasosopo as Honda, absolute pleasures to work with, while some other actors were less so. And there wasn't anyone more less so than Greg Rainwater, the actor hired to play T Hawk. Wonder why T Hawk wasn't a selectable character in either the arcade or home versions? Well, Here's why. On his scheduled day of shooting for Incredible Technologies, Mr. Rainwater had rapped on the movie, so when they realized he was running late for his session, they knocked on his trailer. It had been completely cleared out. Far in the distance, an airplane could be heard sailing off into the sky. 
As for the other performers that actually showed up, well, several of them could not even come close to pronouncing the iconic special move names fighting game fans could recite in their sleep. IT staff had an arcade machine in the studio, performed the special moves over and over, they had the names written phonetically, and they even had Capcom employees on hand to coach the actors. No matter what they tried, it was worse than what we got. And of course, what we got was... Hurricane! Dragon! Dragon! Ah, I love it. Some of the recording sessions also took longer than others, as most of the actors had never even thrown a punch or a kick in a movie before. Again, since the production of the film was slapped together so quickly, the on-set trainer, Benny the Jet Urquidez, had only a few weeks to teach all the actors something before cameras rolled. This is the opposite of Mortal Kombat's casting process because all those performers had years of experience in various disciplines which led to smooth filming. This is partially responsible why some moves and animations in Street Fighter looked so bad. But the bad didn't stop there. Since Incredible Technologies were so busy on set, they had no time to check out what was new in arcades, especially in far off Australia. So, when Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo hit the scene, they had heard whispers of a legendary warrior named Akuma, and they wanted him in their game real bad. Capcom couldn't provide much material for the character, so IT had to make their own interpretation of him and ask the costuming department of the film to whip up something. And I present to you something. They didn't have a lot of time left to film, so they asked a stuntman who had a martial arts background if they would be interested in helping out. Since the recording sessions up to that point were taking forever, someone with more formal training would make the most of the filming schedule they had left. Now, since not a lot was known about Akuma at that point, a lot of his moves and animations are sort of just... Yeah... Oh, there's more. We need a new character too. Who can we get? Uh, uh, we're running out of time. Oh, they, they got lots of spare bison trooper suits and wardrobe. Let's let's throw him in there. What's his name? Uh, knife man, bazooka dude, uh, the blade. Yeah, yeah, blade. Um, we have no one who can play them though. Alan, get your ass in that suit. Yes, Alan Noon also played the blade. Some motherfuckers are always trying to ice skate up here. Now, one of the crazier things about the movie that bled into the game's development is that one of Capcom's mandates for the film's script, remember, they were co-financing it, was that every single Street Fighter character from the cast of the new Challengers had to be included in the story. But what about Fei Long? Well, to be blunt, he was just straight out cut. To be accurate though, he was in earlier drafts of the script and was working with Guile and Kami in the AN forces. Suddenly though, Capcom just started to push actor Kenya Sawada real hard and he eventually just replaced Fei Long. In the mid-90s, Capcom was looking to have this guy as their own Sagata Sanshiro style mascot, but that failed when they saw him act. A single boat against everything he's got? The pilot would have to be out of his mind. Man, this guy is just bubbling with charisma, isn't he? That being said, Incredible Technologies had two recording sessions with him. One as Sawada and the other in full Fei Long garb and even performed all his moves for video capture. Unfortunately, due to time constraints, they had to drop one of the characters and due to Capcom's insistence on pushing the Sawada agenda, Fei Long was dropped. Oddly enough though, he does make a sneaky appearance in a Mortal Kombat inspired arena for uh, some reason. Now, the elephant in the room, Shen Long. This was a character inclusion Incredible Technologies was pushing for on day one, but Capcom had always refused. You've lost your balls. Halfway into filming, however, word came down, Shen Long is a go. Remember, when this character appears, it must be like God is coming down. Alan Noon was in charge of this character, so he found an actor, dressed him up in green and black training outfit, gave him a beard and wrapped a headband over his eyes. You see, uh, Akuma had punched his eyeballs out in a previous encounter, but Shen Long was so OP, he didn't need them. I guess you didn't see that, did you? 
Also, he had a big scaly horn dragon arm. Now, the idea here was, if Ryu and Ken could use the key of a dragon to shoot energy out from their hands or light their own fists on fire, Shenlong had gone so far beyond that he was literally morphing into a dragon. He would also have no blocking animations. Yeah, you could hold back to block, but he would simply weave out of the way of every attack, Matrix style. Under the hot studio lights, the dragon arm makeup would start to melt after a while, but some of his moves did get filmed. Sadly, they were not finalized in time for the game's launch, and the character was cut. There's not even a surviving photo of the costume, which is a real shame, because it sounds hilarious. Now, with all that, the development of Street Fighter the movie the game was much like the film itself, a chaotic whirlwind due to the accelerated production schedule. There was the obvious excitement of a young team getting to work on it, wanting to impress Capcom, trying to implement lots of new elements and gameplay, but all these factors wound up resulting in feature creep. See, since they spent so much time up front filming the actors and didn't have access to their actual workstations back in the US, they had very little time to plan out the game beforehand. Therefore, once they returned to their studio in Chicago, a lot of stuff was just crammed into the game without the proper amount of thought, or testing, or thought. What also didn't help matters was the fact that when the movie released that December, it was met with commercial and critical failure. This didn't do much to boost the morale of the team who were left stuck making an adaptation of it. SFT MTG actually hit arcades a full six months after the film in June of 1995, which was probably the worst June it could have released in. The day Street Fighter the movie the game released was the most important day of your life. But for me, it was Tuesday. Mortal Kombat 3, Virtua Fighter 2, and even Street Fighter Alpha Warrior's Dreams had all been unleashed in and around that time as well. So who the hell would pump quarters into this when you could just be playing this? Aside from just the visuals and the stigma of being attached to such a stinky movie, the game was also really hard to take seriously from a gameplay perspective. Insanely overpowered characters and combos that permitted nonsensical juggling, secret bullshit moves like Guile's handcuffs, Cammy's whip, Sagat's eye lasers, or Balrog's projectile reflection all made Street Fighter veterans vomit in rage. Compared to what was coming out, it was seen as an absolute joke and was considered the first real misstep with the franchise. Capcom, sensing either the displeasure of fans or after playing it themselves, decided maybe something could be salvaged from this disaster. Enter the home versions. Handled internally by Capcom's California-based office, this might as well be considered a completely new game. It was originally going to be released on the PSX, the Saturn, and the 32X as well, until someone actually looked at a 32X and quietly cancelled it. The biggest difference was that DJ and Blanca were added to the roster, as the actors had their sessions recorded, but the data was not cleaned up for the coin-op version in time, so Capcom just decided to simply draw over the missing frames themselves. This same treatment happened to just about every other character in the game. The actor's awkward stances and moves were edited to more closely reflect the hand-drawn sprites from older Street Fighter titles. The voices were completely redone and re-recorded. All new backgrounds were added, super moves changed, all the crazy bullshit and juggling was just cut out. It was a complete page one rewrite, with the only connecting fiber being that it used digitized graphics. Well, kinda. Although, sadly, no Shen or Fei Long in sight. While this version was made exclusively to try and right the wrongs of the arcade version, it really did no such thing, as it was again critically lambasted by game magazines and the like. Although, one positive was the subtitle of the Japanese version, Street Fighter Real Battle on Film, which is a money name. 
Regardless, a question needed to be posed on fighting game fans. Why would you play this if you could just get Super Turbo on the 3DO or simply wait for home ports of Alpha? Why would you want to buy it at all when the movie at the time was so reviled? Again, there were a lot of factors here that simply made the current market pretty hostile, thus limiting the chances of Street Fighter the movie The Game to stand out. The fact that Capcom went with digitized actors was such a flagrant attempt to grab some of Mortal Kombat's limelight did it no real favors. It's very narrow-minded tunnel vision. Ah, that game looks like this, that's why it's popular! Digitized actors were only part of MK's appeal. The technique had been seen before in other midway titles like Pit Fighter or Warriors from the Hood, so it wasn't just that. What Capcom failed to realize was that the unique martial arts meets fantasy inspired story, the characters, the violence, and the different style of gameplay made for a mix that simply dressing up a bunch of weirdos in front of a camera impossible to replicate. This is what made Street Fighter real battle on film get relegated to the dustbin of history so, so quickly and remains one of the only games in the franchise history to never see some sort of re-release. As for Capcom themselves, their fighting games are existing, cer certainly, um, you know, there, there's been some missteps, but, but yeah, you, the, hey, look over here, Resident Evil 2 Remake, whoa! Uh, but it's not all bad news for Capcom in regards to this particularly dark part of their hilarious past. Let's discuss Street Fighter, the actual movie, one last time. Now, upon its release, it was considered a massive failure, but it actually turned out to be really lucrative for Capcom in the long run, since they co-financed the film. They wound up getting quite a good deal in terms of video sales and rentals, and even better when it came to broadcast rights. When I was invited to their pre-E3 Captivate event back in 2011, a senior Capcom official told me, Yeah, yeah, the movie sucks, huh? It was a huge mistake? We make a million dollars every time it's shown on TV. You got paid? Of course! As for incredible technologies, well, sadly, they closed their doors shortly after Street Fighter. Wait, no, they're still in business! Turns out, they were also responsible for the popular Golden Tee series and were making new entries for it up until the late aughts, and currently design home software and casino machines, so good on them. Oh right, Alan Noon? Blade himself? He was briefly at Epic Games on Shadow Complex Remastered and is currently working for, um, Magic Leap, a VR company, I think? Not entirely sure. Now, despite this being one of those rare cases where all the companies came out the other end intact and are all still in business, it doesn't change the fact this is a bittersweet story. In his forum posts, Alan Noon states he was a massive Street Fighter fan at the time, I mean, who wasn't in the 90s, and it was a dream come true to work on the franchise. However, due to the time constraints, working with new technology, and an aggressive production schedule, he laments they just weren't able to make the game they wanted to. Incredible Technologies had hoped this would be their big break, and set out to make the best game they could, but unfortunately, it just couldn't come together in the end. But personally, I think any piece of media that can give us can't be all bad. If you'd like us to shine our judgmental light on another steaming pile of video game bile, drop a hint in the comments below or send a concerned and strong worded email to mattmymuscles at gmail.com. Thanks for watching, everybody. Game over! Welcome to another dope crazy, savage, and smoking sick episode of What Happened, the show where we chronicle the catastrophes, document the disasters, and recount the regrettables. And if we're talking regrets, there's a few companies that have made more decisions that would be better off just not happening than Capcom. Therefore, this week's subject is going to take the combined might of two brightly colored bone-based mascots to hack and slash their way through it. So without further ado, let's Get crazy! I'm Matt and Muscles, and I'm gonna tell you what happened. Hey, Matt, please allow me to interject here and fill your dark soul with light. Oh, it's Derek from Stop Skeletons from Fighting. Hey, that's me. I'm Derek. It's me, Derek. 
I figured it was about time I invaded one of your videos for a change, huh? And besides, this story is more than just a story of one game, it is the story of a legendary video game company and their struggle with relevancy between two sides of the planet. And it's a story that my partner Grace and I have researched a little bit about. So allow me to be the Virgil to your Dante, Matt old buddy. So let's talk about what happened to DMC Devil May Cry. Fuck you! Ah, Capcom, remember the mid-aughts where Capcom, I, I mean Cap God, could do no wrong? Yeah, they had an absolutely uh, flawless record. No, I didn't mean those games, I meant like like Dead Rising and, and stuff like that. There, Yeah, there, there were some bad ones too. But it wasn't entirely their fault. This point in time was the middle of a hard decade for Japan-based developers and publishers. The Japanese markets were shifting, and games with a, I guess, Japanese flavor stopped making sense as the years went on. For example, in 2002, it was estimated that half of all video games sold were bought by the Japanese, but by 2010, when DMC was officially announced, the Japanese people only bought 10% of all games sold. Uh, for instance, you know Street Fighter 4? Yeah, that was a mega hit, right? Well, in 2008, the first console edition of Street Fighter 4 sold about 200,000 copies in Japan and about 2.3 million overseas. The times, they were a-changin', and this is where our story begins proper with the release of Devil May Cry 4 in 2008. Devil May Cry 4 represented Capcom's first big return to a classic IP in a while. Building off the critical and commercial success of Devil May Cry 3, Dante's Awakening, the series had already been brought back from the brink after the mess that was Devil May Cry 2, Capcom was very optimistic for the sales potential of the franchise. And they really had every reason to be. The God of War series showed no signs of stopping and proved there was a global appeal to character action games. Not only that, it would be the series' first time on HD consoles. That's right! We said consoles! This was the first time the demon-killing stylings of Dante would see release on non-Sony machines, adding the Xbox 360 and PC to the mix at launch. HD development, as many companies found out, saw a dramatic increase in costs and development time. All those fancy over-the-top cutscenes weren't cheap. So when it was all said and done, 2008's Devil May Cry 4 sold a total of 3 million copies worldwide, which ain't a number to kick out of bed, but wasn't dramatically better than the last game. You see, Dante's Awakening topped out at around 2.3 million units, though, wait, no, th things weren't adding up at all. DMC4 was available on three different formats, which should have resulted in a way better style rating. What, just an A? Ah, Capcom was hoping for a triple S. So, it's not like DMC4 was a flop or something. Wait, did Capcom think DMC4 was a flop or something? It's kind of hard to say, but yeah, kinda. I mean, when it comes to the whole saga of DMC Devil May Cry and reboots in general, the first thing publishers should do is properly read the room. So what is the thought process here? Well, most would say, hmm, maybe that's just the upper limit of how many people are actually into DMC because... Wrong, says Capcom. The problem is that people are just tired with the current style of Devil May Cry. No, no, we're not. We're, we're not. We're right, because game reviewers are complaining about the cheesy dialogue and the silly characters. Oh, no, don't don't get rid of that. That's what gives the series its... Ah, yes, and we can make the combat less complicated for newcomers. Hey, can you even hear us? Hello? Yes. This is brilliant! Oh my god! Everyone, start picking out your yachts! This is gonna be the best-selling Devil May Cry game ever! Oh wait, no, no! Oh. So, what, what happened? happened? Devil May Cry is at its core a complicated combo-based franchise that requires high execution, has weird over-the-top storylines, and is also merciless to newcomers. So you can bet it really stung when God of War did something similar appealing to the West, but resulted with godlike sales numbers. But regardless, Capcom thought there was a problem and felt that Devil May Cry 4 should have done better commercially. And Capcom, of course, had a surefire solution. Appeal to the West! This edict, spearheaded by one KJ Inafune, whose career has been documented with stalker-like precision over at SSFF... Oh, yes, thank you, thank you, too kind, thank you. ...resulted in such other what-happened fodder like this, and that, and even more of this. Now, despite all those games being 
massive mistakes. Capcom producers were already acknowledging this in 2009, by the way, that there was a problem with Western versus Eastern development coalition cooperations. But there was still plenty of gas left in the tank, and Capcom had their sights turn westward and just couldn't turn the car around in time to stop all this. So, for a rebooted Devil May Cry, they decided to let some action game luminaries handle their precious IP, ones that had made some headway in the West. Kinda. Now we enter Ninja Theory. Now, while they're relatively recognized today, back in 2010, their name would elicit a hearty who? Well, their previous efforts included 2007's Heavenly Sword, a game many hardcore action game fans criticized for its somewhat simple combat and the fact it seemingly prioritized elaborate story and facial animation technology instead. Then there's their 2010 effort, Enslaved, Odyssey to the West, a game criticized for its somewhat simple combat but lauded for its elaborate facial anime. And who could forget Kung Fu Combat, a game criticized for, well, this. So yeah, even though their combat chops were arguably spotty, at this point in time there weren't many western options who could really come to grips with the legacy of Devil May Cry's combat anyway. Rumors, however, of a DMC reboot began circulating in 2010, with the May issue of Game Informer even stating Ninja Theory was involved. This really couldn't have been timed any worse if they tried. By this point, Capcom's big western campaign was pretty busy being a massive embarrassment. Both Bionic Commando and Spyborgs sold dismally the previous year, and Dark Void, released earlier in 2010, was hot on its heels to sell even worse. Not to mention, the original Devil May Cry creator Hideki Kamiya and his new studio Platinum Games at this point had proven themselves to the public with the incredible Bayonetta. So, by the time this Game Informer report hit, Capcom fans were already starting to push back against the inevitable. DMC was basically doomed, at least from a PR standpoint, before it even had a chance to prove itself. So, again, in a read the room style moment, we're not sure what Capcom was expecting when they officially unveiled the debut trailer for DMC Devil May Cry at that September's TGS to a very mixed response. And when we say mixed, we mean it was colossally one sided. First off, you have a trailer that, let's be honest here, didn't look all that good. The character models felt off. It showed zero real-time gameplay, it wasn't made by Capcom, and was yet another attempt to have a product appeal exclusively to the West, when all signs pointed to stop doing that. This made for a goopy miasma of negativity that always permeated the news whenever DMC Devil May Cry was brought up, and would be something it never fully recovered from. Oh, and one last thing, the guy that helped launch this whole Westward expansion thing and specifically was heavily involved in DMC's redesign, KJ Japan is over Inafune, he said, yep, good luck putting out all my fires, peace out, and left Capcom literally a month later to start working on his own massive successes. Even if Ninja Theory were making the best playing action game ever created, and they were not, they still had to contend with fans who were very not into the tonal shift of the characters and the world. When fans thought of Dante, they thought of things like this. And the concept art, images, and designs coming out of DMC were giving them this. This, however, actually turned out to be Capcom's doing rather than Ninja Theories. I can't emphasize this more, Ninja Theory were basically just journeyman developers giving Capcom what they wanted. Conceptualizing the new Dante during development saw the art team coming back with designs that closely mimicked his original look, but it was the producers at Capcom Japan, including Devil May Cry 3 and 4 director Hideaki Itsuno and Keiji Inafune, who urged Ninja Theory to explore more alternative options. So while it's easy to blame the new developer at the wheel, they were mandated by Capcom to overhaul everything in terms of art and aesthetics. But of course, the fans didn't know this at the time and were looking for any and all reasons to tear into the game, so Capcom would need to be very cautious from now on so as not to further goddammit. So here is the last and maybe the most damaging aspect of DMC's development, Tamim Antionades. Keep uh, shall we say, was not remotely prepared for the backlash against DMC's new direction. Or, you know, maybe that's too generous. On Venture Beat shortly after the game's really hated reveal trailer, a question was posed. So how do you feel about the fan reaction to DMC? 
Tamim took a drag of his cigarette, and then without blinking and without pausing to exhale the smoke from his mouth, he said, I don't care. First off, I'm suddenly really starting to believe the rumors that the new Dante was based off of you, and second of all, you know who probably did care about their game selling to meme? Grin, Bionic, and Airtight Games. I'm just saying that catering to your fans is not always a bad thing, especially since the whole point of this reboot was that so that DMC would grow the fan base and not shrink it. But the Tamim train doesn't end here. And now it's time for what else did Tamim say? Well, oh. the essence of Devil May Cry is all about cool. It's about Dante being cool, making you feel cool when you're playing it. And so the combat and the style system and everything is integral to that. But you know, what was cool 12 years ago? I think that was when the first game came out isn't cool anymore. Anyway, Tamim goes on to say, If Dante, dressed as he was, walked into any bar outside of Tokyo, he'd get laughed out. While the core of these statements have some merit, this is not what you should say to convince Capcom fans that their franchise is safe. And when you think of video games as a medium, it seems as long as you make great games, generally you're fine if you keep doing the same thing over and over. Okay, the next quote I want to treat you to is from a mid-2012 PS3 magazine. At this point in our story, Ninja Theory had been receiving death threats, so I can't exactly blame him for this, but it starts out good kinda usually the worst creative crimes are made when you're trying to make a game for someone else some perceived demographic that in all likelihood doesn't actually exist from my point of view there's only one way to try and make a successful game and that's to make the game that you want to play a game that everyone involved is proud of okay uh, you know that's fine so from that point of view i don't care if it sells a thousand units or two million units oh oh no to meme oh baby no now, to be fair, this article was full of weirdness. Like, the interview really asked the hard-hitting questions like, What about the series' history with massive tits? To which he replied, I've got nothing against big tits. I'd rather have my head resting on a pair right now. Okay, duly noted. Um, while we applaud to meme for living his devil may care gimmick, all of this was a risky attitude to put forward if you want, you know, your company to continue to exist. Anyway, it might not surprise you, but Tamim did less and less interviews as time went on. No, really? <laughs> yeah, I know. And that spanned a good two whole years of solid development. During that time, we actually saw subtle changes to Dante. His voice, attitude, and other visual aspects were tweaked, despite Tamim claiming he didn't care about fan feedback. My name, by the way, is Dante. But you can call me Dante the Demon Killer. Has a nice ring to it, don't you think? One of the more evident changes was Dante's body type. He went from being somewhat scrawny and emaciated in his debut to then suddenly packing absolute beef stuff by the game's launch. So at least improvements were happening, minor as they were. Other trailers, like the one from E3 2012, seemingly put more emphasis on story and characters. And, well, story was always kind of viewed as secondary or even tertiary in the Devil May Cry universe, with action being the primary focus. Dante was just a half demon hybrid that liked killing things and being crazy. He was never much deeper than that, and he didn't really need to be. But then Capcom decided that he really needed to be. Now he's a misunderstood rebel who has a rough exterior, but secretly wants to find his place in the world, but needs the proper motivation to do so to fulfill his destiny and blah 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 blah. Again, this shows a disconnect between Capcom and their fanbase. Dante's appeal was that he was a goofy asshole, and it's unlikely these more serious, story-focused trailers sold many new fans on the franchise because it certainly wasn't pleasing the diehards. Now while all this was well and good theoretically to appeal to potential new fans of the series on a visual level, level, gameplay obviously required a redesign as well, which is a far trickier and some would say pointless endeavor. Lead combat designer Ronnie Tucker said, The goal of DMC was to make a system that allowed newcomers to create their own elaborate combos, but still offer multiple elements veterans can enjoy. However, this is like saying you want all your groceries in one bag, but don't want the bag to be heavy. The black and white of it is that high execution character action games like this are not meant to be friendly to newcomers, and designing a system around tackling this problem is basically wanting your pizza and eating it too. All these quotes about gameplay system changes were not going down well with the people who cut their teeth on things like DMC3. Okay, so now would be a good time to sum up everything so far that was working against DMC's success. A developer fans were unsure of. 
a very divisive art style and tone, combat that was trying to appeal to all ages, and constantly being compared to what was seen as the real action games coming out of Platinum, so things really couldn't get any worse until they did. Ninja Theory's last game, Enslaved Odyssey to the West, exclusively ran on the Unreal 3 engine, which was, you know, pretty standard at the time. What was not standard, however, was its inability to handle 60 frames per second, because in terms of pure design, it was never initially intended to run games at such a frame rate. So the fact that Ninja Theory were using it for DMC was, um, cause for concern. Capcom knew there was no sense in hiding it, because as soon as they showed real-time gameplay, people would use their eyes. Especially longtime fans of the series who were accustomed to the silky smooth action that all the previous entries featured. But not all was lost. While 30 frames per second would be the default on consoles, if players really needed to double or triple that, they could just purchase the Steam version. Yes, with the power afforded by PCs, DMC would run at an unlocked frame rate, with 60 being very much doable. Capcom did put a lot of work into this particular PC port, but it still wasn't enough for hardcore fans who were upset that what was seen as a long-standing DMC tenant, 60 frames per second, was now locked away on a particular format. So yeah, the reaction was not exactly what Capcom was looking for. At the end of the day though, if Unreal 3 couldn't do 60 on consoles, then there wasn't much else they could do. Oh, right. Well, okay, so Unreal 3 could get to 60 on consoles, but only by NetherRealm Studios. The blowback against DMC wasn't even exclusive to this game. It also managed to splash onto other games, like PlayStation All-Star Battle Royale. Now, we're not gonna mince words, there is a lot like a lot you can say about the roster of PlayStation All-Star Battle Royale, but one of the more unfortunate choices was using DMC Dante, or Dino, or Don't Tay, or whatever fan name you prefer, as a playable character in lieu of the classic white-haired look. You have a game that was supposed to be, at least fans thought, celebrating two decades of PlayStation titles and characters, so when the older Dante that had three exclusive Sony games under his belt was excluded, it was... It was bad. It was a bad idea. It was the wrong move. This is no one paying attention here. Especially when classic Devil May Cry 3 Dante found his way into Marvel vs. Capcom in 2011. It just seemed like Capcom made a deal to advertise the upcoming game as PlayStation Not So All Stars released at the tail end of 2012, which was not too far off the January release date of DMC a mere two months later. This inclusion slash exclusion again kind of rubbed a lot of fans a lot of the wrong way when everyone's skin was already kind of raw and bloody from the previous rubdowns. Now, with all of this ill will, Tamim drive-by comments, and the fact that Capcom never truly found their footing throughout the early HD era of gaming, it would be easy to assume DMC's launch would get a D or less in terms of style, but it wound up launching to mostly positive reviews overall, and in fact, the reviews were pretty much in line with what DMC4 initially got. However, critics still found the story predictable and a little on the nose, with paper-thin characters and silly plot twists and dialogue. Fuck you, Dante! So in terms of critical reception, nothing really changed here for the better or the worse, but the commercial aspect is another story. Capcom's initial projections for DMC was to sell 2 million copies in its first fiscal year, which it did not do, and then later revised that to 1.2 million. Furthermore, for their sales report that year, Capcom stated a few reasons why they felt the releases were languishing behind their projections, and while they didn't name DMC directly, at least one of the explanations could be applied to the project. There was a delayed response to the expanding digital contents market, and insufficient coordination between the marketing and the game development divisions and overseas markets. And finally, there was a declining quality due to excessive outsourcing. So yeah, whatever that meant. In fact, it took about five years for DMC to sell what they were initially hoping for, with Capcom reporting back in the summer of 2018 that the game finally crossed the 2.4 million unit threshold, placing it far behind the 3 million plus copies DMC4 would achieve. The main goal of this project was to catapult the series to greater sales and notoriety. While it failed to do that, DMC at least did not become the dreaded entry that killed the franchise like, say, the Bionic Commando reboot or Onimusha 4. Still, Capcom remained quiet on the character action front until they released the definitive edition for the Xbox One, PS4, in 2015. 
This had tons of gameplay improvements that fans had been vocal about, featured 60 frames per second on all versions, had all the downloadable content and additional costumes bundled in, including that classic DLC costume that was available a few months after the launch of the vanilla version. Not in a million years. <clears throat> yeah, I guess that million years came uh, faster than you thought. Anyway, sometimes, you know, definitive versions are not much better than the originals, but this is not the case here. Capcom listened to a lot of feedback and made some smart changes that truly make this the best version of DMC ever. And while that's great, it does make you wonder how much better the reboot would have done if all this new content and gameplay changes had been there day one. Furthermore, from what we can tell, the two studios are still friendly, and Itsuno has even said he would have loved to make a DMC Devil May Cry 2. Fate would deal Itsuno another hand, a hand that would see longtime Devil May Cry fans rejoicing at last. At E3 2018, during Microsoft's conference, the announcement of Devil May Cry 5, the sequel to Devil May Cry 4, was made public after several months of rumors. Within seconds, people could see that this was ignoring the continuity of Ninja Theory's world with the return of Dante, Nero, a bevy of new characters, and the cheesy cheekiness the fans have come to admire about the series. This then, of course, also marks the final nail in the coffin for Ninja Theory, because much like Grin and Airtight games before them, they saw their doors close after working with Cat. What? So, huh? What? Oh, no! That's right! Ninja Theory actually survived the DMC debacle. In fact, they found great success with Hellblade, their attempt at what they called a AAA indie title, which sounded risky on paper, but their slow rollout of well-optimized ports on the PS4, PC, Xbox One, and the eventual Switch version has clearly paid dividends. This also happens to be the next directorial effort by our old friend to meme, who has seemingly chilled out in the subsequent years. So yeah, Capcom didn't die, Ninja Theory are doing well, and unlike many, many, many less fortunate IPs, Devil May Cry is still table hopping and devil triggering to this day, but it's probably safe to assume that the book on the rebooted universe is not gonna reopen anytime soon. This is a case where a misguided attempt to broaden the appeal of a series neither destroyed nor caused it to flourish, which is exceedingly rare in the video game industry. It just goes to show that Devil May Cry fans are absolutely crazy and are strong enough to endure a few bumps in the road for their favorite missile riding, pizza eating, guitar playing, motorcycle swinging series. Speaking of a few bumps in the road, however, maybe you'd like to see what difficulties Capcom had bringing over some of their other famous franchises like Mega Man or uh, Devil Kings? Ooh, yeah, do you want to hear how Devil Kings is kind of, but actually not at all, a spin-off of Devil May Cry? Why not check out the video in the link for How the West Was Worse Capcom Edition? And in the next little while, we're going to have a part two, an exclusive about the East versus West changes for Street Fighter and Final Fight. Oh, Final Fight, you say? Well, I might have a few morsels of information I could contribute. You know, I had a feeling you would, Matt. Be on the lookout for that over at Stop Skeletons From Fighting. Derek, thank you so much for helping out on this episode of What Happened, and tell Grace thanks for her tireless research as well. Oh, I will. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. So, from me, Matt McMuscles, and Derek, I'm wrong about Eternal Darkness Alexander. It is not for me. Thanks for watching, everyone. Yeah, whatever. Come talk to me when you finished Ill Bleed. Shut up! Welcome once again to another episode of What Happened, the show where we 24-7, 365. But no one is better at taking their fans for a ride than Capcom, the seminal Japanese publisher slash developer who's probably responsible for everything you've ever liked about video games. However, that ride has undoubtedly had some peaks and valleys along the way, as some of those Capcom franchises or characters that you fell in love with have since been blipped from history. Nowadays, though, if you're into Resident Evil, Devil May Cry, or Phoenix Wright, you have it pretty good in all honesty, but there's one fanbase that have it not so pretty good, and those are the ones that maybe supported Capcom the most, and that's the Piano 9 fans. I mean, fighting game fans. The last several years have been 
kind of very rough for a variety of reasons, be it lukewarm launches, poor communication, or iffy DLC practices. But while Street Fighter V more or less managed to turn itself around, Capcom's only other fighting game of this generation, Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite, has to be one of, if not the biggest failure in the realm of fisticuffin. Yeah, you hear that cross deck and you're off the hook! Yeah, we knew you could do it. Whoa, 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 slow down there. Did you really think you were gonna hog this subject all to yourself? Why, if it isn't Guinness Book of World Records winner for most subscribed channel that specializes in fighting games, Maximilian, dude! Hey there! Hello, Matthew. Stop calling me that. Anyway, with Max's help, we're gonna be tag teaming to break down the long, tragic journey of Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite. So, without further ado, let's, let's go! go! So, grab your time stone and let's travel back to one of the most glorious years in all of the years, 19 goddamn 94. The world was fertile and vibrant, and blessed with many natural wonders such as Jamie Lee Curtis and True Lies, Ace of Base, Donkey Kong Country... But that's all garbage. Why? Because X-Men Children of the Atom, that's why. This absolute magnum dick of a fighting game set a new standard for graphics and gameplay in the arcades, as it took full advantage of Capcom's CPS2 board. It also set an exciting precedent for fans of comics or video games in general. Oh, if Capcom is making... Marvel games, what if both sides clash in an epic struggle? What if Ryu could dragon punch Cyclops? What if Zangief could pile drive Cyclops? And what if M. Bison could kill Cyclops? Unfortunately, those questions would go unanswered for about two years, because then X-Men vs. Street Fighter was released. Thus kicked off half a decade of amazing, manic, over-the-top, combative fanboying between two pop culture powerhouses. This culminated in 2000, as it saw Marvel vs. Capcom 2, New Age of Heroes released, which really cemented the legacy of Capcom vs. Fighters. Clocking in at 56 goddamn characters, upping the teams to an insane 3 vs. 3, and introducing my personal favorite, the sexy seductress, Amingo. Marvel 2 established itself as an absolute classic. Things only got more hype from there, as the unbalanced but nevertheless fun and deep gameplay exploded in popularity just two years later, as it was heavily featured in the early Evos, becoming a pillar of the fighting game community. Then for a long time, nothing happened. During these dark ages, fighting games, particularly 2D ones, struggled to find relevance in a marketplace filled with games like Virtua Fighter 4, Dead or Alive 3, and of course, the king of them all, Mortal Kombat Deception. Then, in 2008, Capcom returned to the arena with Street Fighter 4, which proved to be a sales success and felt they needed to capitalize on this fighting game renaissance while it was hot, and what better follow-up than clashing once again with the Marvel Universe? Things had changed since the late 90s, however, and rather than being almost out of business, business was a boomin' and a whole heap of Marvel heroes now had MAXIMUM mainstream exposure. We're talking about guys like Iron Money, Hot God, and Captain Duty, and since his movie was in the works at that time, they threw in Sassy Doctor as well. Marvel vs. Capcom 3 Fate of Two Worlds released in 2011, with one of the worst logos ever, and longtime fans lost their collective shit. The game featured a bold comic book art style, had a great balance of fan favorites and newcomers, and was generally really fun to play. A lot of skeptics, however, assumed Capcom would just put out a better version a few months later, which they did. But hey, Ultimate Marvel 3 had some awesome new additions and was seen as a superior iteration. With that being said, the game definitely needed some balance changes, but official support had dried up and Capcom wasn't talking. The next time Marvel 3 was mentioned was when it was delisted from all digital services in late 2013. In fact, this even kicked off lots of Marvel franchises, disappearing from the Digiverse, including Marvel Origins Collection, and its terrible, terrible box art. This move to start regaining their franchises that they had licensed out to companies that were now smaller than them, and infinitesimal next to Disney, is a behavior that would be intrinsically linked to Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite's eventual fate.
In December of 2016, Capcom announced a new game in the series at PSX. What's PSX, you ask? Well, it was a big PlayStation-themed show that Sony just stopped doing. Now, this was a bit odd. Why didn't Capcom show it at E3 or EVO? PSX wasn't exactly the biggest venue to show off a brand new fighting game, especially one that was multi-platform, so why not just wait until E3? No, there's something else. Something ugly. Something malignant. Regardless, people were excited because the MCU was now, um, doing pretty good. <laughs> but hardcore Marvel players were a bit more subdued. Infinite reverted back to the 2v2 setup of its roots, and Infinity Stones were added to the main gameplay loop, which would be the replacement for that third character. While it was nice that Capcom were shaking things up, some people thought they detected the memorable st stench of gems from Cross Tekken, which would thankfully not be the case. One thing, however, that definitely was the case was the suspicious roster. Now, some people were pretty enthusiastic about X's inclusion. Yo! Fuck you! Oh my god, what the fuck?! <laughs> yeah, that was pretty good. Others felt it was a bit worrisome that there was nary a whiff of a mutant. The months ticked by and it was quiet on all fronts until E3 2017, where Infinite had its first proper unveiling. The story mode was highlighted in a new shiny trailer, and it probably shouldn't have. Oh cool, there's Thanos, and there's Frank West, and there's Rocket, and... Oh my god. What would you do if I sang out of tune? <sighs> Now, we don't want to harp on this, but it can't be overstated how Chun-Li's creepy porcelain baby face stuffed in a sausage casing permanently damaged the fan perception of Marvel from then on out. No one on the greater internet was talking about the gameplay, the Infinity Stones, or the story itself because... Just take a look at this! Also, get a load of Captain Duty. <laughs> Woof. So, why did certain characters like Monster Mash over here look like Monster Mash over here? Conversely, why the new fighters look pretty sharp? Well, there's a good reason for that, or a bad reason, really. Because the developmental details of a lot of Capcom projects, especially those tied up by a bunch of NDA psych locks, aren't really privy to the public. Thankfully though, almost two years since its debut, enough pieces of the puzzle have been put together and enough lips have gotten ever so looser. Close to the launch of the game, some staff within Capcom, under anonymity, revealed that the budget for Infinite wasn't exactly high, with one quote putting it succinctly by describing it as cheap as shit. While exact numbers are not known, Marvel's entire budget for the base game was comparable to just one season of DLC for Street Fighter V. Now, Capcom's flagship fighter did have additional backing by Sony, but seemingly no such deal was put into place for Infinite. Thus, it's safe to assume Capcom was funding most of it, if not all of the game by themselves, and they weren't exactly splurging on it. Now, how do you cut costs in a fighting game? Well, you just do what you do in the old days. See? Okay, so let's compare, say, Venom and Dante. Notice the distinct drops in quality here, here, and, and here? Well, that's because they just grabbed Dante's model or his animations from Marvel 3, a game with a very different art style, and just plopped him into Infinite. Do that a few dozen times, and you have your roster. What's more is that both games ran on vastly different engines, as Capcom's proprietary MT framework, which they have since abandoned, powered the comic book contrast in Marvel 3, whereas Infinite used Unreal 4, which powers just about every other fighting game nowadays. This might have caused some... I... awkwardness? Look! Look! Speaking of art styles, many fans pointed out Infinite's lack of one. Maybe Capcom didn't want this to be seen as a mere upgrade to Marvel 3, so a softer, more semi-realistic look was chosen instead. It was pretty apparent that most of the models looked rushed and sorta of cheap, while the new fighters had a considerably more polished look. According to anonymous Capcom staff, these issues were raised to the higher-ups who were producing the game. The concerns, however, were apparently waved off, citing that it was a non-issue as no one would notice. Yeah, well, I want it on record that this is a bad idea. Now, while this has a modicum of truth to it, as all the frantic action and screen-filling special moves would make it nigh impossible to discern such detail, but 
That doesn't hold true if you say, then zoom in on the Crypt Keeper during your story mode trailer. Not content with just that, Capcom released a downloadable demo for said story mode that same E3 weekend to spread positive word of mouth about the game. So, what the hell happened? It didn't. Now, it might have been a good idea on paper, but this demo could have possibly done more harm than good. There was no versus component of any kind, no training, and was compromised of just a few limp fights against computer-controlled drones. That was it. Even as a product promoting a story mode, it did little to excite, and also prevented people from really experimenting with the gameplay. Infinite's best feature. That was the one thing people were actually pumped about, as everyone playing versus on the E3 show floor were having a blast. But the majority of fans sitting at home were getting a vastly different experience. One more thing that happened during E3 2017 that in conjunction with all the other bad press formed a type of icky pace that just gooped onto Marvel Infinite and never let go. That of course being... Namkai and Arc System Works literally announcing another fighting franchise that had a dynamic art style, three versus three tag matches, and featured legendary characters known the world over. You can't do nothing about that. While competition is a good thing and it should strive to push two products to be better, it didn't really pan out that way. More on that later. Oh wait, more on that now. Simply put, Marvel's chances at making some type of impact were dunked into a coffin from outer space by Android 16 and then nuked. Everything Infinite lacked, fighters had, and more. Not to mention, Namco scheduled the first public beta for DBZ the exact same weekend as Marvel's launch. Convenient! Intentional or not, in the FGC at least, this was seen as the darkest of shades. The memes and shitposting came sliding in, hot and wet across social media, so the public opinion again was a bit skewed. Then, fortunately, uh, actually things got even worse. Speculation over the lack of X-Men or Fantastic Four characters was no longer unfounded, but was in fact very much found. Near the end of 2017, Marvel put all X-Men books on hiatus as they were embroiled with the disputes from 20th Century Fox over the characters. Then they relaunched X-Men later that year, but the Fantastic Four? They had been in the crap shack since 2014, as Marvel had been devaluing the brand so Fox would just give up and relinquish the rights. And we could, you know, get good Fantastic Four movies for once. This was ruthless, by the way. Marvel was scrubbing them off any media they could. Hell, the Fantastic Four logo was even taken off bombastic Bagman's bag in Spider-Man Unlimited. She even took the ice cube trays out of the freezer. What kind of a sick bitch takes the ice cube trays out of the freezer? Pettiness like that goes all the way back to Marvel 3, as the producer of that title, one Ryota Nitsuma, admitted they weren't the easiest company to work with, and cited a specific example where they would stall development, agonizing over the details of Doctor Strange's hand movements. Other anonymous Capcom staff also stated whenever they would request the use of certain characters, they would often get rebuffed from Marvel if they had no plans to use them within the MCU. One such instance was with the goddamn Juggernaut and his very, very tight suit. Capcom wanted the big jugs to return, but Marvel had no interest in pushing him. And in, in fact, Capcom were the ones who fought for characters like X-23 and Deadpool to be included in Fate of Two Worlds, and only after sustained campaigning for them would Marvel relent. Capcom tried their best to gather the most interesting heroes and villains they could, but if you have a partner who's difficult or unwilling to play ball, there's not much you can do. Therefore, Infinite would have no Sentinel, Magneto, Doctor Doom, or etc. And despite them usually being at odds with each other, both the FGC and casual audience came together to hate this as a united people. Capcom obviously couldn't go with the whole it's Marvel's fault route, so instead they went with the whole characters are just functions approach. Then producer of Capcom's fighting games Peter Combofin Rosas famously said in an interview, if you were to actually think about it, these characters are just functions, they're just doing things. Magneto, case in point, is a favorite because he has eight-way air dash and he's really fast, right? Well, guess what? Nova can do the same thing. 
Captain Marvel can do the same thing. It's just the function that people are associating with the character, and there's no shortage of that. We wanted to make sure that if a legacy of characters doesn't happen to make the roster this time, that playstyle would still be represented. The quote did certainly rub a lot of people the wrong way, but Combo Fiend couldn't exactly throw Marvel under the bus over this, so he had to take some tact when these issues came up and present to you some tact. Looking back on it, this is literally the only thing he could have said, so as to keep the heat off any one group. And I'd imagine if he had been even 1% more provocative in his answer, Disney would make sure there would be a severed Beta Ray Bill head under his sheets that night. Infinite launched on September 19th, 2017, less than a year since its reveal, and a few months shy of releasing alongside one of the biggest movie events of all time, Avengers Infinity War. Not the most synergistic time frame from a marketing perspective. One of the biggest advantages of a crossover title like this, a colorful cast of characters and a fantastical storyline, wasn't really being used to its full potential. Why they didn't wait a few more months to be closer to the hype of Infinity War is a journey into mystery itself, and considering the state of the game, more time in development wouldn't have hurt it. So, with this negative perception circulating around the game, what with its lack of an exciting roster and more enticing alternatives on the horizon, it's no surprise that all these foibles masked Infinite's best quality, its gameplay. Very quickly, people realized the Infinity Stone system didn't hurt Marvel, but only strengthened it. It functioned more like the grooves in earlier Capcom titles and led to lots of creativity and combo potential. Characters from Marvel 3, aside from their looks, got some fun changes, and the new cast received similar praise as well. Most reviews took these positives into account, claiming that the core game was really enjoyable. However, the ho-hum graphics, the lifeless stages, the stunted roster, drab menus and presentation, and the mediocre story mode were not enough to balance everything out. Then, like, within days of launching, Capcom announced that a lineup of DLC characters were coming soon. Suspiciously soon. The six fighters would include Black Panther, Venom, Monster Hunter, and the rest. And while not known at the time, it has since been revealed that all six were originally scheduled to be in the starting lineup. Producers on the project felt it would be better to cut them from launch and make them DLC, as they didn't even have a long-term roadmap for future content. Yeah. Because that always works out great. Or if they did, had scrapped it. This is partially evidenced by both Monster Hunter and Black Panther appearing within the story mode, with the latter also getting their own Wakandan-themed stage. The first three were added 30 days after the game launched, and all six were made available in less than three months, which also marked the last bit of content the game would ever receive. Also, Filipino Champ let the world know that there was originally going to be like maybe 61 characters in 18 stages, but aside from that, I think we've covered the cavalcade of bad decisions and worst timing that plagued Marvel Infinite. One of the biggest fighting game disasters- But what about Evo? Ah, right, okay, now it's time to talk about this. Not only did Infinite September release put it far away from Avengers hype, it also missed out on Evo 2017 as well. Marvel would have to survive a good six months to hopefully get picked for next year's championship series. During said announcement stream of the lineup, Mr. Wizard listed the games that would make the main stage, and Infinite was not among them. Although two other tag-focused games, DBZ Fighters and Blaze Blue Cross Tag Battle Ruby Thing, did. Mr. Wizard stated this was due to lack of participation from the community, as well as low stream numbers during other tournaments. Many people felt this was unfair, as Marvel's numbers in those areas were not bad by any stretch, and rivaled or surpassed other games, especially Cross Tag Battle, whose numbers were zero since it wasn't even released when the EVO announcement was made. What's more is that this was the first time in 16 years that a Marvel vs. fighting game would have no main stage presence. After the livestream, Markman, another EVO representative, and Stick God made comments that inferred Infinite's exclusion was not due to Capcom or even EVO themselves, saying, I go to many FGC events, probably the most outside of sponsored players. I know that MVCI is being played, but it's hard to include a game that doesn't have support. I'm not talking about Capcom because they've supported it the most. We've had meetings with some pubs and devs about including their title as a main game at EVO. You know what? We didn't get the blessing that we hope for sometimes. We actively have to seek permission and or content licenses to be able to include certain games. 
Why exactly did this happen? Well, while not confirmed, internally, Infinite was seen as a failure due to the online backlash, the reaction to the roster, the reviews, take your pick. But we were exposed. So, since the perception of Marvel was so poor, trying to improve it with more DLC, or graphical adjustments, or even an ultimate version, was felt as a waste of money, which no company wants to do. Instead, it would simply be better to wash their hands of the whole thing and, and just move on. Hell, Marvel was already doing that with Fantastic Four, but just ignoring their existence, so why not do the same here? The last patch that the game received that fixed a few bugs was in January of 2018, so that was one, two, three, five months of official support and then just nothing. Like cross fucking Tekken had a better shelf life than that, for shock's sake. It was at EVO! Fortunately though, Infinite did make up for all this failure by at least selling what Capcom projected, which was about two million copies in the first fiscal. Timestone! failed to sell 2 million copies, and instead barely sold half of Capcom's projections. This was less than Marvel 3 had managed to move 6 years earlier, by the way, and since the MCU brand was more popular than Jesus, well, uh, that ain't good. We are now almost 2 years away from Infinite's launch, and, um, uh, things are different. Disney now owns 20th Century Fox, so the X-Men and the Fantastic Four are back in the fold, all the comics are getting relaunched, and, and just look at the cover of Ultimate Alliance 3. It involves Thanos and the gems, and goddamn Wolverine is front and center, slapping you with his hairy adamantium dong. There's, there's even gonna be a DLC pack for the Fantastic Four. Oh, man. Listen, it's pretty clear that Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite got dealt a bad hand. The timing, the competition, the budget, everything was working against it and many of those elements were simply out of Capcom's hands. Every so often though, rumors pop up of the game returning in some form, or a full-fledged sequel might even be in the works, but unfortunately, there's no concrete evidence to support that, but still, it makes you think, what if? My spider sense, I'm picking up nothing. Thanks so much to my marvelous tag partner, Max, for the team up. Hey, no problem, Matt. My name is Max, and I'll see you next time. And thanks to all you Flophouse VIPers for voting strong and proud and saying, when's Marvel? And if you out there, true believers, know of any other games, fighting or otherwise, you'd like to see on what happened, punch up your comments below or web swing your way to the Flophouse VIP Patreon to officially cast your vote on our next video. And that is Nuff Said. Lots of you have been asking me to cover Resident Evil games ever since I started this show, with these suggestions running the gamut from Resident Evil Gaiden, Operation Raccoon City, and oh, I haven't forgotten about you, Umbrella Corps. But there's one particular title that stands above the rest in terms of fan outcry. The game that was too big to be contained to Spain, Africa, or even Terra Grigia. The game that needed a 600 employee strong workforce, cost more money than any other Capcom published title before it, and have the distinction of being the most divisive entry in the franchise. This of course is Resident Evil 6. And that is the key word, divisive, because make no mistake, Resident Evil 6 has its fans, and looking back on it nowadays, many people have come to appreciate its, uh, eccentricities. Critically, it also holds a spectacularly average Metacritic average, which plays right in line with the general zeitgeist around the game. Oh, but it was a huge sales disaster though. Capcom lost like a billion bison dollars on it, right? No, that's not true either. Resident Evil 6 is indeed one of, if not the most interesting game in the long running series. Well, aside from GBA RE2, of course. Ugh, man, that looks so 
fucking good! All this to say, we are not here to discuss whether RE6 is the worstiest game of all time. I mean, you can do that in the comments if you must. But rather find out the who, the why, and the what the hell happened. It's 2009, and Resident Evil 5 is a certified blockbuster that busted the shit out of said blocks. It was Capcom's highest selling single title for almost 10 years, until Rathalos and friends took that crown from it. Now, the lesson that Capcom learned from that success was, while we put a thousand more explosions and way more set pieces in co-op in RE5, and it sold better than the last one, so let's do that again? What they wound up doing was making an action movie so bombastic and over the top that it makes Michael Bay films look like Downton fucking Abbey. The director of this insanity was Ichiro Sasaki, who previously helmed both Outbreak titles on the PS2, which when compared to other mainline Resident Evils are distinctly smaller scale. But it's his last game right before helming the globe-trotting horror venture, which was RE6, that is far more interesting. Zack and Wick or as most mainstream gamers have come to know it as, uh, Zack and the Wikipedia? I don't know, it's that thing I didn't buy because I'm a Philistine. Now, I love me some ZW, but I don't think it's a project that adequately prepared Sasaki for the immense task he was about to take on. But why was he chosen to begin with? Well, unfortunately, experienced directors were slim pickings at Capcom in this time frame. Itsuno was busy with Dragon's Dogma and Mikami's hand were full with being bitter, and of course not even working there. To hopefully guide Sasaki was Resident Evil Shepherd Hiroyuki Kobayashi, whose claim to fame was producing uh, just about everything, and it's with him where we'll start our journey to see just how RE6 started to fall so hilariously off the rails. One of our original goals was to create a horror game, of course, but we wanted to create what we're calling horror entertainment. Stop right there! Like I said in our Brink episode, game devs, please refrain from using terms like genre breaker and blank killer. So with that, let's add horror entertainment to the list. All right, there we go, let's continue. We realize that there's a segment of the population out there that likes entertainment, but not necessarily horror. They're put off by horror, so how can we combine the two in a way that would bring in people who usually have an aversion to horror-related things? How could we bring them in and allow them to enjoy it? This was the first goal of the game, red flags are waving. And I know that when I explain it like that, it seems like those ideas are contradictory, and that it would be hard to achieve something like that, and I don't necessarily disagree. Which is a sign you shouldn't do it. For those that are maybe not familiar or need a refresher, RE4 was a more action-orientated push for the series. RE5 mixed in even more spicy action and the addition of co-op, and RE6 offered four completely separate campaigns, each with their own gameplay style and tone, which was them trying to appeal to absolutely everyone. But when you attempt to do that, you're not actually appealing to anyone at all. This is where the divisiveness of 6 comes into play, because Capcom wanted slash needed for not to only bust blocks, but to absolutely obliterate them. Truth be told, in terms of other franchises, Capcom lacked many big hits during the 7th generation, outside a few exceptions, so a lot was riding on the success of the Resident Evil team's gamble to appeal to those people who didn't really like Resident Evil. Hmm, does that sound familiar at all? So, hey, did you kinda like RE4 or 5? Play Leon's campaign! He's cooler than ever and not a dork like he was in the past. I see you don't have a lifeguard here at your beach. I'm not at the beach, this is a bathtub. Yo, you like Call of Duty? Not so much horror? Well, drunken amnesiac Chris Redfield and this, uh, this guy, they, they got what you need. No, wait, you look like an RE3 sort of person, am I right? Well, go on a punch venture with Jake and Sherry. Like spy shit and, uh, scarves? Ada Wong's got that shit on lock. The problem here is that every campaign had contrasting tones, pacing, and gameplay styles, but without a unified 
fine vision gluing them together. Each one individually felt a little rushed and slapped together, while taking lots of QTE and non-interactive shortcuts to pad it out. Of course, to craft all these campaigns, don't get me wrong, took a lot of hard work, as Capcom did at one point have 600 employees spread over multiple companies to get all these assets made. This was doubly impressive as they were still using their aging MT framework engine, with the ambitious design maybe outstripping its technological prowess. Logically, this also resulted in the longest game in the RE franchise by far, clocking in at around 21 hours compared to RE4's already beefy 16. Now while some can certainly argue that it offers the most proverbial bang for your buck, others call it bloated and unnecessary. What is this? Wow! What a mansion! Instead of having a singular adventure paced to fit that story, it's for separate stories that try to converge at specific points, which is ambitious, yes, but maybe not the best expenditure of developmental resources. The whole idea of multiple campaigns was risky, and Kobayashi was well aware that fan desires sometimes clash with Capcom's intentions, and leading up to the game's launch, said as such. The way I always think of it is that if Resident Evil represents a child, then the fans and us as creators are the two parents. The resulting games are like the children that are born between both of us. And just like real parents, you're not always going to agree on what is best for raising that child. Now we do always have our ear to the ground and listen to what the fans are saying, and we try to take that into account when we are making the game. But it's our job to create a new gaming experience and to offer something that's fresh and challenging. We want to make sure that what we do pleases them, but the initial reaction might not always be positive. It wasn't. While the initial trailer for RE6 set the senses ablaze, featuring tons of characters both crusty and fresh, epic set pieces, horrendous new monsters, and what clearly seemed to be a planet-wide threat, things took a turn for the worse when Capcom released a playable demo bundled with Dragon's Dogma in that summer. Honestly, this might have been the most damaging thing to the game's reputation more than anything else, at least amongst the hardcore. Now, Capcom wasn't wrong to do this, as the demo for RE5 stoked the fires for that release all the more, but it seemed like it had the opposite effect for RE6. Displeasure almost immediately arose, with many fans and publications citing problems with the awkward camera, which was changed to be more in your face, I guess, to various other technical issues like screen tearing and absurdly long load times. It also gave people a window into the action focus this series was steering hard into, which survival horror fans were already a bit wary of after Resident Evil 5. In fact, the demo was so poorly received, Capcom immediately took steps to mitigate the damage by saying they were taking the feedback from the demo and will be improving the base game with it. Kobayashi's official announcement of this came only days after the demos initial frosty reception. We've heard a lot of feedback based on the demo we released. The team is still working hard to fine tune it. We understand that parts of the demo were not received favorably, to put it mildly. We want to make sure we could try to improve on these things, the camera angles, the tearing, and other issues. Now, this was great to hear, because while many companies often say they are taking feedback into consideration, very few actually do. The character positions were changed to be on the outer edges of the screen while aiming, rather than hogging up the middle portion of the screen. The HUD was now completely customizable, and even the obtrusive Call of Duty-like waypoints could be turned off. There was another unforeseen issue with this demo, however, as modders were able to mine data revealing that Ada Wong would be the fourth campaign, which hadn't been announced yet, as well as other various monster names, modes, and difficulty settings. Fans were still very hesitant when it came to Capcom and on-disc data and DLC, as the controversy that surrounded Street Fighter Cross Tekken was still fresh in people's minds, as that released just earlier in the year. This unfortunately is something we'll need to loop back on. 
Now, despite Capcom's assurances that fixes were coming, make no mistake, this demo hurt Resident Evil 6, especially from a longtime fan perspective. The technical shortcomings and the quadruple double downing on increased action and QTEs had many people worried. And thus, the game released on October 2nd, 2012, after shifting away from the initial competition-filled November 20th release date, RE6 touted in its debut trailer. Again, to Capcom's credit, the main game indeed was improved from what the demo had offered months earlier. However, the issues we outlined before about the game's bloated, hedonistic campaigns, its increased action focus, and Chan Wu shooting mechanics were not things that could have changed when it was so late in development. These were the fundamental pillars that resulted in that astonishingly average Metascore. The director, Ichiro Sasaki, on the eve of launch even stated how he was nervous about the game's length, fearing some players wouldn't even bother finishing it. Yes, I'm just a little worried about that. However, because of that, we have developed this new service that ties into Resident Evil 6 called RE.net. We hope this service will really motivate people to keep playing the game it's for you and your friends. It will help keep all of you connected and looking forward to clearing the game. Hopefully, it will spur people to continue playing and make it to the end. <coughs> what? Oh, sorry. I was just checking to see what RE.net even was. I, I completely forgot about this. Anyway, things unfortunately don't end there. Much like Cross Tekken, On Disk DLC was found by hackers and modders in the guise of the No Hope difficulty, essentially the Leon Must Die mode for the game. It was partially on the disk, but did need additional data to function. However, Matt Pax and Ada's co-op partner were all listed on the disk as well, just not the actual data. This still resulted in multiple articles posted across the internet that had RE6's bullshit on disk DLC in the bylines, despite it not being 100% accurate. Regardless, this, coupled with the game's already mixed response, well, it didn't really help. Capcom, again, were going into damage control over this, saying that all of RE6's DLC needs that additional data to work, and this situation wasn't even close to all that on-disc character DLC of Cross Tekken. To further smooth things over, the first major title update to the game was 100% free, and included the No Hope difficulty, Ada's story automatically being unlocked, you needed to beat all the other campaigns to access it at launch, and various other fixes and quality of life improvements. Unfortunately, all these little measures were band-aids on bullet holes and didn't really result in their main goal, to make this the best-selling Resident Evil game of all time. Good work. In two months, RE5 sold 5 million copies back in 2009. Capcom stated in their projections earlier in 2012 that they expected RE6 to sell 7 million copies in that same time frame. This did not occur. Only 4.5 million copies of RE6 were sold in its launch period, which is pretty shocking considering the additional PS3 and Xbox consoles that were sold over that three-year span between releases. In addition, when you take into account the project's exponentially increased budget, it went a long way into painting RE6 as a failure. Capcom even needed to explain to its shareholders why profits were down for the year and cited RE6's underperformance as the main culprit. We believe that the new challenges we tackled at the developmental stage were unable to sufficiently appeal to users. In addition, we believe that there was inadequate organizational collaboration across our entire company with regards to marketing, promotions, the creation of plans, and other activities. We will re-examine our internal operating frameworks in order to identify areas that need to be improved concerning development as well as sales and administrative operations. That's business speak for we fucked up. Oh my god. It's awful. They essentially tried to make four games in three years but still sell it for $60 and just threw an army of people at it to get it done. Coordinating all those employees across several smaller studios resulted in a shaky, unfocused title headed up by a director that that wasn't really ready for it. I mean, it took seasoned veteran Shinji Mikami a good five years to perfect RE4, reiterating it again and again, burning through various versions 
until he got what he wanted. Sasaki, though, wasn't afforded that same luxury. Capcom was attempting way too much in too little time and resulted in this giant, expensive homunculus that didn't really know what it wanted to be. It failed to please some longtime fans and also didn't really rake in any new ones. That's why it still lags behind RE5 in lifetime sales as of 2019. For reference, it took RE6 seven years to sell what Capcom wanted it to sell in two months. We have obviously seen the consumer and critical response. There were some great positives out of RE6, but it was a mixed bag, as we saw from the review scores. We probably put too much content in there. There were some comments from consumers that said it felt bloated. The Leon missions went down very well, and because we did Resident Evil Revelations, there was an outcry for us to focus on survival horror rather than be too many things to all people. You'll find where we go next will likely be more targeted at our core fan base, said former senior vice president of marketing, Michael Pattison. His statement at the end there also turned out to be extremely true, as both the RE2 remake and RE7 returned to a more focused, horror-based experience, along with, of course, more realistic budgets and projections. Capcom has since stated that both titles have exceeded expectations and hope to build on that further with the Resident Evil 3 Nemesis remake, which releases in just a few weeks. I honestly can't wait. But when you think about it, in a weird way, this new Resident Evil renaissance we now find ourselves in might have only been possible because of RE6's muted response and sluggish sales numbers. Its quote-unquote failure showed to Capcom it wasn't exactly the best path for the series to take. We are now probably better off for it. In the continuing evolution of this legendary franchise, you could say that RE6 was a necessary evil. And with that bad pun staining your mind, if you know of any other inadvisable idiocy you'd like to avoid, let me know in the comments below or drag your rotting corpse over to the Flophouse VIP Patreon to nominate your chosen game or movie to be our next subject. See you next time and thanks for watching. Hello and welcome to another face-busting, tag-teaming, money-losing episode of What Happened. The show that asks you, will you cross the line? into finding out just what went down, up, and wrong all over with Capcom's infamous Street Fighter Cross Tekken. Now, this is an episode that's been years in the making, so make sure you've properly stretched and have all your gems set and ready to go. Okay, 20%. Attack. Oh, wait, no, uh, t uh, times five. Uh, no. Because this story is about to get downright fierce. So like many of our previous jaunts through Capcom's Hall of Shame, there's not exactly a whole lot of inside information from the front lines. It's a secretive company that more often than not is rarely plagued by problems during actual development. Very few of their in-house games run into engine trouble or some other type of technical issue. What does happen, however, is a breakdown between the developmental and marketing teams, along with the bosses at the top. It's why we have misfires like DMC, Dead Rising 4, Bionic Commando, and all the rest. Fortunately, I was lucky enough to speak to a former staff member at Capcom USA who was right in the trenches during Cross Tekken's launch, narrowly dodging fireballs, timeout victories, and disastrous marketing gimmicks. We'll be checking in with them often. It all starts, of course, with Street Fighter IV. Now, it was a huge risk making this game, which took Yoshinori Ono months, if not years, to get greenlit from those aforementioned bosses at the top. <coughs> Fighting games, despite some gems. Oh, God, I gotta watch it with all the gem references, was certainly a genre that was in a sort of dormant phase, worlds away from the sonic boom period of the 90s. So the fact that Street Fighter 4 was such a huge success in both the arcades and especially the home consoles was a big win for Capcom and just about everybody else. It absolutely pushed other publishers to start developing their own fighters once again, but no one was quicker to capitalize than Capcom themselves. 
The company, now happy or, or confident or, or maybe overconfident, decided to start greenlighting a bunch of other button bashers, which kind of made sense. Throughout the 90s and even the early 2000s, they had about 34 different fighting franchises all going on at the same time. Since the 90s, however, many other genres experienced their own boom periods, so there was more competition than ever before. Capcom wasted no time and began dropping hints about a new fighting game in early 2010, with many people expecting a new Darkstalkers. Ah, oh, no. I just reminded myself, uh... But what no one expected was at that year's San Diego Comic-Con, where Katsuhiro Harada, patriarch of the Tekken clan, crashed a panel held by Ono, and suddenly announced Street Fighter Cross Tekken. People were caught off guard in, in the best possible way. While initially seen as a bit of an odd pairing, it was nevertheless pretty damn hype to see two universes, uh, cross over. Now, this was clearly a deal whose inception started in Japan, so when Capcom USA was let in on the secret, they were of course blown away, but uh, there were uh, some concerns. While it wasn't the exact crossover most of us would have imagined coming about, it was still seen as a fresh and exciting concept, especially considering there was going to be the Tekken version. <laughs> How Tekken characters would play in a Street Fighter game was definitely a question, but we were riding high off the reviving of the fighting game genre just two years earlier. That said, there were some reservations that came about, which in hindsight were the cracks that would soon form. The main one was the insane initial sales forecast, which basically added together the user bases for Street Fighter and Tekken at the time, not considering that A, there may be some overlap, and B, there are a bunch of O-Niners who weren't going to switch over from Street Fighter 4. So yes, maybe with egos slightly inflated and expectations a tad too high, Cross Tekken was pegged to be a big seller by Capcom, but why wouldn't it be? Their flagship fighter was doing well, Tekken had just launched their first game on then current consoles, so this was going to be a slam dunk, a dragon punch, or an electric win god fist. Right? Well, very quickly, money started to get spent, and not all of it smartly. Capcom contracted out another company to animate shitloads of CGI videos, maybe more than they needed. Instead of simply relying on their in-game musicians, they splurged on licensed music that also maybe wasn't needed. When the sun goes down, the stars come out like It's 470,000, sir. Yeah? Finally, Namco obviously would need to see some money back in exchange for the usage of their characters, so Capcom's fat stacks were quickly getting less fat. So, because of all these factors, right off the bat, this left Cross Tekken in a sort of pit that was ever so slightly getting deeper and deeper, but it had to crawl out of to reach profitability. The former staff member I spoke to explains. The budget versus forecast was done in a way that was the opposite of how it should go. Every time the budget would increase, which would be quite a bit due to common game design bloat and things like the Polygon Pictures trailers, the forecast would need to increase to match it, without anything being added that would get us to that forecast, so we found ourselves on the marketing side having to sell more copies of the game without additional tools in which to do so, which as you can imagine was difficult. Maybe knowing this would become an issue, Capcom decided they would need to take steps to combat the problem head on, and to do so they would need to increase their attack by 30% without sacrificing their speed. Gems were instituted as a way to offset all these costs. It was something that was interwoven into the game's design from a very early point, even before Capcom USA was told of the crossover's existence. Just as a reminder for those that are fortunate enough to not know or have forgotten, if you bought the special edition of the game, you got an additional like 45 gems, which is almost the amount that came with the base package. And as a follow-up to that one-two combo, each brick and mortar store also had their own exclusive packs of gems, with almost all of them being better than those shit level one versions for loser idiots. I mean, like even even PlayStation Home was offering its own gem pack. Wait, what, what was what was PlayStation Home again? I, I legit forget. 
Oh my god, PlayStation Ho! Out of all the egregious DLC practices Capcom was dipping their dick into during these trying years, the gem system was often seen as the most ill-conceived and transparently greedy of them all. And in a damned if you do, damned if you don't type moment, players could go gemless if they wished, which was good, because selecting them brought the pace of tournaments to a grinding halt and were eventually banned from most majors. Because of this though, gem DLC sales were exceedingly low because they simply boiled down to pay to win mechanics, which many people tend to hate a whole bunch. So they didn't quite become the cost offsetting mechanic they were designed to be, which wasn't great for Cross Tekken's long term goals because initially, gems were meant to go on for years and years and years. One of the concepts was that the gem system would become so robust that you would ostensibly have an infinite amount of fighter variations. There were ideas for very powerful gems down the line that would basically turn one character into a completely different one. They were thinking that each average player would spend $12 on gems in total, which was aggressive at the best of times, so I think it goes without saying they did not hit those numbers, and because of that, there was gem DLC for only a few months until it was quietly cancelled. Even before launch, the initial reaction to gems wasn't exactly a fan favorite, but it was only the first in a long list of things that fans were very much not favoriting. Street Fighter 4 on the Xbox 360 and PS3 were essentially the same game, but things suddenly changed when Capcom revealed in January of 2012 that the PlayStation 3 version would receive 5 exclusive characters, all of which would be immediately banned in all tournaments. This motley crew of combatants included two cats who were PlayStation mascots in Japan, the dude from Infamous, I don't remember his name, and finally two men of the pack and mega varieties. Now, while the first three make sense from a mascot perspective, why was a Capcom and Namco icon Sony exclusives? Well, I'm sure it was befuddling to some back then and even today, but it was, like a lot of things in Cross Tekken, another way to mitigate costs. Capcom typically approaches both Sony and Microsoft early on in development with a build, a plan, and a hope that they'll get a co-marketing deal. For Street Fighter Cross Tekken, Sony was willing to offer a ton of money for co-marketing, as again, this was hot off the heels of Street Fighter 4. As with all deals like this, there were some concessions, and this one was probably bigger than most. Because they were mostly joke characters, and because it was forecast that the PS3 would have outsold the Xbox 360 version anyway, it seemed like it would have had minimal competitive impact in the end. What didn't have minimal impact was that last character in the list, Mega Man, or Bad Box Art Mega Man specifically, which was its own whole huge embarrassing separate thing. Now, this is one of those issues that was kind of no one's fault, but somehow simultaneously still everyone's fault. Bad box art Mega Man, or I think he was just called Mega Man, he was a victim of timing. When the game was being developed and when he was being added to it, Mega Man was not in a bad place. Mega Man Universe had been announced, there was Mega Man Legends 3, and a third project was also in development. It was really looking like a time to celebrate Mega Man, so the team wanted to have some fun with it. And then the sequence of events happened where all three titles were cancelled, so it turned out to be the year of the death of Mega Man. Then, they announced him for Cross Tekken, with him looking like bad box art Mega Man, and without that context about when and why he was developed, it really looked like another slap in the face to Mega Man players, so again, he was a victim of timing. In fact, PR in general for Cross Tekken always seemed to run into some type of embarrassing snafu, with certain ventures, while maybe not hurting the actual game, certainly didn't help lift the already pungent miasma that had lingered since the big gem reveal. Okay, so... With that, we are now reaching the third strike of Cross Tekken, and as I'm sure all of you are aware... You know what they say. It's time to talk about OD DLC. <laughs> Xbox 
Xbox 360 versions were leaked and split wide open and out toppled 12 DLC characters all on the disc, all essentially finished. As to why they were finished and not included in the base package, well, they were being held back as they were initially going to be timed exclusives for the Vita port. <laughs> Remember the Vita port? Well, it was scheduled to come out six months after the home console launch, apparently another part of the co-marketing deal with Sony. Now you can say a lot about cross decking, and people have, but this was such a catastrophic PR nightmare for Capcom that it changed how they did downloadable content from then on out, especially for fighting games. With all the other very not good press surrounding it, Capcom moved up the launch of the DLC roster to July as console warriors were furious they would have to wait six months to play with characters that were already on the disc that they had paid for due to a Vita version they didn't even want. Hackers would even go online with these characters, further adding insult to injury, and I can't imagine Sony was happy about all this either. This whole disaster wasn't something that took Capcom, and especially Capcom USA, by surprise, as they correctly predicted this would happen, but wouldn't you know it, their fears were waved off. Street Fighter Cross Tekken became the poster child for on-disc DLC. There was a meeting between the production team in Japan and the marketing team in the US. We had stated, people are going to find the on-disc DLC because 100% of all Xbox 360 games are cracked before launch. And the response to that was, why would anyone crack the game? That's illegal! There was a long pause, a very long pause. And then the director of marketing replied back to that with a very blunt, please remove the on-disc DLC. And the response to that was, well, if we do that, we're going to have to push the game out to April or May, and we'll have to tell Mr. Sujimoto that it was marketing's decision to push it to the next fiscal year. It very well could have been true that the work needed to remove the content would have pushed them back, but basically, they were saying, we need to have this released by the fiscal year, and if not, well, that's going to screw over the company, and it's going to be your fault. So that was pretty much a direct threat. We just had to lose that battle. And lose they did! Capcom's projections for Cross Tekken were 2 million units within the launch period, but by mid-May, they'd barely moved 1.4, considerably slower than the last couple of fighting games released by either Capcom or Namco. And I'm getting a bit ahead of myself here, but I haven't even gotten to the actual game part of all this yet, because many fans, especially within the FGC, weren't keen on how the moment-to-moment -moment fighting played out. Because of the way the tag system worked, a higher-than-normal percentage of matches would be decided by time out. Then there was Pandora, a heavily advertised comeback mechanic that no one wanted to come back to. And don't forget the incredibly distracting, sometimes unclear UI that just... Ah. For a more in-depth breakdown of all the issues players had, I suggest Stumblebee's video on the subject, as it looks more at the minutia of all the fighting mechanics that didn't quite work at launch. So, all these factors, coupled with Capcom's DLC dollar sign dreams being shattered, firmly planted Cross Tekken in that slippery pit with no real way to escape. You can't escape! What also certainly contributed to its financial failure was the competition, which was an assault that came from pretty much every angle, and somewhat ironically, came mostly from Capcom itself. Remember, the very same year Cross Tekken was announced in 2010, Capcom also revealed Marvel 3, and also launched Ultimate All-Stars, and also launched Street Fighter 4 Arcade Edition in 2011. That's four different fighting games trying to coexist all at the same time by the same company, and it simply wasn't viable. With that said, Capcom didn't give up entirely. Yeah, they cancelled the thousands of gems they had planned and had to blow their character DLC load early, but they realized the game still had a lot of fundamental problems that they were committed to fixing. This brings us to Cross Tekken 2013 Edition, a way to let players know it was receiving an overhaul without having to spend money on new assets or features, because the last thing they wanted to do was spend more money that they weren't making. 
This patch addressed almost all complaints players had. Characters were rebalanced, the UI was fixed and made more clear, the tag system and gray life adjusted. For all intents and purposes, this was the game that should have been available at launch, and smartly, Capcom made this a free update. But once that update was issued, that's all she wrote for Cross Tekken. The four new Street Fighter characters that it introduced, Rolento, Hugo, Poison, and Elena, were then added to Ultra Street Fighter 4 so some smart asset reuse there. In the subsequent years, fans have since rallied around the game, especially on PC, what with its impressive modding scene, growing it to an obviously small but passionate fan base. I came here. Oh, man! This was only made possible with the positive changes seen in the 2013 update, and in terms of the core fighting game, people's views on Cross Tekken have softened because of it. Now, as for Tekken Cross Street Fighter, the Tekken-focused 3D sequel that was never officially announced and never officially cancelled, well, after the Tekken team finished Tekken 6, and then Tekken Tag Tournament 2, then Tekken 7 Arcade, then Tekken 3DS, then Tekken 7 Faded Retribution, then Tekken 7 the console version, they haven't really made any strong indication that they'll ever return to the concept. If Capcom's attempt had been a rousing success, you most likely would have seen Harada's take by now. It's odd how since this whole misfire, Capcom's fighting efforts have struggled in some form or another. I hope my horrible ugliness won't be a distraction to you. <laughs> While Tekken 7 has emerged as one of the most popular fighters of the last few years, selling 5 million copies and still going strong. It's fairly easy to see a pattern here. Capcom tried to push out multiple fighting games, often in the same year, and often cannibalizing its own sales, while Tekken focused on one release at a time, riding out their success until they were ready to announce another. The former Capcom employee sums it up best in regards to the whole unfortunate situation. After all the gems and all the on-disc DLC, it made us say, what is going on with this game? And that sort of brought up the in-joke that it must have been greenlit over an ancient Native American burial ground because it was just cursed. And that was the other name we had for the game, which was Street Fighter Curse Tekken because nothing went right with it. So make no mistake, the intentions here were good. Deliver a fighting game that many weren't expecting that featured lots of over-the-top mechanics, but due to poor planning and poor budgeting and just plain old bad luck, Cross Tekken was the partner that got sacrificed for other fighting franchises to thrive. And with that, if you know of any other pugilistic punch-em-ups that had problematic perils, let me know in the comments below or cross the line over to the Flophouse VIP Patreon to nominate the subject of our next episode. See you next time, and thanks for watching. Fight! Well, World Warriors, it's now that time. Strap on your headbands, your eye patches, and your banana hair, because it's time to talk about how the most popular fighting game series in the world became not the most popular fighting game series in the world. And it all boils down to the divisive 22nd entry in the 30-year-old franchise, Street Fighter V. Okay, so... Oh god, what... Where do I start? Okay, so listen, real talk. It's pretty well known that SF5 had numerous issues both pre-launch, launch, and for a good number of years, post-launch, most of it being covered in a million other videos. Eight frames of lag, lack of content, less than optimal online play, unbalanced characters, kinda stale gameplay, esports shenanigans, etc., etc. Etc. And while I'll mention those when applicable, it's not going to be the focus here. Just why did Street Fighter V, you know, kind of not do as well when compared to Street Fighter IV and uh, many other recent fighting games? What were the core issues that caused everything to sort of just fall apart from a business and developmental standpoint? Well, let's whip out our crystal balls to see if we can make it a bit more clear as to what the hell happened. 
It's 2014, and Ultra Street Fighter 4, the fourth version of Street Fighter 4, had just released that June, which was probably to help boost Capcom's bottom line when, uh, you know who failed to sell their sales targets. Then, barely six months later, Capcom announces the next numbered follow up at Sony's PlayStation Experience. After a leak, of course. <laughs> That's so Capcom. Okay, anyway, right here, yeah, yeah, this exact moment is where things started to go wrong, at, at least in terms of public perception. It's only been half a year since the last version, and Ultra wasn't some minor upgrade or anything. It had drastic gameplay changes and several characters who had been locked in the cross Tekken jail. This already shows a massive difference in how other publishers were handling their fighting games at the time, i.e. a little bit more cautiously. As outlined in in a previous episode, Namco would release a new Tekken entry, and then several years later, announce a brand new one, building up anticipation for something fresh. Netherrealm would release a new Mortal Kombat, followed by a new Injustice, with each passing off the baton to the other every two years. But Capcom... <sighs> Bring out the chart! As you can see here, at any given time, at least two major Capcom fighters were competing with each other in the same year, not to mention all their various online-enabled HD re-releases. It's safe to say that while looking at this chart, that they may have stretched their fighting game fans a bit too thin. Now, when Street Fighter V was announced, many people were excited, which is great, but there was also a good chunk of fans that felt this announcement was maybe ill-timed, Droves of people were still playing 4, especially with the changes Ultra implemented. And then there were those that scoffed and said, yeah, I'll just wait for the good version, that'll be released later. Which was a behavior that Capcom themselves fostered. What with, you know, all these. Oh, wait, wait, I forgot one. Yep, nope, that's five now. And we're just talking about the initial reaction to the announcement. To understand how this all came about, we're going to need to back it up a bit. Street Fighter V was actually being developed far longer than most may realize, with the intent to release it nice and early on then next-gen machines. A producer on Five, one Koichi Sugiyama, was interviewed in the Japanese Street Fighter V art book, and in a roundabout way, revealed that the game game was floundering early on. Street Fighter V was something we've been working on since 2011. All the way up to SF3, the series had been rendered in pixel sprites, but for SF4, the graphics were all done with 3D models, so we had to go through many phases of trial and error in order to nail the same sort of visual impact that the series is known for. For SF5, we were working with Unreal Engine 4, which is known for being particularly good at rendering photorealistic visuals. So so once again, we did a lot of experiments. We actually put together a build of SF5 that was rendered in photorealistic graphics, but when we did, we realized that it just wouldn't be Street Fighter without the bold anime-esque look and feel to the game, so we decided to shelve the whole photorealism idea altogether. I spoke to a source close to Capcom that said this experimental period lasted for a good two years. That's 24 months and however much money spent on a pitch that was ultimately scrapped. What's more, they were doing some weird shit during those 24 months. Hobo, or Hot Ryu, was actually going to be his default look, with the story being that the Eternal Fighter had been training up in the mountains for quite some time, just returning to society as the fifth game kicks off. Bison was also given a radical redesign, making him almost 100% biomechanical. But like Sugiyama said, the build was shelved. Development started over from scratch in 2013 and just defaulted back to 4's anime look, but with a light oil painting aesthetic. Oh, one minor thing though, the game also switched developers. The photorealistic build, which was more of a visual test rather than gameplay, was being handled by Polygon Pictures, who Capcom, Ono specifically, had worked with before on various projects. And with that build being thrown out, Five was then just shuffled back over to Dimps, who had been busy trying to fix Cross Tekken in 2013 and were also developing Ultra Street Fighter 4. This left them very little time to play catch up, trying to nail a new visual style as well as you know, do everything else. Here's a dramatic reenactment. <laughs> 
Now, with two years essentially wasted, the clock was ticking to get the game out in a timely manner to take advantage of next-gen consoles, which were already well underway by 2014. This would ensure SF5 would coast through the generation with various updates and content, as it was skewing towards more of a live service model rather than just huge updates that would be packaged as new versions with separate SKUs. Something that I again outlined in the Cross Tekken episode was that Capcom was always looking for co-marketing deals that would help save costs. And who better than the company that demanded Cat Mascots, Johnny Infamous, and BBAMM in their PlayStation branded fighting games. Sony was more than willing to play ball, and in exchange for exclusive console rights to Street Fighter V, they'd market the ever-loving shit out of it, hence the PlayStation experience reveal. Now, in terms of budget, it was reportedly robust overall, but remember, a portion of that budget had already been flushed down the proverbial birdie stage toilet. You can't blame Capcom here. Well, I, I mean, Xbox fans sure did, but if you're being handed a big check and your project's getting kinda shaky, you'd take the money too. As you'd expect, former Capcom employee Matt Dahlgren had a far more lip service-y take on this momentous deal. The reason we partnered up with Sony is we share the same vision for the growth potential in the fighting game space. I'd say that the key aspect they're working with us on is executing cross-platform play. This is going to be the first time we've ever united our community into a centralized player base. Sony, the champion of cross-platform play. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, moving on to the actual development, well, Dim Scott handed a raw deal. They had been exclusively using Capcom's MT framework for their last couple of titles, and were then handed Unreal 4 with zero experience working with it and just told to make it work. It's about here where you start to see where all the problems the game had at launch originally spawned from, but fortunately, things only got worse from there. Five's online beta launched in July of 2015, and Capcom was able to utilize all the data players were sending them. And all that data said loud and clear, this shit doesn't work. Now, the point of these types of betas is to identify problems going forward, but you could probably count the amount of matches that actually took place during this beta on a single hand. It was so unstable and frustrating for players that Capcom just shut it down early and rescheduled it for later that summer. This didn't exactly inspire confidence considering a huge chunk of a fighting game's worth is determined by a solid online experience, so there were obvious concerns coming from those that wanted to test their mettle against worldwide competition. And the notion that Street Fighter V's netcode was not up to that task has unfortunately been something that's stuck around ever since. Conversely, on the other side, those that were looking to enjoy a lot of solo content, well, I sure hope you liked unlocking colors. With their accelerated time frame to finish the game, as well as feverishly rewriting netcode, it's not surprising Dimps wasn't able to offer a lot of content for customers to chew through at launch. Making the core fighting work and be fun is the most important thing, but charging people full price for a game with little to actually do is not really ideal. The source I spoke to explains why the game came out the way it did. I think the Capcom Pro Tour and the fiscal year cutoff, March 31st, 2016, were the main factors there, with the understanding that SF5 would always be an evolving product with a lot of free updates coming down the line, meaning that theoretically, any initial backlash would have been mitigated. Eerie coincidence with Cross Tekken there. That game's whole on-disc DLC fiasco only occurred because Capcom wasn't willing to miss the end of their fiscal year cutoff, something most companies companies wouldn't risk, so the lack of content for 5 could be chalked up to, eh, eh, we'll have to do it later. Unfortunately, these two core problems, a dearth of modes, arcade chief among them, and spotty online play kind of ensured that neither camp was really happy with the end product. So it won't shock anyone to know that with this really rough early reception, that Capcom needed time to regroup and figure out how best to move forward, which of course meant that weeks ticked by with few updates and sporadic communication. 
I think for a while after launch, they were particularly short-handed, so they just didn't have the foresight to know what their pipeline looked like or when they could provide updates to the community. This live content model was also a new venture for the team, so there were a lot of unknowns in that sense. During this time, something that was meant to be a big band-aid for the game was the promise of a cinematic story mode. This was a point of contention between Capcom USA and Capcom in Japan, with the US side insisting it needed to be included, with Japan being somewhat resistant. It took a lot of cajoling to sell them Capcom Japan on a proper story mode, which came via title update long after launch. Capcom USA identified that as something certain competitors did better than Street Fighter, and wanted to close that gap. I'm not sure what Capcom Japan's position was, but they seemed to take a lot of convincing, perhaps understandable when you consider how much development was required for something tertiary to the main content. In hindsight, it might have been a mistake, or at least a waste of time. As stated, the story mode wasn't at launch, instead arriving almost six months later. And while being free was good for people who had already purchased it, it didn't exactly entice new ones, and thus didn't increase Capcom's bottom line. It certainly would have helped if it had been on offer from the start of the first round. But the fact it came so late, and the fact that A Shadow Falls was kind of... Uh... Intruders? I understand. I'll get back there right now! Hey, wait! <laughs> made it forgettable in a lot of respects. Obviously, there were way more bumps afterwards, and the game took ages to see a steady stream of content, but it was with the advent of Season 3, which saw a host of improvements, including arcade ladders, heavily fan-requested characters, along with several new ones. SF5 finally hit its stride in terms of providing a full-fledged fighting game, something that many of its competitors were able to do right out the gate. The rushed initial development, and the transition of moving into more of a live service platform was clearly bungled from a variety of angles. Ten years ago, Capcom learned that Street Fighter IV's $40 overhauls, while something that may have worked in the 90s, were somewhat unreasonable in the late 2000s. But their embracing of more modern content delivery clearly needed some work as well. Street Fighter V has indeed improved in many areas, but it took essentially four years for it to get there. There's now a massive roster of characters, with one final season still coming, please add Sawada. Plenty of modes, costumes, rewards, and better online play that still might need some tweaking. Capcom's fighting game output in general has since slowed down, way down, releasing only Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite in the same time frame that, um, that, that, yeah. So they are learning, however slowly, that it's a genre you have to do right, at launch, to take your time, delay it past your fiscal year cutoff if you have to. It'll be okay, the fucking uh, Monster Hunter and there's gonna be four new biohazards, they, they can carry you, don't worry. It's weird them giving this really obvious basic advice to a company who essentially birthed the fighting game, but sometimes you get a little rusty in between matches and you need to take a few hits. Hits. Maybe get knocked down before you rise back with a wake up dragon punch that finally finds its target. You win! Thanks to Big Boss C24U for the nomination, and if you want to put forward a game or movie of your choosing, then flash chop your way into the Flophouse VIP Patreon to force me to spinning pile drive it on our next episode. See you next time, and thanks for watching! We await your return, warrior. I've covered wars, you know. Well, that's great, Frank, because we'll be covering another war on this week's episode of What Happened, a war of dueling ideologies of dwindling resources, and a war of sadly big dumb mistakes. This was the war between Capcom Vancouver, formerly Blue Castle Games, and Capcom Japan, formerly of... Capcom Japan! Hot off the heels of the Xbox 360's launch, the blue and yellow logo showed up in the right place at the right time on the right games, putting out both Lost Planet and Dead Rising for the first high-definition console on the market, uh, warts and all. 
While both were made in-house at Capcom, Vancouver's Blue Castle games were contracted to follow up with a sequel to Dead Rising, after having impressed Inafune with their engine tech. Shortly thereafter, 2010 brought us Dead Rising the Second, and then Case West, and then Case Zero, and then Off the Record, and by then they were probably getting a little tired of Dead Rising. That being said, their work on the series was a big success, and Capcom even bought the company outright, rechristening them to Capcom Vancouver, which is certainly a distinction after all the other failed this stuff. Wanting to transition to making other projects, the heads of the studio assigned smaller teams to begin making prototypes for potential IPs to pitch to Capcom. One of these games was codenamed Brazil, an action horror game that shared more than a passing similarity to Dead Space. After close to two years of work, disagreements arose between the production staff and the Capcom higher-ups, which eventually saw them shutting the whole thing down, and the team were then shuffled onto Dead Rising 3, which was then entering production. Now, unlike the Dead Rising 3 we know today, this early version began life with the intention of it being a 360 and PS3 title as a sort of send-off to both machines. This is what happened though, and complications quickly arose with this particular title, complications that would set off a chain reaction of decisions, communication, and miscommunication that would have dire consequences down the line. Vancouver had some big ideas for DR3, but their technology was lagging behind them, as their game was supposed to be pushing a seamless, no-loading open world and a large variety of zombie-shredding combo vehicles. Now, while both consoles were struggling to do these features justice, the PS3 was being particularly nasty about it, and performance was stated to be so unstable that the entire project had a good chance of getting a bullet into the brain. Fortunately, or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, Microsoft began investing in third-party exclusives for the all-in-one entertainment system, the Xbox One, which saw such classics as Rise, Son of Rome, Fighter Within, and other used game bin fodder. Anyway, since the PS3 version was being the primary source of the project's woes, Capcom took the deal. Microsoft funneled more money into the project than an extra year in development was given so it would be an exclusive launch title for the one. Around the same time, Vancouver again tried pitching a brand new IP to Capcom, no doubt wanting to diversify their portfolio a little bit because it was starting to really smell like a zombie. New Frontier was a wildly ambitious, space-faring action RPG that focused on high-speed vehicles, planetary discovery, and melee combat. Six months was spent making a vertical slice, which was then presented to Capcom. Unfortunately, the project was deemed too ambitious and expensive to produce, and since they were unwilling to invest in it, the pitch was rejected. By the way, get used to the words, the pitch was rejected. That can't be good. It's also around the same time that Capcom Vancouver's original president and founder, Rob Barrett, decided to step down from the company for unspecified reasons. Blue Castle had only started producing games around 2007, so Barrett's sudden departure was a bit odd and very, very foreshadowing. In his wake, the producers who had brought Dead Rising 3 to market had been elevated up the company ranks in the interim, which is certainly the best option they had at the time, but it also marks another important point in this story. From here on out, the studio was lacking solid leadership. Now, with DR3 in the rear view, the team needed to push forward with a new game, and in the exclusivity deal with Microsoft, the computing giant was also given a first refusal of whatever came next for the zombie franchise, meaning if Capcom was to make a sequel, Microsoft would get offered it first. However, in a post The Last of Us world, the Xbox would need its own exclusive zombie survival franchise to compete, and hey, would you look at that, we kind already have one. 
with Microsoft producers now on the ground floor and with both them and Vancouver enthusiastically embracing change, Dead Rising 4, or known by its codename Climber, was set to turn the series on its decomposing head. After three, technically four games back to back, all being very similar in design and tone, Vancouver was thankful to finally work on something fresh. Now, the only people not aware of this sudden change in direction was Capcom Japan, who didn't really oversee Vancouver's work on a day-to-day -day basis, only touching base every few months. And since they only seemed interested in having the studio pump out more Dead Rising, coupled with one of these long periods of silence between the two, led to Microsoft and the new head of the Climber project, Josh Bridge, to start getting very, very chummy with the each other. Climber's narrative was going to be unconnected to the previous entries and be far more grounded overall. It was also going to place a greater focus on true open world design and not be under the roof of a mall or casino or water park or whatever. You'd be stealth killing zombies rather than mowing down hordes of them, and while you could still craft and create combo weapons, you couldn't make a spike encrusted super soaker that shot electrified fire. Aside from just The Last of Us, Climber was going to take inspiration from other popular zombie media at the time. For example, The Walking Dead, which would have been on only its fourth season at this time. God, that feels like centuries ago. The team plugged away at an ambitious prototype for most of 2014, with Microsoft very much hands-on during its creation. Eventually, however, Capcom Japan wanted to check in, and confident in what they had created, Vancouver presented them the playable prototype, which was met with mouths agape. And, and not the good type of gaping mouths, no, the, uh, the, the, the bad one. Yeah, so? Capcom Japan expected a Dead Rising 4 to be pretty much like all the other Dead Risings, and since they were not consulted on this new direction, they hated it and asked for the brakes to be slammed down on. They then ordered Vancouver to start over again from scratch. Uh, I guess the thought process here for Josh Bridge and the rest of the team was that it was better to ask for forgiveness than permission, because if they had asked for permission to sort of soft reboot the franchise, it would have been rejected like so many times before. All three companies then begrudgingly agreed to just make a far safer sequel, so Josh Bridge decided to pitch the safest idea he could think of, bringing back Frank West, placing it in Willamette, and instituting combo mech suits as the game's big new feature. This of course pleased Capcom Japan, who was given the green light to move forward, and that's when the disaster really took off. Now, why did this disaster take off? I don't know. Well, the main reason was, despite Vancouver having to start over from square one, Capcom refused to allocate additional funding or time, and Microsoft wasn't really in a position to offer that either. Vancouver had to then use the remaining budget and working days they had spent on Climber, six months worth on essentially a brand new game. This left them roughly a year and a half of real production time as very little work on Climber could be reused. Come October of 2014, Capcom decided to take a uh, slightly more aggressive action, firing several major producers of the little misbehaving Canadian studio, including Josh Bridge, essentially punishment for making Climber without their knowledge. Well, shit. This was a massive blow to the company and put the rest of the staff on high notice, with many fearing that with such major firings, the company's days were numbered. Complicating matters is that those same firings were the leads on Frank West's big return, leaving the game without any focus for months. Now, due to all these factors, much of the staff saw the bloody writing on the wall and decided to leave the company before its inevitable closure, with roughly 40% of the original staff cleaning out their desks. Vancouver's remaining troops, assuming that DR4 was going to be cancelled, tried pitching other safe projects, including, but not limited to, a small prototype for Resident Evil X, a action-flavored spin-off on Capcom's Crown Jewel. 
This pitch was, again, rejected by Capcom Japan as the lukewarm reception of RE6 fanned away the distinct Michael Bay-esque smell that the series was starting to emanate. And uh, here's the devastating one. Capcom Vancouver also pitched a new entry in the long abandoned IP, Dino Crisis, for then next gen machines. This didn't even get into the prototyping phase as Capcom Japan, yep, you guessed it, rejected it outright because this story wasn't sad enough, I guess. But it doesn't stop there. Capcom reportedly also had no interest in reviving either Onimusha with a brand new game or a side-scrolling action title set in the Mega Man universe. No surprises there. No one knows what it's like to be hated. With none of these projects getting picked up, the remaining staff was resigned to just try and focus on Dead Rising 4, with designer Joe Nichols reportedly stepping up to lead the project. Even with that though, things were very tough going, as the studio was still bleeding talent out of every oozing orifice every single month DR4 dragged on. One of those talents was Annie Reed, longtime writer of the series, who left near the start of 2015, with all her work up to that point being rewritten by others, which explains the problems that fans had with Frank and uh, pretty much every other character. And you believe that? How fucking naive are you? Oh, that's nice. Tank bus! Holy shit, Frank. This is some atrocity level shit going on here and the best you can do is crack wise? That is unfair. I have photographed things and thought about things. What in the world? From this point on, with the budget and time rapidly draining away, many features from previous entries had to be cut or, if they were extremely lucky, greatly simplified. One of these features was Psychopaths. The studio was struggling with how to implement them because as of 2015, cartoonish parodies of mental illness were seen as a tricky subject to tackle. Ultimately though, it was really the lack of time that killed their inclusion, as designing several compelling boss fights would eat up precious time and resources. As a compromise, maniacs were shoved into the game at the 11th hour. Mini boss encounters that were greatly scaled back in presentation and AI compared to the psychopaths of old. Frank West's photography skills increased, however, as a direct emulation of popular assorted detective visions from Batman and a bunch of others. Vancouver wanted to do even more with this feature, designing an almost Metroid Prime-like search view that would activate certain paths and objects, but with time very much not on their side, it was cut. But wait, there's more! Things that didn't exist. At one point, there were side stories which focused around serial killers, with Frank having discovered clues at various crime scenes with the help of his camera. Any guesses on what happened to this feature? Any guesses at all? Cut, man! Another big, and some would say biggest, missing feature indicative of Dead Rising was the timer, which was a source of tension throughout the games. While the decision to cut it was partially due to Vancouver, Microsoft, and Capcom all not wanting to restrict players anymore from experiencing all of the game, the main reason it was cut from the game is that it simply didn't offer enough game. All the things we've discussed thus far that were cut, well, that fed into the staff's inability to craft multiple endings. There just wasn't enough stuff to really do in DR4 to warrant it, and no time to do it in. That's actually pretty meta when you think about it, because Vancouver themselves had their own big scary timer always counting down. All of these massive problems resulted in Microsoft taking a good hard look and petitioning for the game to be granted a few extra months. Unfortunately, this time could only be used to reiterate and polish what was in the game rather than add more content into it. The Dead Rising 4 team knew the game would not be embraced by fans due to all the missing um, everything, but not really being in a position to argue kept plugging away with the few precious months they had left. 
Okay, now this part. This this is the part where it actually gets insane. During all of this, the development of DR4, in fact, most of 2015, a small team broke away and began prototyping a Dead Rising 5. Now, I know what some of you are going to say. One, why? And two... Why the fuck? As we explained in the Sonic Boom episode, if a big studio doesn't have a secondary project lined up and ready to enter full production by the time their current project is done, then more firings are expected. You need to constantly be grabbing hold of the next branch just as you're letting go of the last one, and since Capcom Japan clearly had no interest in greenlighting anything else from the studio that wasn't a carbon copy of The Last Dead Rising, the safest bet was more dead rising. At this point, Vancouver's main goal was to just keep everyone working, but we are not done yet with good old Frank West. Because, unfortunately, Capcom Vancouver made their own decisions that did no favors amongst fans. Oh, shit! 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 <laughs> Perhaps even more so than missing side quests, boss fights, or a timer, recasting the voice actor for Frank West, TJ Rotolo, in favor of a slightly older sounding voice actor was uh, another big misfire for the game. The official company line on the matter was given by Dead Rising product and license manager Trent Lee Ames. We wanted to work with someone to provide a more grizzled, older take on Frank at this stage. Dead Rising 4 takes place 16 years after the events of the first game. As such, we decided to cast a new actor for the role that reflected his age while still retaining the charm and humor that made him such a hit with fans. We think Frank's new voice actor has done a phenomenal job and we can't wait to share more of him with you in the future. It's no disrespect to history or previous actors, TJ has done a bang up job. It was a chance with a new new game to progress the franchise as best we can, with a different vision, just as we see new James Bonds over the years. Now, what is the real story on this, the uh, backstage ska? Well, it turns out Capcom Vancouver wanted to cast a new actor in the role of Frank West. Yes, no money disputes or creative differences here. Since the team so desperately wanted to try and break away from series trappings wherever they could, they simply made changes in areas that wouldn't ruffle feathers at Capcom Japan. Uh, this was a mistake. But but it uh, wasn't the last one they would make. DR4 stumbled onto the Xbox One that holiday season, and it was uh, not met with much enthusiasm, especially in the already crowded holiday marketplace. While series fans view it as some sort of affront to gaming, it still posted some respectable reviews, but in terms of a standalone mainline release, it is amongst the lowest rated of the entire franchise, just a few notches above the amazingly bad chop till you drop. Stop skeletons, please cover this game soon. Capcom Vancouver then attempted to address the many criticisms the game received through both free and paid DLC. This included harder difficulty modes and kooky Capcom costumes that had their own movesets, all things which didn't really make the game any better. The timer was brought back in Frank's big package DLC that, oh, I get it, a penis. And knowing it might be tough to recoup costs based on only one console's skew, DR4 made its way onto the PS Quadruple Ballin after one year of being an Xbox exclusive. Unfortunately, even with all these updates, it did little to salvage the dearth of content. The bugs, the inconsistent performance, the hurried and kinda weird writing and characterization of Frank as well as countless other smaller things. Despite all that, Dead Rising 4 was able to amass sales of over a million copies, but unfortunately, due to the realities of then next-gen development, the money lost on the failed climber pitch, and the delay the game suffered, it didn't come close to achieving a healthy profit. The lost goodwill from fans, those lower reviews and sales, and with a whole host of its own unique problems, caused Capcom to then pull the plug on Dead Rising 5, which was a, a whole other thing. 
If you want more details on that, then I urge you to check out Liam Robertson's Fall of Capcom Vancouver video over at Did You Know Gaming, as he goes in-depth on DR5, as well as more rejected Capcom IP revivals. Yes, folks, there's somehow even more. Anyway, we're almost done. In 2017, Capcom of Japan finally greenlit a project from the studio and for the first time in its history wasn't Dead Rising. This of course was the massively disliked reboot of Puzzle Fighter, which was massively disliked due to, yeah, well, I mean, look at it. Capcom Japan a few months after Puzzle Fighter's release, but before Switchport could be completed, finally swung the axe that was floating above Vancouver's head and officially shut down the studio. The only public statement regarding this was, as a result of reviewing titles in development at Capcom Vancouver, Capcom has decided to cancel the development projects at this studio and will concentrate development of major titles in Japan. Ever since then, there's been nary a gurgle about Dead Rising returning, as Capcom has been focusing on their own internal Japanese teams, which is a good thing, of course, but it would have been nice if Capcom Vancouver could have been turned back into Blue Castle games and have continued to make their own IPs from then on out. Okay, I'm gonna be real, no one looks great here. The Vancouver studio should have kept Capcom in the loop. Microsoft maybe shouldn't have butted in. Capcom Japan should have had faith in the studio and maybe allowed the staff to stretch their wings like a little bit. This was a disaster that everyone helped to create. So after seven years and seven standalone Dead Rising releases, the studio behind Dead Rising was, uh, dead. It's over for us. Thanks again to Liam Robertson for his help with this video, and if you know of any other shambling husks of video games or movies that have been put through the ringer you'd like to see on the show, moan it out in the comments below, start grasping and clawing at my Twitter, or bite into the arteries of the Flophouse VIP Patreon and become a big zombie boss to nominate the subject we'll be targeting next. See you next time, and thanks for watching! <laughs>six days since we last talked about a Capcom game here on What Happened, but thanks to Big Boss Trey Adams at the Flophouse VIP Patreon, this week we are table hopping into the story of how Capcom almost killed one of its most influential franchises that originally spawned at one of their other most influential franchises. This is how Devil May Cry 2 nearly sealed the fate, yet at the same time went on to reignite the sword slashing series with Style. DMC, as some may know, originally started as an attempt to craft a new Resident Evil title, the RE4 in fact, but with the radical changes that Windex enthusiast and man who still has me blocked, Hideki Kamiya instituted, it was decided to spin the game off into its own thing. Capcom was, and still is, all about producing sequels for just about everything except for Spyborgs, and it was much the same here when it came to their newest star, the Demon Hunter Dante. See, they were very confident in DMC's chances at retail for a few reasons, with said reasons being it was directed by the person who helmed RE2. It was an exclusive for Sony's follow-up console, which was uh, pretty popular. And lastly, they knew that Dark Soul with light! would go on to be a cultural milestone moment that would define a generation. She's been the one to fill your dark soul with light! So, a team was put together to start working on a sequel, but unlike most video game publishers or uh, businesses in general, this was done before Dante had yet to bust out a single stinger. Yes, a follow-up was greenlit before the original had even been released, which was incredibly ballsy of Capcom, but given the eventual success of Dante's first adventure, they were right to do so. Because there wasn't any real reaction to the first game yet, no uh, feedback to draw upon, the team were given pretty much carte blanche to do whatever, which is one of the main problems that plagued Devil May Cry 2. Lack of any real direction and a team that was incredibly inexperienced. 
Now, what do I mean by that? Well, in Devil May Cry 3142 graphic arts, various staff that had worked on the series since its inception shone some light on the dark soul of the project. One of these staff members was legendary Capcom artist Ikeno, who detailed just why the team that was put together maybe wasn't the best choice. Capcom had traditionally been split into two main pillars, the arcade division and the console division, but with the PS2's increased processing power and a change in the nature of Capcom's arcade game market meant a company-wide shift of human resources from arcade to console. With the company's big hits at the time, like Resident Evil and DMC, many of the arcade fighting game teams were switched over to teams making games for the home consoles. These former arcade division employees were put in charge of the DMC sequel. This was a problem because with all their design experience coming from arcades, quick quarter munching experiences that could be completed in 30 minutes or less, it left the team with little knowledge on how to craft a beefier level based action game. For context, Capcom's late era arcade titles were things like Power stone and spawn in the demon's hand. projects that wouldn't have adequately prepared them for tackling the complexities of creating a sequel for a franchise that they had no hand in creating. What's worse is that pretty much every major staff member who contributed to DMC1 was absent on the sequel, with some not even being aware that DMC2 was a thing that was happening until months after the fact. Kamiya, Kobayashi, pretty much all the experienced hands within the console division never even touched this thing. In their stead, Capcom put fresh new hire Suyoshi Tanaka in a producing role, with directing duties being handled by… uh… question mark? This is one of the still remaining mysteries which clowns Devil May Cry 2, as the original director to this day has never been publicly named. Some have speculated it was Shinji Mikami or the Windex Master himself, even though none of that makes any sense for literally all the reasons. What we do know is that the initial team makeup was composed of people who had worked on Capcom's arcade fighters, but beyond that, the original director remains an enigma, trapped in a riddle, trapped in a red coat. Now, earlier, I mentioned this new team was given uh, maybe a bit too much freedom in their approach to a sequel, and Ikeno gave some insight into their thought process at the time, which was many of them didn't even understand or like aspects of Devil May Cry. At first, the protagonist wasn't even going to be Dante, but rather some guy with a green jacket. Looking back at the game's fundamentals, like the visuals and the overall design, we didn't take the parts of DMC1 that players wound up loving into account, so the second game felt very artificial. I think our attitude was a little too much, we're gonna make it how we want to. Dante's sudden change into a more taciturn or reserved character was the producer's decision, because he didn't like the joke ass- I was about to say joke assing wisecrack. Joke cracking wise ass Dante from the first game. The team agreed, and that was the direction we went in. Dante's sudden silence almost seemed to imply that something terrible had happened between the events of 1 and 2. Aside from just changes to characterization, the team struggled in another area level design. Since the original DMC was built off the skeleton of a Resident Evil game, multi-tiered level structure, backtracking, and puzzle items were prominently featured. This new team, having zero experience designing in that style, simply made large, mostly barren stages that had little functionality or detail, leading to a very empty game world by comparison. Things meandered on like this for about a year, with the game and team never really coalescing, and with only six months left in the proposed deadline. This is when Capcom higher-ups took a good, hard look at the project and realized it was probably going to get an F ranking in the style department. Therefore, they stepped in to try and course correct. Now, I know what you're thinking, oh man, this, this must be the part where things got really fucked. And in a nice twist, no, it's not. 
not. It is, in fact, where DMC2 got unfucked, or uh, less fucked, I should say. With everyone else at Capcom kinda busy, or maybe when asked if they wanted to take over directing duties and replying with, oh, 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 oh I'm fucking not! Hideaki Itsuno was then hired to reorganize the project, with the older mystery director being hoofed out in the process. Now it's true that Itsuno also came from an arcade background, having worked on both Rival Schools and Power Stone, among many others, but at the end of the day, still had a ton of experience leading on big projects. There was a lot of drama over my replacing of the old director, and I have nothing but bad memories about that part in particular, but basically they said that nothing was getting done and that needed to change. The scenario hadn't been written, the cutscenes had yet to be shot, and they hadn't decided what to do about Dante's Devil Trigger. They had determined that the Stinger attack was essential, so at least they had someone who was going to take care of that. But none of the other attacks had been worked on at all. Speaking of attacks and combat, it's another aspect of this sequel that the team felt needed to change, despite it being an integral part of the first game. See, when Capcom started receiving fan feedback and reaction from DMC1, some of it revolved around its difficulty, as there was really nothing exactly like it on the market. Dante's quest challenged you to stylishly kill enemies without ever getting touched, which was something not every player was accustomed to. So it was decided to lower the overall difficulty, and when I say lowered, I mean SPAM YOUR GUNS! Seriously, 75% of the game can be trivialized by whipping out ebony and ivory and to never stop shoot banging. This distinction is what caused some to call DMC2 the best third person shooter released in 2003. And unfortunately, this was something Itsuno either didn't or couldn't really change. The hardcore fans of DMC1 weren't exactly happy, but newcomers to the series liked it a lot. The people who especially liked it were the ones who had tried DMC1 but found it too difficult and quit partway through. I read a lot of survey responses along the lines of, DMC1 was awesome, but I just wasn't feeling it. I felt it in DMC2 though, so thanks! I need to meet these fans. Seriously, which part were you feeling there, bro? This? With half a year left, there were only so many things that could be addressed and finished, and considering the overall quality of DMC2, I, I'm not gonna lie, I would have loved to have played the original pre-Itsuno version just to prove to myself that I could. With that said, it's actually surprisingly not all bad, because under Itsuno, some novel features that started here went on to become DMC mainstays. This includes switching weapons mid-combat, evasive maneuvers like rolling, flipping, and wall running assigned to a button, and finally, the introduction of Bloody Palace mode, which is something that's now expected in all future DMCs. But as much as Itsuno's involvement helped, there were plenty of other lamentable decisions that still managed to slip through. A big back-of-the-box selling point was the addition of a second playable character, something so groundbreaking and bleeding-edge that it would need its own dedicated disc to become a reality. Lucia was a crimson-haired counterpart to Dante, who he would sometimes suddenly bump into during the course of the game. Putting the Lucia disc into your PS2 would then allow you to play the game as Lucia and... Uh, that's it. Minor differences aside, both discs contain almost identical data, so it's been rumored that this was simply a marketing tactic to make players believe they were getting tons of bangs for their bucks. Now, while this being the case was never confirmed by a Capcom employee, I mean, yeah, it was. Strange that Final Fantasy X, a cutscene and dialogue-filled 40-plus hour RPG released two years earlier, was able to fit on a single PS2 disc, but DMC2's 5-hour Odyssey could not. 
Now, as for Lucia herself, while brimming with potential wasn't handled all that well as cutscenes and story were hastily put together leading up to the game's launch. This left her designer, Ikeno, lamenting the fact that they were not able to expand upon her character. Sadly, the characters in DMC2, Dante included, are fairly tight-lipped and never really take any drastic action. I feel like if we had included a scene that showed how the standoffish Lucia is actually kind at heart, she would have been a more appealing character. But that sweet side never emerged, only the prickly one was ever shown, and that kind of thing is hard to show comprehensively in any kind of performance. Now, with all that out of the way, let's just get right to it. Remember that time when DMC2 had diesel brand clothing? Diesel brand clothing? Diesel branded clothing seems like something of an odd fit for a Capcom game. They didn't typically succumb to the allure of product placement in their titles, but in this case, there was a surprisingly simple, but still nevertheless stupid reason it's in there. It was because Tanaka-san, the producer, used to work for them. It was a collaboration that made good use of his last job. People on both sides talked at the time and felt that DMC2 and Diesel's visual styles would work well together and would be quite appealing to the casual audience. Seeing Dante and Lucia wearing Diesel fashion on screen was very cool. There's something neat about watching them run through the game's story while wearing those clothes. It reminds me of RE in a way. Again, I, I don't know who this appeals to. Who looks at a shelf full of games, money clutched in their hands and goes, I refuse to buy a game unless it's got some bomb ass Diesel jeans. Oh yeah, I got this. What a pittance. Anyway, despite, you know, everything, Itsuno did the impossible. In a mere six months, DMC2 became unplayable to playable, albeit a very unexciting action game filled to burst with infested tanks, helicopters, tanks, tanks, and more hella tanks. And the reviews were, uh mixed, to say the least, with many outlets citing it as the most disappointing game of 2003, with others, while well, not going as far, still marked it as a fairly weak follow-up. Dante, even though gaining one of his sharpest designs, was criticized for his lack of styling and or profiling, with many fans not appreciating his attitude adjustment. Till next time, son of Sparta. A dynamo of charisma. Complaints were also lobbied against the superfluous second disc, boring bosses, uninspired level design, and especially the brain dead difficulty. But especially the overabundance of infested. Ah, oh god, whatever. Now, despite the negative reviews, DMC2 was still a financial success, really the only success that matters to most publishers, as it wound up posting similar numbers to DMC1. At the end of the day, it was really this uh, thirst for Dante which saved the franchise from falling over the edge into obscurityville. Who else is down there? Who, who is in there? Oh, they, yeah. Oh, haven't seen you in a while. So, in a nice twist to the story that's a rarity here on what happened, DMC2's reception is what reinvigorated the series to begin with, as Insuno was determined to right the wrongs when he first wielded Rebellion. Part of me was dissatisfied because I hadn't started with the project from day one. As far as I was concerned, that didn't amount to a proper level of involvement with DMC, so I asked the company if they would give me DMC 3 from the start, and they agreed. Without DMC 3, I would be known as Itsuno, the director of Devil May Cry 2, as far as the series is concerned. Many of the same arcade staff who cut their teeth on console development with Itsuno joined him on Dante's Awakening as well, and they all rallied around the idea of going back to his cockier roots, infusing the game with a youthful energy and providing deeper combat mechanics. Making this a prequel to the first game also then logically placed DMC2 at the end of the series timeline, chalking it up to, yeah, in the future Dante he doesn't really talk that sh Hey, look over here! He's doing silly things with missiles and shit. Whoa! 
So you can say that this unfortunate bumbling step in the franchise is what informed the rest of the series going forward, which only got progressively more eccentric every time. So in that way, DMC2 is surprisingly important. This does of course remind me to remind you all that DMC2 is available in stores on the Devil May Cry collection as well as a standalone package for $24.99 on the Nintendo Switch for uh, some reason. If you know of any other stylishly troubled video games, movies, or consoles, let me know in the comments below, rainstorm down into my Twitter, or take a motorcycle ride over to the Flophouse VIP Patreon, become a big boss, and nominate the subject of a future episode of What Happened. See you next time, kids, and thanks for watching. I'm not even going to try to come up with a clever intro here because this week's game comes from a particular publisher that we're very familiar with here at What Happened and I'm just so, so tired. This is like the eighth or the ninth and a half time I've done this and it's all because of one little yellow and blue logo that won't let me stop! <laughs> <laughs> Seriously though, I have a lot of respect for Capcom for all the wonderful franchises they've given us over the last 30 some years. Unfortunately though, to have lasted for 30 years, well, you need to churn out a lot of sequels, and just by the law of averages, a lot of those sequels tend to lose their way. And few Capcom properties lost their way harder and uh, more constantly than the Blue Bomber, and in this particular instance, his his distant cousin slash son slash whatever from the future, Mega Man X. To be honest, I long stopped paying attention to the franchise after X4, which was the peak for me as a fan, because it was the only one that contained... I mean, the regular Mega Man series kind of burned itself out with derivative sequels, so it's natural that the same would befall X. Therefore, I'm not 100% sure where the franchise went after its PlayStation debut, so let's take a quick jaunt through the information superhighway to find out that- Oh. Oh no. Oh no. Oh, oh no, no, no. What happened? Well, it all starts with X6, really. After a lot of really similar sequels getting pumped out almost yearly, it's safe to say that the Mega Man team at Capcom were running out of steam. Among all the 2D games in the franchise, X6 is often pegged as the weakest. While North American and European numbers from that era are hard to pinpoint, in Japan, sales were dipping with every new entry, with X5 having topped out at around 250 15,000 copies, whereas X6 barely crawled over the 100k mark. Those numbers, however, were still healthy enough to spur Capcom to greenlight more sequels, try to act surprised. And while not even close to what Resident Evil was selling, it was clear that X6 was made fast and cheap, so it didn't need to be a blockbuster. One other potential reason as to why there was a downtrend in interest was that X6 released at the end of 2001, more than a year into the PlayStation 2's life, which was taking the world world by storm. The Mega Man X series was still sticking to its 2D roots, so it probably looked archaic to the eyes of new fans and the press. Oh, how they would come to regret that perception. This dip in sales was enough to cause Capcom to change course. It was time to bring X into the 22nd century, or you know, the, the 21st century. It was time for him, Zero, and the rest of the Maverick Hunters to go 3D. Now, Unlike some other series we've covered in the past, like Castlevania and <laughs> Bubsy, Capcom had already seen success transitioning to 3D. Hell, there were already two highly regarded Mega Man Legends games, so things were looking up. Oh. 
But this is also where things were looking down, because some behind the scenes changes were happening at the company, as the shepherd of the Mega Man franchise, Keiji Inafune, had stepped away from the X series. See, X5 was the last one he worked on in any serious capacity, as he wanted to focus on other projects. Now, bit of backstory real quick. X5 also happened to be the one where Zero gets killed off, which was at Inafune's behest. But in spite of that, the fiery-haired Maverick Hunter was going to be returning. Whether he wants to or not. I'd always planned to make Zero come back to life in the Mega Man Zero series, but then X6 comes out sooner from another division, and Zero comes back to life in that, and I'm like, what's this? Now my story for Zero doesn't make any sense. Zero has been brought back to life two times. Oh, this has become a real pain. I want a full explanation when this is all over. Capcom was structuring all their internal teams, something I covered pretty heavily on the Flophouse files. And it was this new studio that the keys to the ride armor were given. Unfortunately, Production Studio 3 just couldn't get it together, as the titles they were pumping out leading to the release of X7 weren't exactly things you'd want on your resume. They did have some staff that worked on X5 and X6, but after the shakeup, the titles coming from the team were a, a bit... <sighs> Dino Stalker, Pro Cast Sports Fishing, the GameCube Classic, Disney's Magical Mirror starring Mickey Mouse, and finally, a PS2 version of Dino Crisis 3 that was cancelled, which is fucked. I swear every time I talk about a Capcom game on this show, it makes me realize I'll eventually have to talk about another Capcom game on this show. <laughs> you can probably already see where this is heading. The studio was obviously a little on the wobbly side. They were working with a very established and well-loved franchise, and the series' long-standing producer was moving on to other things. So it's no surprise that I'm writing this very episode of what happened right now about this game. The heck has happened? They really made a mess. With Inafune's departure, some of the producing duties were handed over to Tatsuya Kiribayashi, who had just been promoted as part of his move to Studio 3. He was previously a programmer on the aforementioned GameCube smash hit, Disney's Magical Mirror starring Mickey. Now, during the start of X7's development, Inafune was consulted on one thing and one thing only, the design for the new character Axel, the uh, Poochie of the Mega Man X universe. Maybe what I did was wrong, but like we were a perfect team, don't you think? When we kicked that big dude's butt, I thought, yeah! Axel was the first of many changes the team wanted to make, and for whatever reason, one of those was to push X further into the background, despite his name being the only one on the box. The storyline justification for this was that X retired from the whole maverick hunting jazz into more of a support role, and thus, a cooler, younger, and louder hero was positioned as the main protag in his stead. So where's X been lately? I haven't seen him around. Now, if you think I'm kidding about Axel being created simply to be the cooler, younger hero, well, here's this quote from Kitabayashi where he says that Axel was created because they wanted a cooler, younger hero. He's young. He's running away. He's like the new, younger character of the group, and that's why I wanted to put him in there. Axel comes equipped with a weapon, not an arm cannon, but a gun. It, it doesn't shoot lemons, it's, it's just a gun. I I guess Production Studio 3 felt that the gun is good. The gun is good! Zero, back from not being dead, is the second playable hero, and both can be swapped in or out during the course of a stage. This was all done to freshen up the series. New console, new perspective, new gameplay systems, new hero. That makes sense given the rut that the games had found themselves in, but it's never the smartest move to lock the title hero behind a fetch quest. If you collect slash save 64 of 128 Reploid hostages throughout the game, then 
X finally gets added to your team. I mean, I mean, why not just have that be zero? Makes a bit more sense. Why X? Look, his face is right front and center on the box. Anyway, those big changes continued with a befuddling mix of 2.5D stages and 3D stages that were clearly designed by a madman. They also happened to be the cause of the lion's share of ire that X7 has earned. This was all due, perhaps, to the team's inexperience with fully 3D games, or a hesitation to move the X series into that new, scary dimension. But regardless, the choice was made to anchor the camera at an awkward angle, almost as if it was being shot from ceiling-mounted security cams. This would result in many enemies and hazards popping up at the top of the screen at the last second, making rooms harder to react to when compared to the 2D bits. The game also instituted an auto-targeting system that neither targeted nor did it automatically. Well, I mean, it did, but it actually just did it way too much. If you're squaring up against one enemy, then it's fine, but the introduction of multiple enemies attacking all at once in the crazy world of 3D space would make it near impossible to shoot what you wanted. Why must Reploids fight one another? I've had enough violence! Things didn't improve when controlling Zero, who can only attack via his Z-Saber, which requires him to get much closer than the other two. I mean, it's nice that the experience is equally miserable for everyone, but I don't have a way to finish that sentence. Zero's playstyle always kind of worked well enough in 2D, but when placed in a 3D environment, just... <sighs> nah. A lot of these issues and design decisions might have been alleviated, giving it enough polish and iteration, but as luck would have it, the team on X7 got a bit too ambitious, spending a lot of time on other stuff that didn't quite work out. In a 2003 interview, another producer who had worked on the X series before, Tatsuya Minami, confirmed that they were working on something that the X universe hadn't ever attempted before, multiplayer. With the inclusion of so many other characters in the game, we decided decided to make it possible for two people to play at once. Capcom even advertised the multiplayer in press materials, meaning it was definitely going to be a full-fledged planned feature, but for reasons I wasn't quite able to nail down, it was cut or, or deleted. Now, typically, multiplayer modes from this era were usually things tacked on in the latter half of development. Oh, we have some time to slap this together, so why not? But the fact that this was a eventually acts probably meant they simply didn't have enough time to get it to work smoothly and considering the rest of the game yeah that makes sense it's entirely possible that figuring out the headache that is the third dimension and the uh, multiplayer Thing, resulted in less time given to designing the Mavericks that Zero, X, and the uh, other guy had to hunt down. While Mega Man veterans probably know them well enough, for the casuals out there, do you remember Vanishing Gungaru, Ride Borski, Wind Crowrang, Splash Warfly, Snipe Ant Etor, Tornado Tunya, an actual onion, Soldier Stone Kong, and Flame Hy Hyenard. Do you remember Flame Hyenard? Well, let me refresh your memory. Back to the ground! 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 We also can't forget the extremely forgettable Red, the Sigma stand-in. What is he? Well, he's just Sigma. Again, as if that's not bad enough, perhaps due to pressure to get the game done to capitalize on the PS2's booming popularity, X7 was notoriously buggy. It was plagued with a lot of tiny but annoying gameplay issues that resulted in a less than ideal experience. I mean, aside from all the clunky 3D stuff. These bugs included, but were not limited to incorrect crushing damage applied to the collision of certain harmless walls, which would kill X, Zero, or the other guy just by brushing up against them. The whole aspect of powering up your trio was fundamentally broken. Since you only get X roughly 70% into the game, Zero and the other guy would be ludicrously unbalanced with the power-ups they had gained up to that point. Power-ups that can't swap between the three, leading X to feel 
little weak right off the bat. He is, however, supposed to take less damage than zero due to his armor, but sometimes when you swap between the two mid-level, the game still thinks you're zero, so X takes the same amount of damage even though he shouldn't, and then there's many, many, many other things. So, taking into account all those many things, is it really a surprise that X7 is one of the worst reviewed console Mega Man titles uh, ever, I think? Outside of DOS ports, of course. <laughs> In its review, IGN stated, pretty fairly I feel, we can't help but think that Mega Man X7 would have been better suited staying 2D, but until Capcom realizes that the better action-orientated 3D titles allow you to manipulate the camera wholeheartedly, future installments of the series will likely run into the same problems that this one did. Many websites and magazines also took the time to dump on the game's voice acting, which to me is a Mega Man statement a banner to which the community always rallied under. Me and Zero make a great team, and together we could take care of Red Alert. Are you mad? You have no business as a hunter. Yeah, I mean, that sounds fine to me. The underlying feeling was that the 3D sections were so bad that they single-handedly brought down the entire experience. So don't be shocked that Capcom took quick action to course correct. Phew! Somebody please tell me I'm through with the worst of it! Despite the critical beatdown in Japan, the game actually sold slightly better than X6, no doubt bolstered by the franchise's first appearance on the PS2 and it going 3D, well, it kind of going 3D. So despite that small increase in sales, shortly after X7's release, the keys were yanked from Production Studio 3 and handed to Production Studio 1, who around that time were making games like Resident Evil Outbreak, Monster Hunter, and Beautiful Joe, so yeah, slightly more stable hands. Even with X8 stripping out a lot of the 3D elements, focusing more on a 2.5D style, and smoothing out the experience overall, it was still met with a degree of apathy. It had a really similar graphical style to X7, a lot of the same characters, story, and since it was released just a little over one year later, it wasn't really on a lot of fans' radars. So so critically, it fared better, with many reviewers noting the improvements, but sales-wise, it was a massive plunge. Lifetime Japanese numbers wound up being in the neighborhood of 35,000 copies, a 69% drop. <laughs> nice. This was probably due to a lot of factors. The negative reception left over from X7, the fatigue from constant sequels, and just a lot of other genres and franchises giving gamers things that Mega Man wasn't really offering. This is one of those classic tales of a classic franchise going through those first fumbling steps towards change, and it just didn't work out in the end. Capcom's priorities were drastically pivoting. Fighting games and Mega Man were getting less and less care and attention, whereas bigger cinematic action titles like Devil May Cry, Resident Evil, and Onimusha were the ones getting all the funding, time, and experience stats. It was the wrong place with the wrong team at the wrong time, and it's really just as simple as that. If you're aware of any other massively mismanaged mega muckups, let me know in the comments below, take a slow motion minecart ride over to my Twitter, or enter through the boss gates of the Flophouse VIP Patreon to nominate the subject of a future episode. See you next time, and thanks for watching. Resident Evil is a pretty big deal. If you have to make charts and graphs to herd people into specific demo availability times for a single player game, then yeah, there's probably a lot of financial pressure to make sure it performs. Back in the late 90s though, the franchise was also really big, but in a different way, because much like Street Fighter, if you simply applied Resident Evil's template to another setting, bam, you'd have a brand new franchise. One such setting was of a particular type of crisis, a crisis involving dinosaurs. Hey, 
Hey, that's a catchy name. The first Dino Crisis was directed and produced by Shinji Mikami, and due to the already existing and very thirsty Resident Evil fanbase, it was a smash success on the original PlayStation, selling over 2.4 million copies worldwide when it released in the year of our Lord. It's 1999! Thus, much like Resident Evil, a sequel was then immediately greenlit and launched just one year later in 2000, also on the PlayStation. This second crisis that also happened to involve dinosaurs was more action-focused and continued the story of its scarlet-haired heroine, Regina. Is it Regina or wait, or is it Regina? Regina? Ah, okay, thanks. Shinji Mikami, though, was busy with the pre-production and planning of Resident Evil for the GameCube, so directing duties, interestingly, fell to Shu Takumi, the father of the modern turnabout. While selling a bit less than its predecessor at around 1.9 million copies, it was still an impressive number, considering the PlayStation Double Ballin' was set to release just two months later. Regardless, it was more than enough for Capcom come to again green light an immediate follow-up. We're back! A Dinosaur Tale 3 was originally planned for the Xbox and the PS2, and started off pretty much as you'd expect, but at the same time was very different from what we wound up getting. The initial scenario was going to pick up on the story threads of time-displaced dinos that were introduced at the end of the last game. While it's unclear if players would have controlled Regina, this one piece of concept art is the only thing we have of this early version, there were a few other details that were made public. It was going to implement AI-controlled partners that would have actively fought alongside the player, something Capcom was kind of big on at the time. It was also going to take place in a facility nestled in the heart of a large metropolis, a metropolis which was all but destroyed. The city would have been a crumbling wreck, having seen damage from rampaging dinos and the subsequent battles to quell said rampaging dinos. Think of Raccoon City, but just dinos. With the setting and platforms in place, everything started to move in the right direction, and until it didn't. What are you talking about? Right when Production Studio 4, who were responsible for pumping out most of Capcom's survival horror fare, were about to launch into full production on Dino Crisis 3, the world drastically changed with the terrorist attacks of 9-11, and this affected many forms of media for months, if not years. In terms of video games being altered due to this, well, Metal Gear Solid 2 is what most people think of, as that saw multiple changes to the game's climax. War of the Monsters was also delayed for months, as its depictions of collapsing buildings were also deemed to be a bit ill-timed, delaying it to early 2003, despite being nearly finished. But nothing could hold a candle or, or just be compared to what happened to Dino Crisis 3. Unlike those games, which were pretty much done, Capcom had only just finished the pre-production phase, and felt that the depiction of a crumbling American-style city would be in poor taste, so they just scrapped the entire scenario and started again from scratch. That's ridiculous. This, as you can imagine, is one of the major reasons why this game is on what happened. While it's good to have foresight and sensitivity in regards to a tragic real-world event, scrapping their entire initial pitch was probably a bit of overkill. Why not just dial back that whole ruined city concept? Why not just focus on the facility? There, there's a million other things you could have done that didn't involve throwing away everything that just, you know, okay, okay, you're Capcom. You must know what you're doing, right? But in an example of not knowing what they were doing, and I guess in a bid to try and think up a setting that was so wild it couldn't possibly be linked to the original version, Dino Crisis 3 took place 500 years in the future, had absolutely zero links to the original games, Regina included, and would also scrap the PS2 version altogether. Okay, so just, so wow, uh, 
What happened? Unfortunately, by the time the project was reorganized, Shinji Mikami, Shu Takumi, and other senior Capcom directors were busy with their own respective projects, so directing duties fell to two less senior staff members, Tetsura Oyama and Hiroyuki Maruhama. Between the two, only Hiroyuki had directed a game before, but uh, that game was uh, Deep Fear on the Sega Saturn. We have no idea what's going on over there. This is terrible! My masterpiece is ruined! Oh, what am I gonna do? As to the decision to completely drop the PS2 skew and make the third game in a franchise an exclusive to the black and green beast, well, that's a bit more mysterious. In an interview with IGN back in 2003, when asked why they were ditching the PlayStation user base, who in theory would have mostly migrated over to the PS2, legendary producer Hiroyuki Kobayashi stated simply, they had the best platform to give us the graphics we felt we needed for this particular title. Now wait. Hold up! Capcom was doing amazing things on the PS2 at the time, such as Onimusha 3, so to say it wasn't powerful enough to achieve their vision seems a little strange. And and what was their vision exactly? Did the, the same metallic gray walls over and over and over again? It doesn't really add up. Now, while the following isn't confirmed, it might be a bit more plausible, so just keep it in mind. Capcom put out very few wholly original Xbox games during, well, its entire life cycle. Yeah, there was a port or two, but aside from the odd one-off, they rarely supported the machine with exclusives. So there's a chance this was seen as an opportunity to diversify their game releases, to broaden their portfolio a little bit. I mean, since the game's narrative was now completely separated from the first two titles, what could it hurt? If it does great on the Xbox, then great! And if it does terribly, well, that's less great, but eh, no big deal. Picture Capcom looking at their upcoming lineup and going, Okay, which one of you wants to be an Xbox exclusive? C come on, people! One of you needs to be a Bill Gates hamburger! Dino Crisis 3, I'm looking in your direction! So, yeah, back to those lifeless steel hallways. Now, when you pitch something that starts with X, but in space, you're limiting yourself to only a few possibilities. You're either on a, a ship or a base, you're basically floating somewhere in space. Hence why the team drafted up the Osmandius, a big old space tub that the entirety of the game would take place on. Now, while a lot of thought clearly went into the design of this ship and how the mechanics of it would work as it could shift and transform during the course of the game, sadly it still amounted to everything looking very samey, with a distinct lack of environmental diversity. This decision led to a drab and unexciting looking game, which would be a stark contrast to the elaborate CG cutscenes Capcom had sprung for. They spent not an insignificant amount of their budget all on this CG, even going so far as to hire a professional filmmaker that they weren't even able to get. Shinji Higuchi, whom some of you may be familiar with, worked on the special effects on the Gamera trilogy, storyboarded lots of anime, and would go on to co-direct 2016's Shin Godzilla. Y yeah, they couldn't get him due to scheduling conflicts. So their second choice, imagine being the second choice to work on Dino Crisis 3, was Makoto Kamiya, who had assisted Higuchi on the aforementioned Gamera films. Interestingly enough, Capcom would turn back to Kamiya decades later to direct two of those CGI Resident Evil movies you forgot even existed. Uh, come on, don't be shy. 
Capcom was awfully boastful in regards to these cutscenes and proudly proclaimed that over 50 minutes of CG was going to be used in the game, which they tended to talk about more than the actual game. In various interviews leading to the game's release, you saw a pattern in what features they tended to big up. How does Dino Crisis 3 take advantage of the Xbox hardware? It makes very good use of the hardware. You can see in the CG movie scenes, for example. Uh, okay, the, the power of the Xbox machine doesn't really affect CG movies, but okay, what? Uh, how about another question? Why are the dinosaurs missing their outer skin? You should just play the game to find out. Gee, thanks! How insightful! Now, while all this superfluous stuff is indeed superfluous stuff, Stuff, it still didn't mean Dino Crisis 3 was destined to always be a bad game. Yeah, the setting wasn't going to be as exciting as it promised to be, and yeah, fans of the franchise were going to be disappointed it didn't follow up on the cliffhanger ending of Dino Crisis 2, but aside from that, there was still a chance that it wouldn't be a tedious, clunky slog, right? <laughs> The game wound up being a tedious, clunky slog. Now the answer as to why is kinda complex. Well, actually it isn't really. Capcom decided to dispense with the pre-rendered backgrounds of their survival horror history and to go full 3D. By itself, this should work out just fine. And when you consider Code Veronica, it worked out just fine. Problem was that Dino Crisis 3's combination of static camera angles, controllable camera angles, and automatic camera angles that would attempt to shoot the action on the fly amounted to something that could barely be played at all. Now, throw in a fast-moving jetpack-powered character and even faster enemies, and all these components would just clash in spectacular fashion. I'm sure the thought process here was, well, we need to have have those static camera angles to make people think this is survival horror. We, we gotta have those. And they weren't wrong on that assertion, but this particular game leans even more into the action-orientated direction of Dino Crisis 2, where you're mowing down most enemies instead of avoiding them. Static camera angles work well within Resident Evil, as you mostly fight slow-moving threats, where you have the time to reposition yourself. But take those same camera angles and make everything fast as shit and, well, he wind up with something like this. You just can't see what you're doing most of the time. Either you're off screen or your enemies are. Kobayashi, the producer, described this increased tempo to the gameplay as speed feeling, scale feeling, and solid feeling. Basically, blast processing marketing bullshit. This was, unfortunately, the space death nail in the space coffin. And there was no way they didn't realize this was a problem, as it just hampers every second of gameplay. I'm not putting up with this crap. Our best guess here is that because the game already had a false start, that more experienced hands had moved on, and it being a sacrificial Xbox exclusive meant that Capcom Japan most likely didn't view Dino Crisis 3 as a major priority. If they had swapped out dinosaurs to some type of alien threat and unlocked the camera, giving you full third-person control, it probably wouldn't have been received all that poorly and could have even become its own franchise. Dead Space before Dead Space. But because it was Dino Crisis, and not even a spin-off like Dino Stalker, but a big mainline sequel, it was just itching to disappoint. Which is no surprise when you consider it's in a dead heat for the crown of the lowest rated entry in the franchise. Unlike Dino Stalker though, Dino Crisis 3 was far, far more expensive to make. As such, Capcom's sales expectations for the game 500,000 copies sold in its first fiscal year were uh, not met, safe to say. How much did it sell? Well, I actually can't find hard data on that. 
What I did uncover was a 2004 Capcom conference call which charitably described the game's sales as sluggish. For the next 18 years, Capcom would barely ever acknowledge the franchise aside from a PSN re-release, which is about to get taken offline. Thanks, Sony. Oh, what's that? They're, they're, oh, they're, they're not doing that anymore. Oh, cool. Yeah, there's the occasional Regina reference or costume cameo, but we've seen no remakes or remasters, you know, anything of real significance. In fact, only a few years ago, Capcom Japan rejected a proposal to bring the series back via a pitch from Capcom Vancouver. For more on that, see my Dead Rising 4 video. It's really depressing! But when Dino Crisis 3 was such a disaster for the company, it's not really surprising. We can only hope that the original two games combined sales of over 4 million copies will be enough for Capcom to finally realize that this is very much a series that should not remain extinct. If you know of any other forgotten fossils in the video game or movie industries, let me know in the comments below or over on my Twitter. And if you want to directly nominate something, then blast off over to the Flophouse VIP Patreon and become a big boss so let me know what you'd like to see next. See you next time, and thanks for watching. So, it's been about a month, give or take, since we last covered a catastrophic Capcom calamity here on What Happened, which means we're due for some fresh meat. Hot dog meat, that is. So, throw on your ratty green t-shirt, put on your best scowl, and attach your creepy arm. It's time to- Hi folks, Matt McMuscles here. Before we get into this episode proper, I have to acknowledge that this is like the 37th time, I think, that I've had to talk about a Capcom game and I don't even necessarily want to. They're one of my favorite developers of all time. Street Fighter, Final Fight, Resident Evil, Mega Man, Auto Modelista, the list of their classics is endless. However, they have just as many non-classics in their long and storied history. I am simply imparting this information to you and I have no personal animosity against them. Well, I, I mean, except for, anyway. I'm getting ahead of myself. Just thought you should know that I admire this company greatly for what it was and what it can be, but in order to look towards the future, we all have to learn from the mistakes of the past. And really, for Capcom, there are a few mistakes bigger, more embarrassing, or more costly than the failed sequel, 2009's Bionic Commando, a game I'm sure most of you are passionately familiar with. However, you may not be aware of how this one innocuous, gritty 7th gen action game in a sea of gritty 7th gen action games helped change the course of Capcom's entire business model going forward. So, with the stage properly set, just what happened to Bionic Commando? It's 1987 and Capcom has just released Top Secret in Japanese arcades and localized the game as Bionic Commando for the West. Unfortunately, the subsequent 1988 NES Famicom ports failed to see sales numbers like Mega Man or Ghosts and Goblins. In fact, the Famicom version... <laughs> Hitler's Resurrection Top Secret apparently sold quite poorly, so outside the occasional handheld version, the series remained largely dormant. That is, until 2004. Ben Judd, a former employee at Capcom of Japan, was a big fan of the franchise and would routinely pester his friend and boss, good old Papa Inafune, to bring Rad Spencer swinging back into consoles, but was routinely ignored. Judd then put together a written pitch and presentation to convince the other higher-ups within Capcom and again was soundly rejected. Eventually though, with Inafune being worn down from months of campaigning, he finally greenlit a new game for the PSP, which was planned to be done in the same style as other PSP revivals like Maverick Hunter X or Ultimate Ghosts and Goblins, all of which were made internally at Capcom with small teams. 
Work hadn't been going on for long though, because in mid-2005, Inafune decided that the game would be better suited for next-generation consoles, the Xbox 360 and PS3. Problem was that Capcom themselves were already pretty busy with the likes of Lost Planet, Dead Rising, and others, so Inafune decided they needed outside help to get Mr. Spencer back into the swing of things. I'm gonna be saying swing a lot here, people, so just, just get used to it. To make some such a relationship work, Capcom in Japan would supervise and produce, gain the final say on everything. It was their property after all. While another studio would do the heavy lifting on the programming, level design, etc. For reasons not exactly clear, Stockholm Sweden's Grin was chosen for this task, which was a very unlikely choice because the only notable games they had made up to that point were ports of Advanced Warfighter 1 and 2 to the PC, and that was pretty much it. The 2.5D PSP project was then also transferred to them and became Bionic Commando Rearmed, an enhanced remake for both XBLA and PSN. It would serve as a way to introduce players back to the franchise, and would stick closely to the formula of the classic game, but this time with an absolutely big slapper of a soundtrack courtesy of Simon Vickland. Rearmed released first in August of 2008 and was met with stellar reviews, positive fan reaction, and healthy sales, but the reception of its big HD console brother, simply named Bionic Commando, was decidedly less stellar. Criticism was lobbied against the game's grittier art style, attitude, and character design, dropping the cheesy but charming G.I. Joe style trappings of the franchise. To be fair to Capcom and Grin though, pretty much every publisher was putting out a game like this because it was the style at the time. Now, despite this being very common, there was indeed pushback by fans over all the changes, and was compounded even further because Capcom was handing the keys to a franchise over to a non-Japanese developer with an unproven track record. Staying within the lines of a 2.5D remake was one thing, but a big 3D sequel with a huge edgy attitude adjustment was another. Now, I'm gonna be honest, not a lot is known about what happened behind closed doors during the game's development, but what we do know is that it was rough. Rearmed went well, but there was no reason to believe it wouldn't. But for the console's sequel, comments from Inafune painted a picture of a developer and publisher not being able to agree on a variety of things, with one of those things being perhaps its tone and story. At the beginning, things were very, very good between the two companies. Things get kind of weird from the middle, and it gets really bad at the end, especially for the Japanese side. What Inafune meant by this, I assume, is that after enough arguing, Capcom threw up their hands, stopped trying to manage the project, and simply just wanted to get the game out the door. Inafune also took time to detail at what particular phase he felt the project fell off the set path and into a dangerous radioactive quagmire. People should be more flexible about things. If you don't do that, everything will become messed up in the middle, and that's the most important part. Not the beginning, but in the middle and finishing the game. This is often the case. Once you have an alpha version of a game up and running with all the main components working but in rough shape, deciding then what to keep, remove, or tweak can be integral for shipping on time. The former Capcom bigwig also had some damning words for this particular phase of Bionic Commando's development, describing the company's attitude towards it as being, whatever, do what you want, I don't care. Now, one of those things that Grin apparently wanted to do, and Capcom did not, was to incorporate an unintentionally hilarious plot twist. If you don't want to be spoiled for this terrible bit of storytelling, I just, I, I don't know, clamp your hands around your ears or something. In this gritty universe, Nathan Rad Spencer's bionic arm turns out to be composed of his late wife due to compatible memories or DNA or some such nonsense, I don't know. Inafune even gave a concise but accurate quote regarding this particular revelation, simply saying, I don't even know what happened there. 
So, it was pretty clear that even if Bionic Commando would go on to be a big success, the rift betwixt Capcom and Grin had degraded enough that they wouldn't continue their relationship. Fortunately though, that didn't turn out to be a problem, because the idea of Bionic Commando selling so well that it would warrant a sequel was completely unfounded. In fact, if we were to consider the pedigree of the publisher, the franchise, the marketing campaign, and the money spent resurrecting this particular series, Bionic Commando might just be the biggest financial bomb we've ever covered here on this show, and that's saying a hell of a lot. We even did an episode on Drake and the 99 Dragons! For fuck's sake! In its launch month, May of 2009, NPD Data put Bionic Commando's North American sales numbers across both the 360 and PS3 at 27,000 copies, which is just... wow. Now, keep in mind, BC wasn't some cheap, quickly made cash grab. It had a full multiplayer mode, tie-in comic books, retailer exclusive skins, and even shelled out for Mike Patton of Faith No More to give, uh, life to the titular hero. You deserve a chair, Mag! But the one I'm thinking of doesn't have wheels! More embarrassing still, Bionic Commando was outperformed by something far worse, something Grin themselves had made. In an act of brilliance, stupidity, I'm not sure which, they had also developed another action game for the 360 and PS3, which released on the exact same day. Enter Terminator Salvation. This three hour long cover based shooter was absolutely savaged by critics, and the gulf in quality between the two was pretty much night and day. However, John Connor's adventure wound up selling close to double that of Rad Spencer's in that particular month. And so, hence the tale of Grin and their risky, release two action games at the exact same time on the exact same day, eating into each other's sales strategy. Wait, no wait, no, did I, did I say two games? I meant three. Now only a moron would think that that is all there is to it. Allow me to introduce you to Wanted Weapons of Fate, the third game that Grin just so happened to make, which limped into store shelves roughly a month and some change before Commando and Terminator. And surprise, surprise, was a cover-based third-person shooter like Terminator. And surprise, surprise, was also not very good. You son of a bitch. The commonalities don't end there, because Wanted also managed to outsell Bionic Commando. Now, I couldn't find launch month sales for Wanted, but according to Universal Pictures, by July, it had moved more than 100,000 units, so the odds were pretty good, but not confirmed. This has to have messed up the development of one or all three of these games. Having one studio burning the midnight oil just to make them, the pressure at Grin to perform must have been enormous. This might be a first for us here at What Happened, one studio developing three very similar games for the same platforms and released within swinging distance eh, of each other with the best of the bunch, our beloved Commando performing the worst. But on the plus side, at least the game performed better in the West than it did in Japan. Still though, it's actually kind of impressive from a technical or manpower standpoint that Grin managed to pull this off, utilizing the same engine to develop three games concurrently and seeing them release alongside each other. It wasn't exactly a positive thing and none of them sold well, but damn, they did it. As for Bionic Commando itself, while their best effort still had its critics. Some of the negatives were restrictive level design which would kill the player if they tried to wander off the beaten path, frustrating save and checkpoint systems, and the needlessly gritty and dark storyline that rubbed many the wrong way. Conversely, the core appeal of the game, the swinging mechanics, graphics, and multiplayer mode were seen as the highlights, but it still wasn't enough to get the game to Capcom's sales targets, even with a PC version that released a few months later. 
Now, a lot of this doom and gloom has centered around this launch period, but that's not the full story because, a year later, Capcom came clean with how their recent slate of titles fared. Across all versions worldwide, Commando had eventually inched across 700,000 units, but that was still pretty shy of the 1.5 million copies sales target. Fortunately though, almost all of their western developed games perform poorly, including Johnny Dark Void and Spyborgs. Oh, I'll get to you one day. The game's slow sales also affected relations between Capcom and GameStop, as Capcom had overshipped Bionic Commando to them, which is why, years later, you'll still see tons of these in bargain bins across the nation. But despite all this, it was actually the difficulties faced during the Western and Japanese dynamic of BC's development that seemed to leave the most lasting negative reception at Capcom, so it was decided by the higher-ups that they'd keep Keep such projects on a shorter leash. They'd focus on releasing the ones they currently had in their pipeline, like Dead Rising 2 and DMC, but they would be far more choosy, i.e. stop greenlighting any more Western developed games. Not a million years. Capcom president Haruhiro Sujimoto was quoted as saying, Our experience with Bionic Commando has demonstrated the difficulty of outsourcing the development of new titles to overseas companies. However, we cannot develop a sufficient number of titles without using the resources of these companies. This is why we plan to continue using these alliances, but we are considering ways to separate the roles of activities in Japan and overseas. We plan to develop new titles primarily primarily in Japan. Overseas companies may be used to mostly develop titles for existing game series with well-established characters and universal themes. Unfortunately, outside of Dead Rising, pretty much all of the titles greenlit under Inafune's Western push underperformed, and he left the company later on in 2010, just a few months after Capcom posted these disappointing sales figures. As for Ben Judd, well, coincidentally, this just so happened to be the first and last producing position he ever had at Capcom, and didn't receive another until 2011, and that's because he left the company. Company. He then joined up with Inafune and went on to better things. It's better than nothing. At least that's my opinion. <laughs> Luckily though, Bionic Commando saw one more game released. 2011's Rearmed 2, which while not as fondly received as its predecessor, at least let the franchise leave on a slightly higher note. It was developed by another Swedish company, Fat Shark, and also used the same diesel engine as Grin's other projects and even saw Simon Vicklin return, thank god. But the fact that Capcom quickly turned to another really similar studio showed just how frosty the relationship had gotten. Now, uh... While everything up to this point would have you assume this whole debacle is what killed Grin, well, it really didn't. Square Enix then came a callin' and had contracted Grin to make a western-flavored spin-off of Final Fantasy codenamed Fortress, but when Square became concerned with what was being produced, cancelled the project with zero warning and didn't pay Grin for the six months of work that they had already put in. This, this right here, was the final nail pounded into the company's coffin. They tried desperately to pitch a reboot of Streets of Rage to Sega and even Strider to Capcom, but both were promptly rejected. With no money or projects left, the grin finally became a frown and were forced to close their doors by the end of 2009. Most of them would go on to form Overkill Software, who then went on to develop a Walking Dead game, which, oh god, I'm gonna need to do that eventually. Uh, wait, I, I already did it! Yeah! Finally, aside from some spots in Marvel vs. Capcom games, the Bionic Commando IP has remained untouched for the last 12 years, and I can't say Capcom's wrong to be wary. Maybe if they had stuck to the original plan of a simple, cheap PSP game, it wouldn't have gone on to do the damage it did, but when you're swinging through the air with your creepy hot dog wife arms swearing up a storm, you can't be looking over your shoulder and regretting the paths not taken.
If you know of any other games, Capcom or otherwise, there's still plenty you'd like for me to cover on the show. Let me know in the comments below, over on my Twitter, or grapple your way over to the Flophouse VIP Patreon and become a big boss and nominate what you'd like to see in a future episode. See you next time, and thanks for watching! Welcome to another episode of What Happened, where, I, li listen, I, I know we just did a Capcom episode like less than a month ago, but, but this is Fighting Evolution, possibly Capcom's worst internally developed fighting game ever. It was such a disaster every which way that for a while it seemed like it was going to be the last pugilistic project the company would ever greenlight. And I... Uh, I can't let that slide and have been itching to talk about this absolute cluster ever since I started this show. Not sure if you guys remember, but the turn of the century was a particularly rough time for fighting games, and all of the punches, ten strings, and anti-airs didn't really prevent that. While Capcom diversified their lineup with survival horror and action games, SNK wasn't so lucky. Yes, the story actually starts with the masters of the 100 Mega Shot. Shin Nihon Kikaku. They were unfortunately at the center of a number of bombs like the Neo Geo CD and the Hyper Neo Geo 64, and that's not even accounting for the sudden decline of arcades in the West, which obviously hurt them. Even their collaboration with Capcom, which resulted in what some consider to be the pinnacle of 2D fighting, CVS 1 and 2, well, it did almost nothing to boost their bottom line. Since Capcom were the ones who developed those smash hits, SNK saw a mere pittance via character licensing fees, and their version of the same concept, SVC Chaos, was rushed and unfortunately underperformed. Why was it rushed though? Well, because the company was imploding on the inside. SNK USA had to be shut down, SNK's founder left, and all of the Japanese staff splintered off to look for work elsewhere, with some forming brand new companies like Dim. Now, during all of this, somehow, Capcom and SNK were in negotiations to produce a third round of Millionaire Fighting, but for the reasons I just listed, the deal fell apart. There's even more to the messy tale of SNK's death and eventual rebirth, but since it involves, you know, pachinko, I, I don't really have the energy to go into it right now. The important part for our story is that a number of SNK's staff, including one Toyohisa Tanabe, a systems and chief director on the first four King of Fighters titles, joined Capcom around this time, and it's with him where this layered story truly begins. Round one, fight! When Tanabe and the rest of the SNK refugees entered the Osaka offices of Capsule Computers, they did feel out of place in the company that had essentially been their rival for a number of years. When we joined Capcom, there were two plans put forward for the kind of game we would develop. We had a lot of people on our team with experience developing fighting games, so our first idea was to make our own fighting game. However, creating a fighting game from scratch with a new gameplay system would have been very time consuming, and as a new team at Capcom, we felt we had to contribute something to the company as quickly as possible. So instead, we went with our second idea, which was to use Capcom's pre-existing assets as the foundation for a new project. That's how Capcom Fighting all-Stars development began. Yoshiki Okamoto, a big Capcom producer at the time, also presented the former SNKers with another opportunity, to work on an action game of unclear origin. It was either DMC2 or Chaos Legion, or they could just push forward with a fighting game project. Those pre-existing assets Tanabe mentioned earlier, those were the scraps of what had been Capcom vs SNK3. Apparently that had started life as a 3D project, with actual models having been made, but since SNK had gone belly up and the rights to their characters and franchises were at that time very much in flux, the work was just sitting there, 
unused. Tanabe was made the director and decided that the best way to make something quickly was to opt for a Capcom vs. Capcom style slugfest, plucking several characters from not just their fighting games like Ryu, Morgan, and Batsu, but a few unexpected picks like Hagar, Poison, and Strider Hiryu. To explain this wild mashup that was more or less sticking to canon, unlike prior vs. games, it would take place in a metro city that was under threat of exploding by a bomb known as as Laughter Sun, a plot literally orchestrated by death. Three particular characters, however, all OCs do not steal, had a piece of a code that, when combined, would disarm said Laughter Sun <laughs> and pretty much save the day. These three characters would logically be known as the Code Holders, the game's sometimes used but always derided subtitle. Now, technically, this would be the first traditional 3D fighting game developed by Capcom that was using Street Fighter characters, as the EX series was made by Akira so there was obviously going to be some growing pains. This is doubly true because the majority of the team was composed of ex-SNK staff, after all, who up to that point had barely touched 3D programming and design. While Capcom had branched out in this way with other new fighting franchises, like your Rival Schools or your Power Stones, there was some hesitancy on how to approach a game like this, to do Street Fighter and Darkstalkers justice in a brand new dimension. Since Tanabe had been appointed director, he and his team felt it best to do something unique, so they expanded on the story, something Street Fighter had shied away from at this time. They created four brand new characters that were designed to be a bit more stylish, i.e. SNK as shit, and then they wanted it to be more dramatic. And they instituted a few new systems, the first appropriately called Dramatic Counter, functioned a lot like Tekken 7 where the action would slow down to highlight whenever a character dodged, then counterattacked. Next was Declaration of Victory, a special taunt that one could choose to invoke before a match. If they then went on to win that first round, then the entire match victory point would be awarded to them. Certainly a unique but bullshit feature. That's almost as dumb as... Uh, Critical Parade! I don't know. Sacrificing your tag partner for like a seven second buff. Oh, I'm so glad that never existed. The final spice added to the game was, uh, finishing moves. Yeah, you heard right. These were flashy attack animations that could only be triggered at the end of a match, and while not graphically violent, were kind of shocking to see in a 2003 Capcom game. It wouldn't be until years later where you saw more stuff like this, such as various level 3 cinematic supers. With all of these changes, Capcom upper management started to get concerned, so they they felt it was warranted that the cold holders should go on location to gather fan feedback. By this point, almost a year and a half, the game had mostly been finished, although it still needed fine tuning, extra characters, and a translation pass. Unfortunately, the location testing did not go so well, as many players came away unimpressed by All Stars from both a visual and gameplay standpoint. The game didn't look very advanced when compared to the newest. Tekken or Virtua Fighter. The original characters stuck out like sore thumbs when placed against Capcom's most iconic, and the gameplay was singled out as feeling a bit awkward and not in line with what most people expected or wanted. These tests went so poorly, even in Japan, that the fate of the entire game was hanging in the balance back at Capcom headquarters. Tanabe's team wanted to take that feedback to improve the game, and even started to staff up to expedite that process, but before that could truly kick off, the axe came down. Fighting All-Stars was cancelled, and while the feedback was definitely a root cause for this, it wasn't the only one. With arcade business dramatically slowing down and stuff like Resident Evil selling gangbusters, Capcom's fighting game division was in the process of being phased out. You can get some additional details on this with our Devil May Cry 2 episode. Legendary Capcom 
designer and artist Akira Akiman Yasuda in an interview recalled this time at the company. You know Resident Evil, right? The people who had started that project wanted to challenge themselves. The old way of doing things was no longer working. I think they wanted to find a new style, a new way forward, and it did provide some hints to the company's direction in a number of different ways. I think there were also people in the lower levels of the staff saying that Street Fighter is no longer selling, so we want to make something else that's not a fighting game. The Street Fighter Alpha series had been going on for a while, and everyone was bored of that, so I think this felt like the moment to try something new, to go after a new challenge. Noritaka Funamizu, Capcom general producer, was also a big fan of Animal Crossing, so I think he wanted to make something similar to Animal Crossing, which in some way or another actually wound up becoming Monster Hunter. While it's always good to diversify and challenge oneself, it's still a shame because Capcom were in talks with SNK to acquire the rights for a special guest character, which, judging from his silhouette, many believe to have been K-. Dash. But in subsequent interviews over the years, it was heavily hinted to be Kyo Kusanagi. SNK had apparently signed off on this, but since the game's arcade and eventual PS2 port were shut down so suddenly, it never came to be. Tanabe, as you can imagine, lamented the game's cancellation. I felt that Fighting All-Stars ended the way it did due to my inexperience. It caused problems to the company, and I'm sorry to the staff who worked hard on it, and everyone who helped us. Even 10 years later, it's still a bit difficult to talk about. However, I felt I'd been saved a little bit when Ingrid appeared in Fighting Evolution. Ah, yeah, Fighting Evolution. While I'm aware that's supposed to be the main game this episode is about, this slapdash hack job wouldn't have existed without Fighting All-Stars. And while Evolution's development was way shorter and less dramatic, it's the far more infamous game. Tanabe and some of the staff moved on to Flagship Limited, an independent studio co-funded by Capcom, Sega, and Nintendo, who would support them on various titles. This left the work on Fighting All-Stars just sitting there, unused, which was eerily similar to its precursor, CVS-3. This was the state of fighting games at Capcom around this time, abandoned and neglected. And no one knows what it's like to be hated. Capcom higher-ups, however, were displeased that money had been spent without seeing a return. Well, maybe you should have cancelled the goddamn thing! Thus, they scrambled to do something with the concept. Hidetoshi Ishizawa, who had been working on Capcom Fighter since Alpha 2, was assigned to pick up the pieces, but one of the main producers backing him up had dropped out, and thus Yoshinori Ono stepped in to manage the game's production. The order from Capcom bigwigs was thus. Finish the shit as fast as possible and as cheaply as possible. Don't spend money or get creative for any reason! Thus, Capcom Fighting Jam slash Evolution was born! Since the fighting game division was getting murked left and right, the team was given approximately zero budget, so every character, save for Ingrid, was simply ripped from previous games, despite them having, you know, incredibly contrasting art styles and animation quality. Street Fighter, several versions of it, Darkstalkers and Red Earth were represented, but that still left out several fan-favorite characters, like Ken, Morgan, or Cammy. Capcom also had zero time to work on the game's endings, so those were farmed out to comic book studio Udon under the strictest of deadlines. These endings were devoid of voiceovers, written dialogue, or even sound effects. Something that was originally going to be implemented was a team repping Street Fighter 1, since it was the only era of street fighting not represented. This faction would have consisted of Eagle, using his Capcom vs SNK look, Retsu, the only other new sprite in the game, and finally Sagat, a younger pre-scarred version of the Mutai Emperor. Unfortunately, this entire concept was eventually cut, try to act surprised, as there simply wasn't any time 
time or budget left for it. These restrictions also affected the core gameplay, as each faction of characters played like the games they hailed from, so Third Strike Chun-Li could parry, but Street Fighter 2 Ryu could not, no matter what. There weren't even any modes or grooves to select from, so you couldn't mix and match each style, which left the entire roster stupidly unbalanced, and, and not in a fun Jackie Chan Fists of Fire way, but instead in a lame, unfun Capcom fighting evolution way. Balancing can sometimes be the most arduous and time-consuming thing when working on a fighting game, so it's not shocking there's none here. The ultimate indicator that the game was rushed, however, has to be its backgrounds. In the CVS games, whether they were 2D or 3D, the stages that set the tone for each bout were incredibly imaginative and detailed, but that was worlds away from what was on display here. Simple, static images, some of which might be just actual photos of real places, with barely a hint of animation, proudly displayed character art ripped from completely random sources. It's, it's actually kind of unbelievable. The, the only thing more unbelievable is all the amazing Shinkiro art that was wasted on this whole debacle. It wasn't even used for like the Western box art. When Fighting Evolution launched for the PS2 and Xbox with almost zero promotion, the critical reception was pretty savage, with it scoring in the lowest bracket for a Capcom fighting title since, I, I, don't, I don't know, Street Fighter 1? Coincidentally, sales were just as, if not lower. Fans were also disappointed since this was coming off the cancellation of Fighting All-Stars and was released alongside games like Tekken 5 and Mortal Kombat Deception, which had far more effort put into them and were pushing their respective franchises forward. This is not a knock on the team at Capcom, mind you. They were only working within their means. Regardless, Fighting Evolution came and went with a barely audible fart. As time went on, technology progressed, and other smaller companies were gaining experience working on anime fighters like Naruto and DBZ, so with a dream in his head and a pep in his step, Ono decided to pit Street Fighter to Capcom once again, and was specifically need to convince Papa Inafune of its viability. Since very few people at Capcom even had fighting game expertise anymore, Ono suggested using companies like Dimps and Aiding to get the job done which would also minimize risk and not divert staff from other projects. It was a tough proposition though. Tekken and Virtual Fighter were selling at an all-time low, and even the reborn SNK had failed to see success with stuff like Samurai Showdown Sen. Fortunately, the eventual success of Street Fighter 4 would spur Capcom to invest back into the genre, and while it certainly hasn't been uh, problem-free since then, yeah, let's go with that, Street Fighter's return seemed to usher in a new chapter for everybody, which is great, but man, it was quite a road to get there. From SNK's death, to a cancelled CVS sequel, to a cancelled 3D affair, to one of the worst fighters the company ever put out. Now, since the beat-em-up is also back in fashion, why don't we start reviving Final Fight again? Please? Capcom, I'll literally suck your d if you know of any other genres, games, or movies that struggle to stay afloat, gasping for every breath, let me know in the comments below, over on my Twitter, or take an elevator up to the Flophouse VIP Tower and become a big Shadowloo boss to nominate the subject we'll be taking on in the future. See you next time, and don't forget the many gods like you all over the world. You know what they say, the third strike is what counts. You know pain you can give it to, don't think that I can't knock you out. I'm out. Welcome back to What Happened, the show that still hasn't covered GTA, the trilogy, the definitive edition, the disaster of the year. However, the grains of sand are rapidly running out, Rockstar, so take the time now to make peace with whatever deity you pray to. Anyway, speaking of deities, 
God Hand! Simply put, this is one of the most unique stories in Capcom's history of uh, unique stories, but fortunately not for the reasons we usually discuss on this very program. <laughs> See, when God Hand was released during the Halcyon days of 2006, it very quickly accrued a kind of reputation, and unfortunately, it wasn't a 100% positive one. I don't think you realize what you're getting your into Pendeo. There's been plenty of rumors, speculation, and inaccuracies about its development, some of which I hope to stomp out today. So sit down, chill out, and grab a smoothie and or puppy pizza. It's time to find out what happened to God Hand. Finally, a boss fight. In the mid-2000s, Capcom acquiesced to the concerns of some of their creators like Hideki Kamiya and Atsushi Anaba, who sought more independence and creative freedom within the company. This is what formed Clover Studio and the creation of Okami, which was set to be the biggest title many on the team had or would ever work on. Now, Capcom was putting out a lot of horror and action titles that were making big bank, as was the style at the time. But the flip side of that, of course, was a sharp decrease in the green lighting of adventure and RPG titles. And no one knows what it's like to be the formation of Clover was an attempt to offset that, as many of the creative leads were burnt out on the conveyor belt of edgy 2000s fare. But even more unfortunately, the declining sales of the Beautiful Joe series and its spin-offs did put some pressure on Clover to generate profits, and it's at this point where Shinji Mikami, the twisted mind behind the seminal Capcom classic, Goof Troop decided to join up. After the arduous and stressful development of Resident Evil 4, he wanted to try something new and felt Clover was just the place to do it. Opportunity is all about timing, however, and when Mikami was added to the studio's ranks, they were all busy painting up a storm with good ol' Amaterasu. In fact, Okami already had its creative leads in place, so there really wasn't much for Mikami to actually do. Therefore, he spent the first few months of his time there drafting up multiple ideas for possible future games, but eventually grew frustrated at the fact he wasn't able to create or contribute in a more concrete way. He then asked Inaba if he really had to wait more than a year for them to finish up Okami before he could lead on their next project. Inaba understood his plight, but said unless he was willing to work with another team outside of Clover, there really wasn't much else he could do. But as it turns out, Mikami was absolutely fine with that. He just really, really wanted to make something. Clover was also fine with this, as they realized what with Okami's development taking so long and it being an expensive game to produce, it would be a good idea to get more product out there in the meantime, proving to Capcom higher-ups that they were a financially viable team. Now, while Mikami had written several game scenarios, the inspiration to go with a combat-heavy brawling title came from an unexpected source. In a 2020 video interview, the legendary game creator didn't mince words. Capcom USA were making a sequel to Final Fight in the United States. When I played it, it was shit. I used to enjoy Final Fight, so I was mad that a series I had liked ended up like this. I thought that I wanted to make a game like that if I ever had a chance. Now just, just think about this for one second. Final Fight Streetwise helped inspire God Hand. I have never been so embarrassed. So anyway, I no wait, I'm sorry, we, we have to look at that statement a little bit more closely than not at all. Okay, around late 2004, early 2005, Streetwise was rebooted into the pissy looking schlock we all know and hate today. Mikami must have played an early build of that come mid or late 2005. And considering how the final game of Streetwise ended up, yeah, it's no wonder he thought it was Kuso. If you need a refresher on Streetwise's uh, rather bumpy development, well, bing bong! Fuck your life! Okay, so while it seems like flexing on Capcom USA played at least a small part in God Hand's creation, Mikami also wanted this new project to stand out and for it to do its own thing. Thus, he had his heart, or head, set on creating a melee-based action game 
played exclusively from a first-person perspective. That was the original idea, and they even got a very basic prototype of this idea up and running, but was scrapped just as quickly, most likely due to the complexity of creating such a thing. See, Clover meant for this to be a quick project they could produce while they were busy with Okami, and trying to suss out all the details and technical headaches of creating first-person fisting would kinda go against that whole MO. And let's be real here, they were never gonna top breakdown any Anyway, mm, yeah, got it in there. Now, it's time to answer the question, if Clover were too busy whipping around the celestial brush, who was gonna help Mikami? Enter Value Wave, a smaller support studio that Capcom utilized whenever they needed a few extra hands. They pitched in on a bunch of Mega Man X titles, as well as the aforementioned Beautiful Joe spin-offs. Mikami would still direct the project, with Inaba producing, along with a very small team of Clover character modelers. But in terms of level design, programming, sound, animation and such, it was all gonna be Value Wave. Say what? In addition to this being a quick project, it also had to be made frugally, as Okami was taking more than the lion's share of allocated funds, so to save costs on developing new technology, they're gonna need to share some. Okami's engine is what God Hand runs on, and while that obviously had its benefits, taking the core of a massive adventure game and using it to power a straightforward action brawler also had some drawbacks. Using this engine would also make sure this would stay a PS2 exclusive, because even though Capcom was supporting the Xbox and GameCube in the mid-2000s, they simply didn't have time or money to spread the game across multiple formats. And uh, since the first person idea didn't pan out, the team thought it best to go for an over-the-shoulder camera perspective, which, while easier, didn't make it look like many other titles at first glance. Fortunately, Clover always did things their own way. From the beginning, God Hand was never intended to be super serious, and always had been designed to have a good sense of humor. Remember, Mikami wanted to do something very different from Resident Evil, so he filled it with dad jokes about 70s and 80s Japanese pop culture, and lampooned just about every action movie or media trope. With that in mind, it also forced the team to prioritize certain elements over others. They simply didn't have time or manpower to create detailed open levels with multiple paths and points of interest, or complicated, explosive set pieces. Like any good director, Mikami had to make some hard decisions with the time and budget that he did have, so he chose to focus on a unique, in-depth fighting system, detailed character models, and a wide variety of expressive and over-the-top animations. This, coupled with the game's short development time, which was just a bit over a year, is why you see some pretty sparse, basic environments when compared to your Onimushas or Devil May Cries. Using Okami's engine while retaining a locked behind the back camera also presented another problem. It was never really meant to be used this way, which is why you saw behind the curtain every so often. But that was okay. Again, the team wanted to emphasize the wacky post-apocalyptic world and the over-the-top characters which populated it. Gene was not your typical Capcom pro tag, and he didn't even want to be. In fact, none of the characters, from Olivia to Azel and especially Gorilla Mask, felt like your cookie-cutter cast. You get the impression that Mikami and the rest of the staff wanted to poke fun at what was popular at the time, while obviously paying homage to things like Fist of the North Star and JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. <laughs> Thus, crazier and crazier ideas crept into the game, like a musical number, poison chihuahuas, having Mikami's severed head as an in-joke item, a boss that may or may not be a man in a gorilla suit, and all other manner of insanity. Wait, you're not a human, are you? <laughs> Quite the contrary, having limited time and technology was almost freeing to Mikami in a way, compared to the mountain of pressure and hundreds of staff members he had to manage when working on Resident Evil. So while God Hand was not going to be some polished mainstream 20-hour epic, it wasn't meant to be. 
It was just a game that Mikami was having fun making. He felt that since he had produced or directed several high-profile games for Capcom during his tenure there, he had no qualms about spending a bit of their money to make something specifically for himself. Cut to E3 2006, where God Hand was first shown to the public with a playable demo. A demo that focused on gameplay and didn't contain any cutscenes, so lots of people didn't quite know what to make of it yet, especially when you factor in the difficulty. It's not a simple arcade beat-em-up you can just coast through, but rather a hard-as-nails combat experience where you have to have situational awareness at all times, as well as maximizing all of your abilities. Just bashing the attack button over and over would only get you so far. And when I say so far, I mean getting you fucking dead. You are dead! Not a big surprise! It's been reported that when Clover saw people's reaction to the humor the demo did contain, that they decided to inject more into it, but I can confidently say that's not the case. God Hand released in mid-September of 2006, and E3 was in May, and when you add in the lead-up time to manufacturing and shipping, well, that doesn't really make much sense. You need to be content complete that close to launch, so the humor and attitude couldn't have been some last-minute change based on feedback. They would have needed to call in the voice actors for another round of recording, as well as the QA department working overtime to test anything new, and that's simply way more work than was feasible in two short months. It's just not how traditional game development goes, especially back in 2006, an era totally bereft of the day one patch. Mikami, in that 2020 interview I mentioned earlier, also made no illusions about how he felt God Hand was going to fare at retail, joking with a staff member, if everything goes wrong, we might sell 100,000 copies, making light of the game's chances. So when it very much didn't sell that amount, he was actually probably relieved. Now, while most of you might assume it was some type of massive mega bomb, that wasn't actually the case, at least in Japan. It would go on to sell 60,000 copies, which was higher than a Naba was predicting, as he felt they would have been lucky to sell even half that. So, in terms of a quick additional project that was made on the cheap, it did alright. And while numbers in the West were never released, we can safely assume they weren't much better. Advertising was pretty minimal, as you'd probably expect, but no one can deny that striking box art. Originally, both the Japanese and American versions were supposed to be more graphic, with the fist clearly coming out of the back of the head, but this was nixed by Capcom Marketing. Try to act surprised. Aside from having a less cooler cover, what probably didn't help God Hand's chances was the infamous IGN review, you know I was gonna bring it up, which slapped Mikami's latest with a 3 out of 10 that'll probably be remembered until this flaming planet of pollution and regret we live on explodes in a celestial firestorm. Now, what surprised me while researching for this video is the lack of any other major review outlets that were nearly as harsh. The, the lowest one I can easily fine is a 6 out of 10 from Game Informer. Everyone else was pretty positive, or at the very least, fair. I had assumed, just based on memory, that God Hand was received very divisively at the time of its release, with several other sites agreeing with IGN's scorching take, uh, but no. Regardless, Mikami didn't actually care about the game's critical reception. Again, he wanted to make something unique for a very specific audience, so it could have received a million 3 out of 10s, it wouldn't really have mattered to him. In fact, years later, when Platinum was showing off Vanquish at a press event in Tokyo, Mikami thought he'd have a bit of fun. He asked the crowd at the event, through a translator, Is there anybody here from IGN? Me, said a nearby member of the press. Uh, yeah, thanks for that God Hand review. Which produced a sensible chuckle from the crowd. You should consider a change in careers. Now, there's still this stigma around God Hand due to both the IGN review and the sad fact that one month after its release, Clover as a studio was disbanded. There's a variety of reasons for this, with one of the main ones being that Okami simply didn't move enough units to justify keeping their doors open. So for God Hand, well, it just happened to come out at not the best time in the world, as the decision to shutter Clover was probably already in motion. 
you all know the rest. Clover broke up and went platinum, while Mikami would eventually form Tango Gameworks. Although, I'm gonna be honest, I'm getting increasingly worried about Ghostwire Tokyo. As for God Hand, well, nowadays, it's looked upon very fondly as a unique example from a creative mind that was doing whatever the hell it wanted. And oh, isn't that cute? IGN even re-reviewed it, which is quite a pointless and hollow gesture that accomplishes absolutely nothing. But well, whatever, that wasn't the point. Mikami was tired and was burnt out on working on the same thing for more than a decade. Thus, he cited God Hand as the one thing he made exactly the way he wanted, warts and all. He wasn't ordered to make it accessible, shoe in a multiplayer mode, or whatever. He just wanted to make a dumb, unique thing for himself, and was one of the last examples of Capcom publishing a dumb, unique thing. An era that sorely missed today. Yeah, I just had to find a way to leave out on a bummer there. Oh hey, if you know of any other misunderstood miscreants in the video game or motion picture industries, let me know in the comments below, over on my Twitter, or punch your way into the Flophouse VIP Patreon to nominate what you'd want to see in the future. See you next time, and thanks for watching! My arm, my arm, my arm, my arm, my arm, my arm, I summon up the powers of the God Hand! Welcome to another jump punishing, projectile parrying, and tornado DDT episode of What Happened, a show that takes a look at video games, both great and less great, but all with troubled development cycles. I gotta get that out there to try and cut off the amount of what Street Fighter 3 that that game's the sickest. Why would it be on your awful show? I totally get it. If you say Street Fighter 3 to anyone who's grown up with Capcom over the last two decades, they'll nod wistfully while humming beats, but beats, but beats, beats in your head. This is because the CPS3 Stunner and its upgraded versions are looked back on as all-time classics nowadays, which is a stark contrast to the mid and late 90s where Street Fighter 3 was considered a huge financial bomb for Capcom and the arcade business in general. And not only that, it went through a long, protracted development that had numerous twists and turns. Remember, it was going to be a follow-up to the most popular fighting game of the age, and while you'd think there would have been a solid plan put into place to guide such an important project, this is Capcom, who has had a history of things sometimes going off the rails. <coughs> So, it's for these reasons why Street Fighter 3 is now on our stage. And with that, I think you'll all agree... Yeah, that makes sense! So tighten your headbands and rip off your muscle shirts. It's time to find out what happened to Street Fighter 3. Prepare for battle. If you were not alive from 1991 onwards, quick recap. Street Fighter 2 was the biggest thing in the world as it essentially birthed the modern fighting game and reinvigorated the arcade industry with a model that placed emphasis on competitive play. Yeah, there were other combative arcade games before, but let's be real, none of them were Street Fighter. Hey yo, Buzz, Kato, and other guy, did, did you get out of here? This boom caused Capcom's arcade output to double and then triple, spurring them to split off their workforce into various teams who would all make fighting games all at the same time. There were the X-Men, and then the Marvel titles, Darkstalkers, the expected Street Fighter 2 updates, and finally the Alpha series. But there were also the 3D efforts like Star Gladiator, Techromancer, Power Stone, and Rival Schools. And then there was JoJo, Red Earth, Muscle Bomber, Cyberbots, and tons more I'm probably forgetting. Suffice to say, the arcade division was getting burned out working on so much punching and kicking, and with each team spread out amongst so many franchises, an actual Street Fighter 3 wasn't even being considered. This is because much of the original Street Fighter 2 staff had moved over to the Alpha Slash Zero series, which they were very committed to continually polish and update. The story of Street Fighter 3 therefore spawns from a completely different Street Fighter-less source. 
Tomoshi Satomoto, who had done design work on Capcom's fantasy fair like Magic Sword, King of Dragons, and D&D, was given a small team to create a new, try to be surprised, fighting game in 1994. Not only that, it was scheduled to use Capcom's in-development CPS3 arcade hardware, a board that was meant to push 2D animation to its absolute limit. Satomoto was still quite keen on myths and legends and had originally planned for this project to take place in a more fantastical world. At the time, the game was known under its temp name of New Generation, simply because it was going to be a brand new IP. The problem, however, was that Satomoto and his team didn't have any experience whatsoever making fighting games, and therefore struggled for almost a year with the design process, as well as trying to come to grips with a brand new advanced arcade board, and that wasn't even the half of it. Up until that point, Capcom had one to two producers who were overseeing the entirety of their in-development lineup, and would work on all of them at regular intervals. By the mid-90s though, games were being greenlit faster than they were being finished, so the Capcom bigwigs hired an outside consulting firm, who advised them that every project should have their own producer, which would help mitigate the workload. Now, while that seems completely reasonable, it meant that Satomoto was promoted to to producer and was therefore the only one in charge of the game, which in turn was why it was floundering. So with New Generation without a main director slash designer, it was going nowhere fast, and many outside staffers thought it wouldn't be long before it got KO'd off of Capcom's developmental slate. While the team got a much needed boost in staff in 1995, it still wasn't enough for them to hone in on a concrete design and concept. So it was here where it was suggested that New Generation should turn into a street fight as a possible way to salvage it. Now while this suggestion came from Akira Akiman Yasuda, the idea of it actually becoming Street Fighter 3 was still up in the air. If you've been paying attention for the last three years, you might recall... Alan maintained that yes, in those early talks with Capcom, it was being thrown around that the game would be called Street Fighter 3. That's right, Capcom were actually debating putting that lofty, number 3 shaped crown on a few potential projects, with New Generation finally winning out in the end. That's great news, General. Congratulations! On the contrary, I mourn. Okay. However, as we all know, heavy is the head that wears the crown, so for a game made by a new, inexperienced team to suddenly inherit such a prestigious sequel name meant the pressure was very much on. Fortunately, that's precisely when... Here comes a new challenger! An experienced staff member finally joined the team. In an interview with Matt Leone for his amazing written series Street Fighter and Oral History, Capcom Shinichiro Obata recalled, By the time I came around, the team didn't really have a very clear concept of what to do with the game. They had created a lot of animation patterns, and they wanted the hits to feel like they had a real heft behind them, to make it look cool when you took damage. But the problem was the team had no idea what kind of mechanics should go into the game in order to make it an interesting fighting game. There was no plan for that, and there weren't enough moves for each character. So I ended up joining the team when the game was in that kind of state. Obata came from Darkstalkers and had a solid mind for fighting games, so he was an indispensable addition. However, the complexity of working on the CPS3 hardware was still slowing down development, but once things started to wrap up on Red Earth, Capcom's first CPS3 game, more people were able to join the new generation team and or share their expertise. Speaking of which, New Generation was kept as the subtitle, as it also referenced the fact that they were wiping the Street Fighter slate clean rather than cycling in the same core characters over and over and over again. This was similar to the approach that was used on the first alpha, allowing Capcom's creators to either drastically redesign old characters or make completely new ones. Street Fighter 3 was going for much of the same thing, just going way, way harder, as even Ryu wasn't originally planned to be included at all. Lovable New Yorker meathead Alex was being positioned as the new main hero, which explains why he's given so much prominence in the game's attract sequence. We live back at Coney Island with this dickhead! Show some respect to this boot right here. There we go! There we go! 
Ah! Capcom second-guessed this move, however, as they were worried about potential backlash over a lineup without a single familiar face, so the Eternal Warrior was added to the ranks. The team then second-guessed that again deep into development, feeling that the roster was still on the paltry side, so welcome to the new generation, Mr. Masters! Also, they were able to just recycle a lot of reused animation frames, so that's pretty much how Ken got in. Ah yes, animation. Street Fighter 3 was going to have more of it than any other 2D fighting game at the time, which, while an incredible artistic goal, was a costly one. Internally, within Capcom, there was worry that Street Fighter 3's ballooning price tag was becoming untenable, and with the way the industry was moving towards 3D, times were such that it was going to release to a marketplace that most likely had moved on. In an oral history, Capcom USA's Chris Kramer explained those concerns. At that point, the Street Fighter brand was kind of in a rocky place. You know, sales hadn't been good on the latest home versions. The US arcade market was dying, and everybody was looking at what was happening on PlayStation and Saturn. They were like, okay, 3D games, this is the future. And Capcom was leaning in way hard on traditional 2D animation with Street Fighter 3. So it was like, okay, this looks great, but it looks like more Street Fighter. It was hard to say whether I thought it would be successful. I think my initial feedback was, it looks amazing. I was then told, oh, this will be CPS 3, so we'll have all new arcade hardware. They'll never be able to do this for the PlayStation. It won't be able to do all the animation correctly. The arcade guys always wanted to make the ultimate arcade experience, even though realistically the line was like, hey, put it out in the arcades, it gets popular, and then six, eight months later, it comes home, and then the sales explode from there. He ain't lying. Street Fighter 2 sold over 6 million copies on just the Super Nintendo version alone, and that was a potential problem with Street Fighter 3's long-term profitability. No home console at that time would have been able to handle it. Hell, the PlayStation struggled to run certain CPS2 games with all the animation intact, so what chance did Elena's idle animation have? With six months left to go in the game's development, the team got some much-needed additions in terms of staff, including Alpha 2 alum, designer Hidetoshi Neoji Ishizawa, who helped refine and polish Street Fighter 3's parry system. Super Arts and Super Canceling were also last-minute additions that the team worked hard to include, and while that might seem strange due to Super Attacks having been around since Super Turbo, it was another example of the team's slow, kinda unconfident design phase. The thing is, there was so much pressure from within the company and from other teams because this was Street Fighter 3, right? You know, this was the sequel or what came after the legendary Street Fighter 2, so there was just no way this game would be allowed to fail, and the team themselves, they were feeling that pressure, but they also felt the sense of obligation to complete what they were trying to do. There was a lot of indecisiveness, there was a lot of back and forth discussion on what to do, and eventually they figured it out. Yeah, maybe we should do this, this, and that, so it took a lot of time for the team to gather its bearings. Unfortunately, despite that passion, when Street Fighter 3, or just 3 machines started arriving in arcades across the world, apathy was at an all-time high. It hit the scene right in the middle of the releases of two lavish 3D blockbusters that were also on their third iterations, namely Virtual Fighter and Tekken, which were attracting crowds no matter what side of the globe you were on. What's worse is that the fighting game Limelight not only had to be shared with these cutting-edge 3D slugfests, but also with other competition like Marvel Super Heroes vs. Street Fighter, Darkstalkers 3, and everything from SNK. New generations stuck out, but not exactly in a good way. Players would put in a quarter and see Ken and Ryu flanked by a bunch of newcomers, or freaks, as they were not so affectionately called. The game, due to its origins and how the new team had made it, also felt very different when compared to the likes of the Street Fighter 2 or Alpha series. It was slower and more strategic, whereas almost every other Capcom game in the arcades revolved around insane combos, team-up attacks, and other flashy shit. 
To casual players, it seemed like every other game was all about offering more moves and bigger rosters, whereas Street Fighter 3 seemed like a step back. Less characters, less options for your supers, less dimensions, and less familiarity. It was basically going against all the arcade trends of the day. So it's because of this that in terms of cabinets sold, New Generation was an unmitigated disaster. And, and, and I know I throw that term around a lot on this show, but it really actually was. The initial version of Street Fighter 3 saw shockingly low sales. I remember seeing the numbers and just being really surprised at how the game just wasn't selling. It felt like we created the worst selling game ever at Capcom. It felt awful. The first run of orders for Street Fighter 3 reportedly hovered at around 1,000 machines. To put that into perspective, the original Final Fight had sold 30,000 and SF2 Turbo 75. In an oral history, several former Capcom employees debated this number, but the general consensus was is that it sold incredibly poorly. So that, coupled with the high price tag of the CPS3 board and Street Fighter 3's overall development costs, which were just over 1 billion yen or 8 million dollars, still very high for a 90s fighting game, that new generation failed to ever turn a profit. Of course, a good chunk of this had to do with the sudden downfall of the arcade business in general, because as a principal revenue source, it was quickly being replaced with home consoles. Why drive or take a bus to the arcade to play Tekken 3 that doesn't even have Gone when you can stay at home and experience an even better version that does have Gone? Speaking of arcade ports, there is another reason why New Generation was such a huge blow to Capcom financially. It took almost four years for a home port to be released. Street Fighter 3 Double Impact was a Dreamcast exclusive that launched in Japan at the end of 1999 and mid-2000 in the rest of the world. While it had plenty of value as it packed in two games, by that time the Dreamcast was already fading in much of the world and Double Impact was made further redundant when a port of Third Strike came out that following October. Ah yes, the revisions. Second Impact, Giant Attack, was released just a few months after New Generation in the arcades, and it added two new characters, Hugo and Yurian, and threw Akuma in there as a bonus. While seen as a marked improvement, it didn't really move the needle much in terms of getting people to actually play it. Neo G, for his part, was seen as a standout member of the team, and was then given further control leading into the release of the next and last revision, Third Strike Fight for the Future. Despite all the system-wide improvements and additions, Third Strike was still criticized for its bizarre new challengers like 12 and Q, and while many applauded the return of Chun-Li and her body yaddy yaddy, Alpha 3 cabinets would still see the lion's share of Capcom fans' quarters. Obata estimated that when you combined all three versions as well as the home ports, Street Fighter 3 eventually dragged itself over the line of profitability by the end, which is still kinda not what Capcom bigwigs wanted to hear. Remember, this was supposed to be the direct sequel to their biggest arcade hit of the 90s. Every iteration of Street Fighter 2 had been leading up to this. So when it wasn't a success, changes were therefore coming to Capsule Computer's business strategy, and Street Fighter 3's failure was a big part as to why. Former Capcom USA CEO Bill Gardner had this to say about the massive decline for the arcade division. When Street Fighter 3 came out, the home console business was starting to really take off. I mean, really take off. And so, when we made our monthly reports in Japan, we go over and I'm reporting on a multi-million seller on home console, right? And Coinop was saying, well, we sold 450 units this month or something like that, you know? And Capcom Japan CEO Kenzo Sujimoto was just, he was beside himself. He was convinced they weren't working and he wasn't quite in touch with the revolution that was taking place. So it wasn't long before those sweeping changes swept across Capcom. Arcade teams were moved onto consoles and were told to either sink or swim. If you'd like to see an example of them very much sinking, check out my Devil May Cry 2 episode. 
As the new millennium dawned, Capcom made less and less fighters until they were almost completely phased out by 2001, but in the years following that, the general opinion on Street Fighter 3, Third Strike specifically, slowly began to change. This was helped greatly by Japanese players showing off what the game could offer and just how hype it could be. It was different, yes, and if you wanted someone that played exactly like a Rose, Blanca, or Honda, you're kinda shit out of luck. But if you looked past the freaks and acclimatized to the systems and game speed, you found a very deep, very fighting rich experience thanks to all the tweaks and improvements that the team tried to squeeze in. Of course, we can't forget the huge part that the early editions of EVO played in this movement, especially certain uh, milestone moments in fighting game history. Oh hey, that's me! So throughout the 2000s, Third Strike began to accrue this reputation as an underrated masterpiece that was not fully appreciated in its day, as it originally came out during a time where the industry was starting to shy away from fighting games. Now, bearing the Dreamcast version, the game never got a port on anything outside of Japan until 2005 with the Street Fighter Anniversary Collection, and later in 2011, Iron Galaxy's sublime Third Strike Online Edition, which should be re-released! This is not the first or the last time I will ask about this, Capcom! Nowadays, Third Strike is often seen by many as the pinnacle of the Street Fighter franchise, from its tactile, meaty feel to its graphics and animation, down to every minutia of its gameplay. But goddamn, did it take a long time to get there. It's really amazing that it started out as a completely separate franchise that was never intended to be the next evolution of Street Fighting, and it's mind-boggling to think about all the paths not taken. Capcom could have just kept running the Alpha series into the ground until it petered out. Uh, they could have had their own 3D teams make a big lavish sequel, and finally, my favorite, the exploding life bars and slam mastering of SF the movie could have been Street Fighter 3. Just speaking for myself though, in a way I'm glad that Street Fighter 3 had to persevere and fight for the respect that it eventually earned. We'll leave on Obata's words regarding what the team were striving for. You know, there are many different approaches you can take to game design. One approach, which we took in Street Fighter 3, is to design your game around unanswerables. I think with any game, players will search for the best tactic, the best strategy, like if X happens then you should always do Y, if you do this here you'll always win. There's competitive games like that where the match is essentially a confrontation of theoretical knowledge that each player has built up. But Street Fighter 3 is a game that, by design, doesn't have a fixed answer to those questions. There is no best tactic. You can spend your whole life trying to find the perfect theoretical approach to a situation in SF3, but it will never be quite right. You always have to be reading your opponent in the moment. You can't just fall back on your theories. It's a game that lets you search for answers forever. Man, that's some deep ass shit. If you know of any other fighting games that were fraught with failure, let me know in the comments below, over on my Twitter, or Tatsumaki into the offices of the Flophouse VIP Patreon and become a big boss to nominate what I'll be flash chopping in a future episode. See you next time and thanks for watching. Select the one to fight with, get it on. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six. Pick and choose the right one, get it on. Five, four, three, two, one, yeah. Select the one to fight with, get it on. Hey kids, it's time for what happened! Uh, the show that chronicles the video game and movie industries with uh, stories of I can't even uh, th This started off way too depressing Whose idea was it to use the moonshot as a cold open? Mega Man Legends 3 is uh, yeah There's a lot of feelings associated with this one and thanks to Emily down at the Flophouse VIP Patreon We are finally cracking open this energy tank of emotions Are you okay Mega Man? I hate my birthday if you were cruising along the information superhighway circa 2011, you were probably aware of the cancellation heard around the world. 
Mega Man fans, Legends one specifically, had been waiting for a conclusion to the cliffhanger ending of 2000's Mega Man Legends 2 for a decade. So when Capcom finally announced their intention to resurrect this spin-off of the Mega Man universe, yeah, no, not that universe, that's a whole, we'll, we'll get to that. Well, the world came together in celebration. Finally, there would be some type of resolution, some type of closure to Volnut's tragic fate. But just as this newfound joy and optimism had begun to burn, it was just as quickly extinguished. Which led to a whole lot of, uh, displeasure. In fact, 2010 and 2011 were pretty bad years for the Blue Bomber in general, as two other projects centering around the little guy were also cancelled, and it all circles back to one man, good old Papa Inafune. So check your circuits and prime your busters, it's time to find out what happened to Mega Man Legends 3. Here we go! In the late 2000s, digital downloadable games are starting to take off, with Mega Man leading the charge. Uh, yeah, kinda. Sure, he was no longer getting any blockbuster AAA releases, but 8-bit throwbacks Mega Man 9 and 10 at least springboarded him back into the conversation. Now, while 10 retreaded much of the same ground and was subsequently reviewed lower and sold less than 9, it at least seemed like the franchise would continue humming along. Underneath the blue armor, though, that wasn't exactly the case. Inafune had hit Capcom's glass ceiling at that point, having quickly grown frustrated with the global head of production position he had been promoted to in early 2010. Not only that, some of his initiatives, like Capcom's big push into more Western-style games, started generating more misses than hits. Now, some of the following information throughout this video was imparted to me from a source with some knowledge of the goings-on at Capcom at the time, but something everyone knew was that Mega Man was more or less Inafune's baby. Mama. He had started producing the entire series in 1996, and thus became associated with it more than any other staff member at Capcom. So, using the success of the new 8-bit games as a launching pad, he decided to set up three drastically different projects within Capcom that would hopefully propel the Blue Bomber into further prominence. There was, of course, Legends 3, the aforementioned Mega Man universe, and finally, the never officially announced, but nevertheless very real, Maverick Hunter, a Western-flavored first-person shooter set in a rebooted X continuity, I think? Which was being developed by Armature, who were composed of former members of Retro Studios. Which raises a pertinent question. What is taking so long? It was a big gamble, launching three very different titles, all under the same series umbrella, but since Inafune had been given the power to do so, he decided to flex. As 2010 wore on, though, he and the higher-ups on the corporate level of Capcom had some type of disagreement. Rumors about the issue ranged from fallout regarding the increasing failures from the Western push, to Inafune seeking more autonomy within the company and then being denied. Regardless of the reason, the fact was he was gone, and any of the games he was in charge of were left pretty rudderless. This all went down in late October of 2010, a mere month after Legends 3 was formally announced at a Nintendo 3DS-centered press conference. With Inafune being the long-standing producer of Mega Man, this obviously raised some red flags within the community, but fortunately, the Legends 3 team clarified that development would indeed continue. Don't worry, it won't take very long. Now, as admirable as that statement was, it wasn't exactly the most realistic scenario in the world because it doesn't matter if it's 2022 or 1992, if a franchise doesn't have someone in power who can champion it, it's unlikely to get very far. With Inafune gone, one or more of these Mega Man games were getting the axe, but Legends 3 had something the other two lacked, nostalgia. It was a long-awaited sequel to a cherished spin-off series, a known quantity when compared to, say, Universe, which befuddled many as to what it actually was. Having this type of fervor, though, is both an advantage and a curse. Yeah, you have a built-in fan base, but if anything goes wrong, which it sometimes tends to do, then there's going to be a certain level of backlash, the type that only slighted Capcom fans can conjure. 
Aside from all that, there was one more caveat to Legends 3, a very specific chain that was clasped around its neck, that being the Dev Room, an interesting, ahead of its time and misguided idea that was meant to bring fans closer to the development of the game. Remember, this is 2010, years before things like Patreon and Kickstarter, which were designed around the idea of taking in fan feedback and input and then applying it to creative endeavors. Reportedly, this was something instituted by Inafune at the start of the project, as he was well aware of just how invested fans were in the Legends franchise. The Dev Room was a website slash forum, essentially, where fans would be able to vote in polls about visual designs, speak to developers in Q&A sessions, and be able to more closely track the team's progress. As you can imagine though, since this was such a new and experimental idea, that they hadn't yet worked out all the kinks, unforeseen challenges, or even thought about it all that much. The problem with the dev room was twofold. Game development requires big lead-up times, as certain decisions need to be made far in advance so other departments can work around them. Think about any Kickstarters you might have contributed to in the past, how many emails get sent out requiring users to update their info or to get back in touch with the dev team, and that's when actual financial backing is involved. So imagine then allowing tons of random users to dictate things on a message board for free with no centralized planning and then telling a relatively new and leaderless dev team to just make it work. Unless you plan it out very meticulously, it's not going to be a realistic or time-sensitive way to build a video game, especially when Capcom bigwigs were already shooting stink eyes at the project. Polls for character designs and such therefore became less and less frequent, which caused that initial burst of fan enthusiasm to start to wane. This was the second issue. The number of active users in the dev room steadily went down month by month, which is kinda to be expected and not a knock against the fan base. As time goes on, audience retention levels will naturally decline, as you can't assume everyone is going to be glued to their seats every single day, especially if there isn't anything of note going on that week with development. Remember, this type of social interaction was relatively new and wasn't expertly planned out, so eventually people just kinda wanted to play the game to get the product in their hands. It's just how we've been taught to consume media. What Capcom didn't impart to these fans, however, was that the dev room was intrinsically linked to the survival of Mega Man Legends 3. Allow me to explain. We all know about the Capcom test, quick basic ports of older titles to gauge interest in future ones. Do you want a new Darkstalkers? Buy this and then we'll talk. Want more Onimusha? Can I interest you in an hors d'oeuvre first? For all intents and purposes, the Legends 3 dev room was the new Capcom test. It would closely monitor the interest over time, and if numbers started to dip, well, then unpleasant decisions would need to be made. The situation was even worse than that though, because Legends 3 was also on thin ice due to it being an Inafune thing, and it wasn't very far along development anyway, so losses could be easily cut. Now, as far as I can find, the team behind the game wasn't running into any technological or design problems per se, aside from maybe just being understaffed and underfunded. It's just that Volnut's return was conceived and announced under false pretenses. Despite being revealed at that Nintendo 3DS event, the game was never, I repeat, never officially greenlit for full production. Oh, Capcom announced that it was in the works and if everything went well it might see an eventual release, but it was never locked in. Usually, like, 90... 99% of games get announced after they've been officially greenlit, but for some reason, most likely at Inafune's insistence, it was decided to just skip that part? That's right! You've got it! Here's what the game's director, Mazukazu Iguchi, had to say in early 2011. 
On February 22nd, we've got a company meeting where we will submit Legends 3 to undergo the green lighting approval process. At Capcom, you have to spend the first few months of a project creating a sample build, then show it to various people and await their approval. We've been working away trying to get that sample as good as we can, and now is a crucial time for us. You've all cooperated with us in getting this far, so we've got to get this project approved. If we don't, we'll have missed the boat and we won't be able to proceed with the next next phase. Considering the show you're watching, it shouldn't be a surprise that we're not allowed to proceed into that next phase. I don't understand. Now, Talking Brass Tax here, as loved as it is, the Legend series was not a blockbuster, selling less than the mainline Mega Man titles of back in the day, which were selling even less than Capcom's horror action upper echelon. Now, if we fast forward to 2011, 3DS development was brand new and not exactly cheap, so the project was 100% powered by the goodwill and positive vibes of a small but passionate fan base. There were very few people at Capcom who had any illusions that this was going to be a big money spinner. And if you thought the quote from that director was bad, well, things got even worse the very next month. Mega Man Universe had its plug pulled after months of literal silence, and while Capcom never shared any details as to why, its strange premise and lack of a prominent producer to champion it was the most likely reason. And as for Maverick Hunter, that was quietly cancelled way back in 2010 despite making it to a playable prototype. It was deemed too expensive and too much of a radical shift in source material, and thus was subsequently deleted. Warning signs were blaring throughout the Mega Man community at the universe cancellation, and they were right to do so. Now, since Legends 3 failed to get the green light, the team had one final Hail Mary play, which was the Mega Man Legends 3 prototype version. This was pitched as a more convincing way to prove to the higher ups that the fan base was there and that the game could be a viable seller. It was essentially a vertical slice, a chunk of the game that was meant to show off what the team was shooting for and pretty much much was the bulk of what they had developed so far. It was announced in April with a vague release date of soon, but was also being advertised as a paid digital download, not something everyone embraced warmly. May 2011 then rolled around with no updates until it was announced that the prototype was being delayed to an unspecified point in the future, and that's where it remained. Now, reportedly, Capcom higher-ups wanted to see some serious numbers for this demo, with 300,000 downloads being thrown around as the target, and this would not surprise me, because Capcom was all about insane, unrealistic sales forecasts around this time, something we've covered before. Now, that 300k estimate largely hinged on one thing, the success of the 3DS itself, but the March launch of that machine wasn't what many were expecting. In fact, the first few years of the handheld's life lagged behind its mighty predecessor in terms of sales, due to the higher than normal price point and the rise of mobile gaming. So on top of everything else, the platform Legends 3 was being designed for was sputtering out the gate, and then when you factor in that the demo was going to be download only, another barrier of entry, well, mathematically, the math just wasn't mathing. Nintendo 3DS owners would need to adopt an insanely high attach rate of buying games to even come close to Capcom's projections, something they would not achieve. Now, would you like to hear my own personal perspective? No! Well, I was at Capcom's 2011 Captivate press event, which took place in May of 2011, and while there were oodles of journalists lining up to play Street Fighter Cross Tekken, Resident Evil Mercenaries 3D, and Dragon's Dogma, Legends 3 was represented by a singular kiosk flanked by a cardboard standee with a computer that was logged into the dev room forum. That's when I was all like... <laughs> this whole situation with the prototype put everyone in an awkward position. Release the demo, it doesn't sell very well, and even more vitriol would spew about the game's inevitable cancellation. Now, I know what you're thinking. 
Why not just release it? Who cares? Maybe it could have sold what they were expecting. While has already stated, Capcom was hardcore into sales forecasts and mitigating all possible risks. It was just how they operated. Whenever they did try to do something different, it was often met with disappointing sales numbers. So in this instance, it was felt that it would be less damaging overall if they cut the whole Mega Man Legends 3 experiment off at the knees. Thus, two months later in July, they made it official. Legends 3 was cancelled, and neither the full game nor the prototype was going to be released. While Capcom of Japan and USA remained as tight-lipped as possible, it was Capcom's European Twitter account where the flames of fury were further fanned. I'm sad to know Legends 3 was cancelled for 3DS. Someone making decisions at Capcom's R&D HQ should get fired. Unfortunately, so few fans took part in the creation of the game. It was felt the project was not worthwhile. Now, show any social media manager this tweet today and they'd also go... <laughs> it's not a good look to imply a game's failure to release was because of the apathy of fans, but the fact was, the tweet wasn't technically wrong, just poorly worded. I say this because, as we've already discussed, the dev room was the Capcom test, connected to the game's critical circuitry in a symbiotic way. It's just that Mega Man Legends fans were never given these schematics. This then created a sort of the vortex of death for Mega Man and Mega Man related projects. The final robo nail in the robo coffin. Uh, again. As mentioned earlier, without a senior creative head to protect franchises like these, they tend to fall to the wayside, like so many already have. This particular situation made it so that the rank and file of Capcom staff were hesitant to even utter the name Mega Man slash Rockman out loud, which is why it took a further seven years for it to be revived with Mega Man 11. That game's producer, Kazuhiro Tsuchiya, didn't shy away from discussing this. As I'm sure you're well aware, Inafune-san departed a long while ago. Obviously, a lot of other people were working on Mega Man at the time, and there were a lot of people within the company that had a strong desire to make a new Mega Man, but it was very difficult. The atmosphere just didn't feel right for anybody to raise their hand and say, I want to be the person that makes the next Mega Man. This was kind of the general atmosphere for a long while. It was a big reason why there was a long absence for a new Mega Man game. Unfortunately, it's been another four years since Mega Man 11, and there's still not much else going on with our favorite robotic killing machine. We did get some great legacy collections, there's always a new Netflix show or a weird movie being announced then cancelled, I'm not sure. And as of 2020, Capcom has refiled for the trademarks of The Misadventures of Tronbon and Rockman Dash, so that's something? Nah, it's probably not. Why spend money making a new Mega Man, Okami, or Strider when you can just slap a skin into Monster Hunter, I guess? Now, modern Capcom doesn't do everything right. Plenty of people have had plenty to say about how frustrating it's been to see them release games, as good as they are, but through a very narrow scope, while routinely ignoring a lot of their legacy franchises. While I do believe they made some positive changes since 2010, I'm gonna throw over to former Capcom Unity manager Gregaman, who had this to say about what the company learned from the whole debacle. Obviously, this quote is very idealistic, the uh, shareholders think very differently, but it's really the only positive thing I could find to end on. We as a publisher learn valuable lessons about the role the community can, should, and will, by any means necessary, play. In my mind, the dev room marked an evolution of our still fledgling community initiative. A milestone lesson learned and taken to heart. How lucky am I that I started my career here by helming the craziest, weirdest, most volatile experiment ever ventured by this department. MML3 realigned our compass, and whether you know it or not, you've all had an impact on Capcom. It is my hope that in time, this will lead to decisions that will bring happiness to each and every one of you. So yeah, that's a very nice thing to say, but we are now in 2022 and are not living through some golden age of Mega Man titles or even a lot of classic Capcom IP at all, which is obviously a... God damn it, I ended on a downer again!
If you know of any other regrettable robotic wrecks, let me know in the comments below, over on my Twitter, or jump and shoot into the capsule that is the Flophouse VIP Patreon, become a big boss, and nominate a game or movie I'll cover in a future episode. See you next time, and thanks for watching! Welcome back to What Happened. You know the deal, this is a show, I host it, and we spend entirely too much time on Capcom. While they have a stable packed with the greatest video game franchises of all time, in the late 2000s their high peaks were also often followed by deep valleys, and honestly, there are a few valleys as deep as 2009's Spyborgs. Wait, what? You say? A Capcom action game I've never heard of? Well, guess what? That's why it's on this show. What is that? Spyborgs was a Wii exclusive, an extreme case of identity crisis. This is the story of a freshly birthed studio struggling to get a new IP off the ground, running into conflicts with their publisher, and ultimately having their game get released unfinished, to the undulating sounds of absolute apathy. Pretty much tailor-made for this show, huh? So, uh... Prime your board bits, and I, I don't remember any other weapons or items from this game I can reference here, so yeah, what happened to Spyborgs? What the hell happened? It's 2008, and Capcom's yearly Captivate press event is kicking off, and while they mostly showcased updates on known titles, there was one that was brand new, the aforementioned Borgs that were spies. This was the debut title from new startup Bionic, no relation to Commando Games. Located in North Hollywood, they boasted staff from all over the state of California. Folks from Insomniac, High Impact Games, Blizzard, Never Saw, Treyarch. If you were a major studio in California at the time, there's a good chance someone had just jumped ship over to Bionic. In the game's first trailer, Spyborgs is presented as a wacky Saturday morning superhero game featuring radical skateboarders, robotic ninjas, and a fun, self-aware sense of humor. In it, you'd pick from the cast of five Spyborg protagonists and battle a rival team of villains. The heroes included Stinger, Bouncer, Clandestine, Kinetic, and Voxel. D I mean Voxel! Yeah, that's better. Between the main action levels, players would be treated to playable mini-games, which used the framing device of commercials that played during a block of Saturday morning cartoons. These interludes would revolve around Wii Remote-centric motion controls, apparently inspired by games like Zack and Wiki as a fun way to shake things up. Press were unfortunately not able to go hands-on with Spyborgs at the event, as Capcom opted for a hands-off demonstration, and the only media that was released to the public were these screenshots seen here, and a trailer that was very light on gameplay. And none of these things went down too well with the Capcom faithful. What is that? What the fuck is that? They're a publisher arguably most well-known for their action games, so when Spyborgs, a wacky American pastiche of Saturday morning cartoons, was presented, there was, how shall I put this slightly, noxious vitriol spewed in its direction. The rough visuals and humor drew wide criticism from fans who, frankly, had different expectations of what a Capcom game should be. The now defunct Capcom Unity forums RIP, were ablaze with complaints, but one can only wonder how the response would have been if they had known the game's true beginnings. In an interview with Nintendo World Report, former Capcom producer Daryl Allison explained, When Capcom crossed paths with Spyborgs, we were originally checking out a different concept. As the story goes, we saw some hero concept art on a wall and we were intrigued. We wanted to know more about those characters and their world. The more Capcom learned about Spyborgs and the development team behind it, we knew we found our match. This original concept art was most likely early work on a title codenamed Team Alpha Go, a super spy cartoon inspired action game aimed primarily at a younger audience. Bionic had apparently made a lot of progress on Team Alpha Go, like planning a wide variety of different gameplay types and minigames, but Capcom had reservations about the direction of the game and so wanted a new name. So Team Alpha Go would be rebranded as Spyborgs. 
nonetheless, after the lukewarm reception to Captivate's Spyborg's uh, blowout, the game would skip E3 entirely and Capcom would start to get very, very quiet. Behind the scenes, they went back to Bionic, asking for what was essentially a complete reboot. They wanted a game that felt more Capcom-esque and to aim for a slightly older audience. This led to shifting over to a beat-em-up style, new character designs, a new story with a more serious tone, and the commercial mini-games would also be completely removed as they would no longer fit in with this new direction. Co-op play stayed in, with an added emphasis on dual finishing moves, and even if you were friendless, a co-op partner controlled by the AI would be provided. Stinger, Bouncer, and Clandestine were kept as playable characters, while Kinetic was demoted to a narrative support role, and Voxel, well... Hey, you're gone. With platforming and humor traded in for combat and cinematic special moves, the team were effectively making a completely different game from what they originally had in mind. And with less than a year on their contract's clock, they were running out of time. In a post on Capcom Unity, former Senior Director of Planning and Research Christian Svensson explained why, months after its announcement, Spyborgs had gone dark. You won't see new Spyborgs assets for several more months. We're refining it considerably, pretty much as significant an overhaul as Dark Void underwent from its first announcement to its first big reveal. I have seen a new build recently though, it's coming along nicely. Spyborgs needed to stay on track as it was a project that was being exclusively handled by Capcom USA. Their main Osaka branch had very little to do with the project as they already had their hands full with their own big dumb push into more western style titles. Capcom USA at the time were mostly focused on smaller scale downloadables, Super Turbo HD Remix, Age of Booty, and Commando Wolf of the Battlefield amongst others. So, Spyborgs represented one of, if not the biggest game they had been fully responsible for, so it had to come in on budget and on time. This then might have played a factor into the diminishing relationship between both companies, which became incredibly strained in the last few months of development. This resulted in financial issues for Bionic, with Capcom allegedly delaying milestone payments for reasons that were not made clear to my contact. This came to a head in the lead-up to 2009's E3, where Spyborgs had been scheduled to appear with a fully playable demo. While Bionic were working on said demo, the studio held a meeting where management said that Capcom hadn't paid them in a few months and they were effectively out of money. They asked staff to continue working during the ongoing negotiations for a new contract and according to my source, they may have gone so far as to threaten withholding that E3 demo until Capcom paid up. The finer details of the situation between management and Capcom are still unknown to me, but the Spyborgs demo did materialize at E3, and development on the game continued at Bionic, so it must have worked out to some degree. My source also mentioned that after this point, they felt that the relationship between Capcom and Bionic became even colder than it was before. Publicly, though, the all-new, all-different Spyborgs was first shown in video form at 2009's Captivate event, before fans would get to go hands-on a month later at that E3. Unfortunately, reception to the new version of the game was decidedly mixed. Some felt that it looked much better graphically and appreciated the shift in tone, but ultimately felt that everything looked fairly generic and still wasn't up to the level of Capcom's other action IPs. In regard to the game's history and mid-development reboot, former Capcom producer Daryl Allison stated, Playing to the strengths of the Ratchet and Clank development experience of much of the team, the original concept had more platforming to it to go with some light brawling. Spyborgs has always been a cooperative action game. The more the co-op action took shape, the more fun and promising it proved to be, and so we shifted gears to develop Spyborgs into a full-blown brawler. Originally, we had 10 different gameplay types between the platforming, puzzle solving, and action variations. The game jumped between them and short cutscenes, like a Saturday morning cartoon, and that flow provided the opportunity to set up and pay off humor. That flow also let us insert playable commercials, and with those, the team could go crazy with the humor. We love the commercials. They are awesome, fun, and funny, but they just didn't feel right anymore. 
Unfortunately, what this resulted in was a gameplay experience that wasn't nearly as deep as Devil May Cry and wasn't as impactful or memorable as Capcom's belt-scrolling classics. The only other thing you did outside of smashing robots was sweeping the IR pointer around the screen to find invisible stuff, one of the few instances where the final game actually took advantage of the hardware it had been created for. Once E3 came to a close, Spyborg's next big milestone was to ship by September, a scant few months later. So what did Capcom have planned for promotion? The most charitable way I can describe it is outside the box. Okay, I like it, Picasso. In lieu of magazine or TV, you know, advertisements, there were the online webisodes, which were meant to flesh out the game's backstory, a 13-page comic book produced by Udon, and there wasn't a third thing. Look what I found. Capcom had bigger fish to fry, you see. They had just spent oodles advertising Resident Evil 5 and Bionic Commando. It was understandably becoming an afterthought, and in all honesty, Capcom were probably making the right move by choosing not to focus on it because the fans certainly weren't. The cherry on top of this sloppy cyborg Sunday is the fact that Capcom actually shipped a beta build of Spyborgs to North American shelves, unfinished and incomplete. In 2014, a former staff member of Bionic tweeted about some of the behind-the-scenes details, sharing that in the weeks leading up to delivering the Goldmaster build, Bionic were burning the midnight oil polishing everything they could. The two major things they were focusing on were adjusting the game's difficulty and overhauling the companion AI for co-op. While they were doing this, Capcom had sent an earlier beta build to an unnamed Texas studio that was tasked with fixing all the pre-certification issues that would be required to pass Nintendo's guidelines. Bionic were not made aware of this, and as soon as those required fixes were made, Capcom got that build approved by Nintendo of America instead of waiting for Bionic, and then just shipped it. Those North American copies of Spyborgs that you've all not been playing over the years have unaddressed issues with AI and difficulty balancing. That same build was submitted but rejected by Nintendo of Europe, who required additional fixes, so at the very least, PAL gamers wound up with the final Bionic-approved version. Alongside this mess of a submission process, Capcom suddenly dropped the game's price by $10, less than two months before release, signaling what I can only assume was an unshakable faith in its chances at retail. The Borgs then busted onto store shelves on the 22nd of September in North America, with Australia and Europe getting it on the 25th. It would never be released in Japan. Unfortunately, the competition was fierce. That same month, in the lead-up to Spyborgs, we saw Guitar Hero 5, Muramasa the Demon Blade, Mini Ninjas, and Metroid Prime Trilogy. Then, on the very same day as Spyborgs, Marvel Ultimate Alliance 2 dropped, and for those that owned both a Wii and a 360, the choice was pretty clear, as it was also the launch day for Halo ODST. How bad? <laughs> Not good. Furthermore, the very next week would also see TMNT Smash Up, My Sims Agents, and Dead Space Extraction all heading star shelves. Fortunately, though, when it came to the reviews, it wasn't a much better situation. While some outlets like IGN praised the Borg's graphics and solid mechanics, they criticized its bland world, characters, and admonished the punishing difficulty level. <laughs> Imagine that! <laughs> The game would find itself sitting on a lackluster 66 average on Metacritic, so between the lack of promotion, intense competition, and middling reviews, the Spyborgs were destined for the scrap heap. If the story wasn't weird enough, though, be prepared to suspend your disbelief beyond its natural limits. While finding accurate numbers for any game's lifetime sales data can be tricky, it took a Herculean effort this time around. Capcom never reported any sales data, and in fact, never even used the word Spyborgs in a single published quarterly report. It's like the game never even existed. There ain't no monorail, and there never was. According to leaked NPD data, though, in the 11 days of the track period that it was on sale for, Spyborgs sold less than 600 copies. That's six zero zero. 
The source I spoke to said they felt that this number sounded accurate, theorizing that it probably did wind up selling a couple of thousand units in total, but admitted they never saw official numbers. By the time the Borgs had released, though, Bionic Games were already cutting jobs. They only had just enough money to keep things going for the last few months of development, but when it was clear that the Spyborgs were imploding at retail, they knew there'd be no further checks coming. Their website would quietly, quietly close down sometime in 2011 without so much as a press release or goodbye message. On paper, Capcom teaming up with experienced staff at a fresh studio seemed like it could have been a recipe for success, but it seems the project was mismanaged in a variety of ways and not in line with what Capcom fans wanted. Spyborgs, along with a few other big failures around that era, might be a contributing factor as to why modern Capcom takes very few risks nowadays, focusing on one or two blockbusters per year with the occasional collection thrown in. Not sure if there's any positive way I can spin this, so let's just hear from Daryl Allison once more with this milestone quote to close things out. Action gamers have been waiting for a brawler that uses the motion controls right and shows what the Wii hardware is really capable of. Then look at all the games this team has worked on in the past and who's publishing this game. And if that doesn't excite you, then sell all your games and systems now. You'll need the money to pay for your therapy sessions. <laughs> so stupid. Trust me, you'll be happy to add Spyborgs not just to your library of Wii games, but to the collection of all your favorites. Wow. Anyway, if you know of any other ratchet robotic rigmaroles, let me know in the comments below, over on my Twitter, or smash into the offices of the Flophouse VIP Patreon and become a big robo-boss to nominate what you'd like to see on a future episode. See you next time, and thanks for watching!